Blank by Randall Garrett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Abnesia? Well, perhaps. But how and where had he earned the fifty thousand dollars? Blank by Randall Garrett. Bethelman came to quite suddenly and found himself standing on the corner of 44th Street and Madison Avenue. He was dizzy for a moment, not from any physical cause, but from the disorientation. The last thing he could remember, he had been sitting in a bar in Boston, talking to Dr. Elijah Kamaroff. After the interview was over, they'd had a few drinks, and then a few more. After that, things began to get hazy. Bethelman rubbed his head. It wasn't like a hangover. His head felt perfectly fine. But how in the devil had he gotten here? He looked around. No one was paying any attention to him. But no one pays any attention to anyone on the streets of New York. Still feeling queer, he headed east on 44th Street. He wanted to sit down for a bit, and the nearest place was a little bar halfway between Madison Avenue and Grand Central Station. He went in and ordered a beer. What the hell had happened? He'd had too much to drink on several occasions, but he'd never gone to sleep in one city and awakened in another. Dr. Kamaroff must have put him on the plane. The biochemist didn't drink much and had probably been in better shape than Bethelman had been. He glanced at his watch. 2.15. Wow! The city editor would be wondering where he was. He went to a phone, dropped in a dime, and dialed the city desk. When the editor's voice answered, he said, Hickman, this is Bethelman. I'm sorry I'm late, but... Late? interrupted Hickman. What are you talking about? You've only been gone half an hour. You sick or something? Don't feel too good, Bethelman admitted confusingly. That's what you said when you left. Hell, man, take the rest of the day off. It's Friday. You don't need to show up until Monday if you don't want to. Okay? Yeah, Bethelman said. Sure. His mind still didn't want to focus properly. Okay, boy, said Hickman, and thanks again for the tip. Who'd have thought baby Joe would come in first? See you Monday. He hung up. Bethelman stood there looking foolish for a full five seconds. Then things began to connect up. Friday. It shouldn't be Friday. He cradled the phone and walked over to the bar, where the barman was assiduously polishing a beer glass. What day is it? he asked. Friday, said the white-jacketed barman, looking up from the shell of a gleaming glass. I meant the date, Bethelman corrected. Fifteenth, I think. He glanced at a copy of the Times that lay on the bar. Yeah, fifteenth. Bethelman sat down heavily on the bar stool. The fifteenth. Somewhere he had lost two weeks. He searched his memory for some clue, but found nothing. His memory was a perfect blank for those two weeks. Automatically, his hand went to his shirt pocket for cigarettes. He pulled out a pack and started to shake one out. It wouldn't shake, so he stuck his finger in the half-empty pack to dislodge the cigarette. There was a roll of paper stuck in there. He took it out and unrolled it. It was a note. You're doing fine. You know something's wrong, but you don't know what. Go ahead and investigate. I guarantee you'll get the answers. But be careful not to get anyone too suspicious. You don't want to get locked up in the booby bin. I suggest you try Marco's first. The note was unsigned, but Bethelman didn't need a signature. The handwriting was his own. He looked at himself in the mirror behind the bar. He was clean-shaven, 
which he hadn't been when he was drinking with Dr. Kamaroff in Boston. Also, he was wearing his tweed topcoat, which he had left in New York. A search of his pockets revealed the usual keys and change. In his billfold was $300 in cash, more than he'd ever carried around in his life, and a receipt for a new $20 hat. The receipt was dated the 10th. He took off his hat and looked at it, brand new, with his initials on the sweatband. Evidently he'd been doing something the past two weeks, but what? He remembered talking to Kamaroff about the variability of time, something about a man named Dunn. And he remembered the biochemist saying that time travel was physically impossible. For a second or two, Bethelman wondered whether he'd been projected into the future somehow. But if he had, he reasoned, he'd still be wearing the same clothes he'd had on in Boston. No, he decided, it was something else. I've gone off my rocker. I'm daffy as a dung beetle. What I need is a good psychiatrist. But that didn't explain the note. He took it out and looked at it again. It still said the same thing. He decided that before he went to a psychiatrist, He'd do what the note said. He'd go to Marco's. After all, if he couldn't trust himself, who could he trust? Marco's was a little place down on 2nd Avenue. It wasn't the most elite bar in New York, but it wasn't the worst dive either. Marco was standing near the door when Bethelman entered. Ah, Mr. Bethelman! The package you were expecting is here. The, uh, gentleman left it. The beaming smile on his face was a marvel to behold. Thanks, Bethelman said. Marco dived behind the bar and came up with a wrapped package in brown paper and an envelope addressed to Bethelman. The package was about three inches wide, a little less than six inches long, and nearly an inch thick. He slid it into his topcoat pocket and tore open the envelope. There should be close to $10,000 in the package, the note said. You promised Marco a grand if number 367 won, which, of course, it did. He got hold of the runner for you. Again, the note was in his own handwriting. He gave Marco a thousand and left. There were some things he'd have to find out. He went to his apartment on 86th Street and put in a long-distance call to Dr. Elijah Kamaroff in Boston. After an hour, he was informed that Dr. Kamaroff was out of town and was not expected back for two weeks. Where had he gone? That was confidential. Dr. Kamaroff had some work to do and did not wish to be disturbed. Bethelman cursed the biochemist roundly and then went to his private files where he kept clippings of his own stories. Sure enough, there were coverages of several things over the past two weeks all properly bylined. Two weeks before, he had written a little article on research being done on cancer at Boston University School of Medicine, most of which he'd gotten from Dr. Kamaroff. No clue there. He'd evidently been behaving naturally for the past two weeks. But why couldn't he remember? Why was his memory completely blanked out? He had to know. He spent the next two weeks running down his activities during the blank period, and the more he worked, the more baffled he became. He had never been a gambling man, but he seemed to have become one over those two weeks, and a damn lucky one at that. Horse races, the numbers game, even the stock market all seemed to break right for him. In the blank two weeks, Bethelman had made himself close to $50,000. And every so often, he'd come across a little note from himself, telling him that he was doing fine. Once, a note he found in his bureau drawer, tucked among the socks, told him to invest every cent he had in a certain security, and then sell the next day. He did it, and made another $9,000. 
It was exactly four weeks to the day after he had sat up in the bar with Dr. Kamaroff that he found the last cryptic note to himself. It was in his unabridged dictionary, laying right on the page which contained the word he happened to be looking up. Tomorrow morning, it said, you will see Dr. Kamaroff, but don't expect him to explain anything to you until you have explained everything to him. So he would see Dr. Kamaroff in the morning, eh? He'd been trying to get a hold of the biochemist every day for the past two weeks, and there had been no results. That night, just before bedtime, Bethelman drank a glass of beer. One glass. No more. And that's why he couldn't understand waking up the next morning with a king-sized hangover. He rolled over in bed, moaning, half afraid to open his eyes. Oh, he said, my head. Want a bromo? A familiar voice asked sympathetically. Bethelman forced his eyes open. The stocky, smiling face of Dr. Elijah Kamaroff floated above him. Bethelman sat straight up in bed, his eyes wide. The effort made his head hurt worse. He looked around. He was in the upstairs guest bedroom of Dr. Kamarov's suburban home. He turned to look at the biochemist, who was busily mixing a bromo. What date is this? he asked. Kamarov looked at him with mild blue eyes. It's the second, he said. Why? Bethelman looked at the glass of fizzing liquid and downed it. The pattern was beginning to make sense. He had gone to sleep in Boston the night of the 1st, and awakened in New York on the 15th. Then he had gone to sleep in New York on the 29th, and awakened on the 2nd. It made a weird kind of sense. He handed the empty glass back to the biochemist and said, Dr. Kamaroff, sit down. I want to tell you something. Half an hour later, Kamaroff was rubbing his chin with a forefinger deep in concentration. It sounds wild, he said at last, but I've heard of wild things before. But what caused it? Do you remember what you did last night? I mean, the night of the first? Not clearly. We got pretty crocked, I remember. Kamaroff grinned. I think you were a few up on me. Do you remember the bottle of white powder I had in the lab down in the basement? No, Bethelman admitted. It was diazotrimoline, one of the drugs we've been using in cancer research on white mice. That whole family of compounds has some pretty peculiar properties. This one happens to smell like vanilla. When I let you smell it, you stuck your finger in it and licked off some of the powder before I could stop you. It didn't bother me much. We've given it to mice without any ill effects, so I didn't get you an emetic or anything. The bromo had made Bethelman's head feel better. But what happened exactly? he asked. As far as I can judge, the biochemist said, the diazotamoline has an effect on the mind. Not by itself, maybe. Perhaps it needs a synergetic combination with alcohol. I don't know. Have you heard the theories that Dunn propounded on the mind? Yeah, Bettelman said. We've discussed them last night, I think. Right. The idea is that the mind is independent of time. It just follows the body along through the time stream. Evidently, what the diazotamoline did was project your mind two weeks into the future, to the 15th. After two weeks, on the 29th, it wore off. Now you'll relive those two weeks. That sounds like a weird explanation, Bethelman said. Well, look at it this way. Let's say you remember those two weeks in the wrong order. The drug mixed your memory up. You remember the fortnight of the 2nd to the 15th, after you remember the fortnight of the 15th to the 29th, see? Good gosh, yes. Now I see how I made all that money. I read all the papers. I know what the stocks are going to do. I know what horses are going to win. Wow! 
That's right, Kamarov agreed. And you'll know where to leave all those notes for yourself. Yeah, and on the afternoon of the 15th, I'll blank out and wake up in my bed on the morning of the 30th. I should think so, yes, Kamarov said. It makes sense now. Then Bethelman looked up at the biochemist. By the way, Dr. Kamarov, I want to split the money with you. After all, you're responsible for what happened. The scientist smiled and shook his head. No need of that. I have the diazotamoline, remember? You said I was doing experimental work and couldn't be disturbed. Now, just what do you think I'm going to be experimenting on for the next couple of months? The End of Blank by Randall Garrett Blessed Are the Meek by G. C. Edmondson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Every strength is a weakness, and every weakness is a strength. And when the strong start smashing each other's strength, the weak may turn out to be, instead, the wise. Blessed are the meek by G. C. Edmondson. The strangers landed just before dawn, incinerating a good lee of bottomland in the process. Their machines were already busy digging up the topsoil. The old one watched, squinting into the morning sun. He sighed, hitched up his saffron robes, and started walking down toward the strangers. Griffin turned, not trying to conceal his excitement. You're the linguist. See what you can get out of him. I might, Kung Su ventured sourly, if you'd go weed the air machine or something. This is going to be hard enough without a lot of kibitzers cramping my style and scaring old Pruneface there half to death. I see your point, Griffin answered. He turned and started back toward the digs. Let me know if you have any progress with the local language. He stopped whistling and strove to control the jauntiness of his gait. Must be the low gravity and the extra oxygen, he thought. I haven't bounced along like this in thirty years. Nice place to settle down if some promoter doesn't turn it into an old folks' home. He sighed and glanced over the diggings. The rammed earth walls were nearly obliterated by now. Nothing lost, he reflected. It's all on tape, and they're no different from a thousand others at any rate. Griffin opened a door in a transparent bubble, from which Albanza was operating the diggers. Anything? he inquired. Nothing so far, Albanza reported. What's the score on this job? I missed the briefing. How'd you make out on three, by the way? Same old stuff. Pottery shards and the usual junk. See it once you've seen it all. Well, Griffin began, it looks like the same thing here again. We pretty well covered this system, and you know how it is. Rammed earth walls here and there. Pottery shards. Flint, bronze, and iron artifacts. And that's it. They got to the Iron Age on every planet, then bluey. Artifacts all made for human hands, I suppose. I wonder if they were close enough to have crossbred with humans. I couldn't say, Griffin observed dryly. From the looks of old Pruneface, I doubt if we'll ever find a human female with sufficiently detached attitude to find out. Who's Pruneface? He came ambling down out of the hills this morning and walked into camp. You mean you've actually found a live humanoid? There's got to be a first time for everything. Griffin opened the door and started climbing down the hill toward Kung Su and Pruneface. Well, have you gotten past the Me Charlie stage yet? Griffin inquired at breakfast two days later. Kung Su gave an inscrutable East Los Angeles smile. As a matter of fact, I'm a little further along. Joe is amazingly cooperative. Joe? 
Spell it Cho if you want to be exotic. It's still pronounced Joe, and that's his name. The language is monosyllabic and tonal. I happen to know a similar language. You mean this humanoid speaks Chinese? Griffin was never sure whether Kung was ribbing him or not. Not Chinese. The vocabulary is different, but the syntax and phonemes are nearly identical. I'll speak it perfectly in a week. It's just a question of memorizing two or three thousand new words. Incidentally, Joe wants to know why you're digging up his bottom land. He was all set to flood it today. Don't tell me he plants rice, Griffin exclaimed. I don't imagine it's rice, but it needs flooding, whatever it is. Ask him how many humanoids there are on this planet. I'm way ahead of you, Griffin. He said there are only a few thousand left. The rest were all destroyed in a war with the barbarians. They're extinct. How many races were there? I'll get to that if you'll stop interrupting, Kung rejoined testily. Joe says there were only two kinds of people, his own dark, straight-haired kind and the barbarians. They have curly hair, white skin, and round eyes. You'd pass for a barbarian, according to Joe, only you don't have a face full of hair. He wants to know how things are going on the other planets. I suppose that's my cue to break into a cold sweat and feel a premonition of disaster. Griffin tried to smile and almost made it. Not necessarily, but it seemed our Iron Age man is well informed about extraplanetary affairs. I guess I better start learning the language. Thanks to the spade work Kung Su had done in preparing hypno recordings, Griffin had a working knowledge of the rational people's language eleven days later when he sat down to drink herb infused hot water with Joe and some other old ones in the low-roofed wooden building around which clustered a village of two hundred humanoids he fidgeted through interminable ritualistic cups of hot water eventually joe hid his hands in the sleeves of his robe and turned with an air of polite inquiry now we get down to business griffin thought joe you know by now why we're digging up your bottom land we'll recompense you in one way or another Meanwhile, could you give me a little local history? Joe smiled like a well-nourished bodhisattva. Approximately how far back would you like me to begin? At the beginning. How long is a year on your planet? Joe inquired. Your year is eight and a half days longer. Our day is three hundred heartbeats longer than yours. Joe nodded his thanks. More water? Griffin declined, suppressing a shudder. Five million years ago, we were limited to one planet, Joe began. The court astronomer had a vision of our planet in flames. I imagined you'd say our sun was about to nova. The empress was disturbed and ordered a convocation of seers. One fasted over long and saw an answer. As the dying seer predicted, the Son of Heaven came with five fire-breathing dragons. The fairest of maidens and the strongest of our young men were taken to serve his warriors. We served them honestly and faithfully. A thousand years later their empire collapsed, leaving us scattered across the universe. Three thousand years later a new race of barbarians conquered our planets. We surrendered naturally and soon were serving our new masters. Five hundred years passed, and they destroyed themselves. This has been the pattern of our existence from that day to this. You mean you've been slaves for five million years? Griffin was incredulous. Servitude has ever been the refuge of the scholar and the philosopher. But what point is there in such a life? Why do you continue living this way? What is the point of any way of life? Continued existence. Personal immortality is neither desirable nor possible. We settled for perpetuation of the race. But what about self-determination? You know enough astronomy to understand Novig. 
Surely you realize it could happen again. What would you do without a technology to build spaceships? Many stars have gone nova during our history. Usually the barbarians came in time. When they didn't, you mean you really didn't care? All barbarians ask that sooner or later, Joe smiled. Sometimes, toward the end, they even accused us of destroying them. We don't. Every technology bears the seeds of its own destruction. The stars are older than the machinery which explores them. You use technology to get from one system to another? We used it, but we were never part of it. When machines fail, their people die. We have no machines. What would you do if this sun were to Nova? We can serve you. We are not unintelligent. Willing to work your way around the galaxy, eh? But what if we refuse to take you? The race will go on. Kang Su tells me there is no life on the planets of this system. But there are other systems. You're whistling in the dark, Griffin scoffed. How do you know if any of the rational people survive? How far back does your history go? Joe inquired. It's hard to say exactly, Griffin replied. Our earliest written records date back some 7,000 years. You are all one race? No, you may have noticed Kung Su is slightly different from the rest of us. Yes, Griffin, I have noticed. When you return, ask Kung Su for the legend of creation. More hot water? Joe stirred, and Griffin guessed the interview was over. He drank another ritual cup, made his farewells, and walked thoughtfully back to camp. Kung, Griffin asked over coffee the next afternoon, how well up are you on Chinese mythology? Oh, fair, I guess. It isn't my field, but I remember some of the stories my grandfather used to tell me. What is your legend of creation? Griffin persisted. It's pretty well garbled, but I remember something about the Son of Heaven bringing the early settlers from the land of two moons on the back of his fire-breathing dragon. The dragon got sick and died, so they couldn't ever get back to heaven again. There's a lot of stuff about devils, too. What about devils? I don't remember too well. They were supposed to do terrible things to you, even to your unborn children if they ever caught you. They must have been pretty stupid, though. They couldn't turn corners. My grandfather's store had devil screens at all the doors, so you had to turn a corner to get in. The first time I saw the lead baffles at the pile chamber doors on this ship, it reminded me of home sweet home. By the way, some young men from the village were around today. They want to work passage to the next planet. What do you think? Griffin was silent for a long time. Well, what do you say? We could use some hand labor for the delicate digging. Want to put them on? Might as well, Griffin answered. There's a streetcar every millennium anyway. What do you mean by that? You wouldn't understand. You sold your birthright to the barbarians. The end of Blessed Are the Meek by G. C. Edmondson Compatible by Richard R. Smith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. There are many things, murder included, in which husbands can settle certain problems. This is even more drastic. Compatible by Richard R. Smith. George stood by the fireplace, his features twisted into a grimace. It's hell, I tell you, a living hell. I sipped my drink and tried to think of a subtle way to change the subject. I didn't like to hear of a person's personal problems, and every time I visited George, he invariably complained about Helen. 
If it had been anyone else, I might have thought it wasn't entirely Helen's fault. But George and I had been roommates in college, and I knew him like a brother. He was a person who got along with almost everyone. Intelligent, easygoing, and likable. He lifted his glass and glared at me as if I were the guilty party. She's a worrywart, he continued. A hypochondriac, a neurotic, an escapist, and a communist. He studied the ceiling thoughtfully. And sometimes I think she's a little crazy. I tried to calm him. Don't worry about it. If things get worse, get a divorce. Divorce? Ha! She wouldn't give me a divorce if... The door opened. Helen smiled half-heartedly, her pale face quickly resuming its unhappy expression as if it tired her facial muscles when she smiled. Hello, Ed. Nice to see you again. Hello, Helen. I glanced at George and noticed he had closed his eyes, as if the sight of his wife was unbearable. His lower lip was white, where he gripped it with his teeth, and I silently hoped he wouldn't draw blood. Helen sank into a chair and raised her skirt to reveal her right leg. Did George tell you about my legs? she inquired. She stroked the leg affectionately. Arthritis. George grafted a new one on for me. Feels ten times better. My face blanched. The idea of replacing body parts from banks didn't nauseate me. If a man is in an automobile accident and loses an arm, and that arm can be replaced, I think that's marvelous. What sickened me were the people who actually enjoyed having a part of their body replaced with a part from a criminal or corpse. No, I sat down. My knees were weak. I felt short of breath. George didn't tell me. I... She interrupted with details of the operation. The details and the list of her other ailments lasted half an hour, during which George drank steadily, and I waited for a lull so that I could glance at my watch and say something about being late for an appointment. I saw George several times during the next few weeks, never at his house. I didn't visit him on my own initiative because Helen, as I had seen during my last visit, had passed from the stage of being unpleasant and reached the stage of being unbearable. I didn't want to be around her or listen to her, and George must have realized my feelings because he didn't invite me to his house for some time. But both of us had a habit of stopping at a club on the outskirts of town, and we met there often. Each time we met, George complained. Each time he seemed to drink more and complain more. I worried about his job. He was a surgeon, one of the best, and a surgeon needs good nerves and steady hands when he performs delicate operations. I urged him to get a divorce, but he said he didn't want one. I love Helen, he said one time. Well, I don't exactly love Helen, but I love her body. It's like the old saying about marrying a girl because she's pretty is like picking a rose by looking at the stem. We're all different, you know, and we all have different tastes. When I first saw Helen, well, she was just right for me. To me, she looks as good as Marilyn Monroe looks to the average man. I like having her around. I'd be lost without her. But at the same time, she's changed so damn much she makes me sick. And there it was. He still wanted Helen, but she had changed into a personality that he hated. Over a period of years, she had changed into a morbid hypochondriac, an unpleasant woman who enjoyed, more than anything else, such things as having one of her legs replaced and sampling the latest pills and drugs. George said he had tried to get her to see a psychiatrist, but she refused. And you can't have a person committed to a mental institution because they have an unpleasant personality. It seemed as if there were no solution to his problem. Then, late one night, I received a phone call from George. Come over and have a few drinks, he said. We'll have a party. Helen's changed. 
You should see her. I was interested in his problem, so I went. Helen greeted me at the door. I had the surprise of my life. At one time she had been beautiful, but she had faded during the past few years. By staying indoors she had grown pale, listless. As her personality changed, it had also changed her features, and her eyes had developed a sleepy, lifeless look, and deep lines had formed on her face. But the Helen who greeted me that night was not like that. Her face had a healthy flush. Her eyes sparkled, and she seemed vibrant, bubbling, just like the Helen I had known so long ago. George and I had a good time that night. He laughed and joked for the first time in months. We drank, talked, played chess, then drank and talked some more. Every now and then Helen would float by, a gorgeous creature laughing at George's jokes, mixing our drinks and smiling at George as if he were the most wonderful man in the world. When I could bear it no longer, I whispered, What happened? George drained his glass and shouted across the room. Come here, Helen. She came. George said, Promise not to tell anyone. It's very important. I couldn't imagine his reason for asking me that, but I said, I promise. Well, George explained, I can't take all the credit. I'm a fairly good surgeon, but Lucas had the hardest job. We did it together. Do you know Lucas? He's an electrical engineer, a genius. He designed that electronic calculator at— Show him, Helen interrupted. Show him. She was giggling, laughing, almost jumping up and down with joy. I thought, she's her old self again, cheerful, bubbling over. George said, I finally realized what she needed more than anything else. He raised Helen's soft brown hair, and opened a small panel in the back of her head. In the recess was a maze of tubes and electrical wiring. She needed a new head, George said. The End of Compatible by Richard R. Smith Final Examination by Robert Sheckley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Glenn Carruthers Final Examination by Robert Sheckley I suppose it started some time back, even before the astronomers discovered it, and certainly long before I found out. How far back, I have no idea. Thousands of years, perhaps, or more. But the first I knew about it was one March evening, when I opened the newspaper. Jane was in the kitchen, cleaning up, and I was settled back in the easy chair, reading through the lead articles. I skimmed through all the war talk, price controls, suicides, murders, and then glanced through the rest of the paper. One small article in the back caught my eye. Astronomers losing stars, the caption read. It was a human interest story, I suppose, because it went on in that maddening, coy style the newspapers use for that sort of stuff. Dr. Wilhelm Mentzner, at the Mount St. James Observatory, says that he has been unable, in recent weeks, to find some of the Milky Way stars. It would seem, Dr. Mentzner tells us, that they have vanished. Repeated photographs of certain portions of space do not show the presence of these dim, faraway stars. They were in place and intact in photographs made as recently as April 1942 and... Dot, dot, dot. The article gave the names of some of the stars. They didn't mean a thing to me, and chided the scientists on their absent-mindedness. Imagine, it went on losing something as big as a star. Although, the writer summed up, it doesn't really matter. They have a few hundred billion left to play around with. I thought it was sort of cute at the time, although in questionable taste. I don't know a thing about science. I'm in the dress line. 
but I've always looked upon it with the greatest respect. The way I see it, you start laughing at scientists, and they come up with something like the atom bomb. Better to treat them with a little respect. I can't remember if I showed the article to my wife. If I did, she didn't say anything in particular. Life went on as usual. I went to work in Manhattan and came home to Queens. In a few days there was another article, this one written by a PhD, and it had dropped the kidding style. It said the stars appeared to be disappearing from our Milky Way galaxy at a tremendous rate. Observations in both hemispheres had estimated that a few million of the farther stars had vanished in the past five weeks. I stepped out the back door to have a look. Everything seemed in order to me. The Milky Way was still up there, smeared across the sky as thick as ever. The Big Dipper was shining away, and the North Star was still pointing towards Westchester. No difference. The ground was frozen under my feet, but the air was almost warm. Spring would be coming along soon, and spring fashions. In the distance I could see the red glow of Manhattan across the 59th Street Bridge that seemed to settle it. The only problem I had was dresses, and I went back inside to worry about them. In a few more days the star story had reached the front page. Stars disappearing, the headlines read. What next? It seemed that millions of stars were vanishing from the Milky Way every day and night. The other galaxies seemed to be unaffected, although it was hard to tell. But they were definitely dropping out of ours. Most of them were so far away they could only be caught with a high-powered telescope or a camera. But hundreds could still be seen disappearing by anybody with a pair of eyes, not blowing up or fading out, just click, and they were gone. This article written by an astronomer and a PhD, reminded everybody that only the light was stopping. The stars themselves must have been snubbed out hundreds of millions of years ago, and that the light was finally stopping after travelling all that distance across space. I think it was hundreds of millions, though it might have been thousands. The article didn't even speculate on the cause of it all. I went stargazing that night, Everyone else in the neighbourhood was out in their backyards too, and sure enough, I could see little specks of light winking out. They were barely noticeable. If I hadn't been looking for them, I would never have seen anything different. Hey Jane, I called in the back door. Come on out and have a look. My wife came out and stood, hands on hips, looking at the sky. She was frowning, as though she resented the whole business. I don't see anything. She said. Look carefully, I said. Watch one section at a time. There was one. Did you see it? No. Watch for little winks, I said. But it wasn't until the Thomas kid came from next door and loaned her his telescope that she saw it. Here, Mrs. Osterson, use this, the kid said. He had three or four telescopes in his hand, a pair of binoculars, and a handful of charts. Quite a kid. You too, Mr. Osterson, he said. Through the telescope I could really see it. One moment a pinpoint of light would be there, and then, bing, it was gone. It was downright weird. For the first time I started getting worried. It didn't bother Jane, though. She went back into her kitchen. Of course, even with the galaxy collapsing, the dress business had to go on. But I found myself buying a newspaper four or five times a day, and keeping the radio on in the store to find out what was going on. Everybody else was doing the same. People were even arguing about it on street corners. The newspapers had about a thousand different theories. There were scientific articles on the red shift and intergalactic dust. There were articles on stellar evolution and visual hallucination. The psychologists were trying to prove that the stars hadn't been there in the first place, or something like that. I didn't know what to believe. The only article that made any sense to me was one written by a social commentator, and he wasn't even a full-fledged scientist. He said it looked as if someone was doing a big job of house-cleaning in our galaxy. The Thomas kid had his own theories. He was sure it was the work of invaders from another dimension. He told me they were sucking our galaxy into theirs, which was in another dimension, like dust into a vacuum cleaner. It's perfectly clear, Mr. Osterson. 
he told me one evening after work. They started sucking in the outside stars at the other side of the Milky Way, and they're working through the centre. They'll reach us last, because we're at the far end. Well, I said, after all, he told me, astonishing yarns and weird science stories practically agree on it, and they're the leaders in the psychic field. But they're not scientists, I said. That doesn't matter, the kid told me. They predicted the submarine before there was one. They predicted airplanes when scientists were saying a bumblebee couldn't fly, and rockets and radar and atom bombs. They've got the truth about this too. He paused for breath. Someone's got to stop the invaders. He went on in a tone of utter conviction. He looked at me sharply. You know, since their dimension changes, they can take the appearance of humans. Again, he looked at me, suspiciously. Anyone might be one. You might be one. I could see he was getting nervous, and maybe on the verge of handing me over to some committee or other. So I've had him milk and cake. That just made him more suspicious. But there wasn't anything I could do about it. The newspapers took up the science fiction theory just as the Thomas kid had told it to me, and added their own embellishments. Some guy said he knew how the invaders could be stopped. He had been approached by them, he said, and they'd offered him controllership of a small galaxy if he'd cooperate. Of course, he wouldn't. It sounds foolish, but the sky was getting pretty bare. People in every country were saying foolish things and doing foolish things. We were starting to wonder how soon our own sun would go. I watched every night, and the stars disappeared faster and faster. The thing seemed to increase at a geometric rate. Soon the sky was just filled with little lights going out, faster than you could count. Almost all of it could be seen with the naked eye now, because it was getting a lot closer to us. In two weeks, the only part of the Milky Way left were the Magellanic Clouds, and the astronomers said that they weren't a part of the galaxy anyhow. Betelgeuse and Actares and Rigel winked out, and Sirius and Vega. Then Alpha Centauri disappeared, and that was our closest neighbour. Aside from the moon, the sky was pretty bare at night, just a few dots and patches here and there. I don't know what would have happened if the voice hadn't been heard then. It would be anybody's guess, but the voice came the day after Alpha Centauri vanished. I first heard it on my way to the store. I was walking down Lexington Avenue from the 59th Street station looking in the dress windows to see what my competitors had to offer. Just as I was passing Mary Bell's frocks, and wondering how soon they'd have their summer line in, I heard it. It was a pleasant voice, friendly. It seemed to come from just behind me, about three feet over my shoulder. Judgment of the inhabitants of the planet Earth, it said, will be held in five days. Please prepare yourselves for final examination and departure. This announcement will be repeated. I looked around at once to find out who was speaking. I half expected to find a tall, cadaverous fanatic at my shoulder, some fiery-eyed fellow with flowing hair and a beard, but there was no one at all. The nearest person was about fifteen feet from me. For a moment I thought I was having a hallucination, hearing voices, that sort of thing. Then I saw that everyone else must have heard it too. Lexington Avenue is a pretty busy place at nine o'clock in the morning. There are plenty of people hurrying back and forth, kids going to school, subways roaring beneath you, cars and buses honking. Not now. You couldn't hear a sound. Every car had stopped right where it was. The people on sidewalks seemed frozen practically in mid-stride. The man nearest me walked up. He was well-dressed, about my age, in his early forties. He was eyeing me with suspicion, as though I might have been responsible for the whole thing. I suppose I was looking at him in the same way. Did you hear it? He asked me. Yes, I said. Did you do it? No, did you? Most certainly not, he said indignantly. We stood for a few seconds just looking at each other. I think we, everybody, knew right there and then that it was no hoax. What with the stars disappearing, I mean. A pretty girl in a fur coat walked up to me. She was young. She looked scared and very defiant. Did you hear it? She asked us. Yes, I said, and the man nodded. 
Is it possible that she was operating on a loudspeaker? The girl asked. She? We both said. That woman's voice, the girl said, looking a little exasperated. A young woman. She said, judgment of the inhabitants. It was a man's voice, the man said. Of that I'm certain. He looked at me, and I nodded. Oh no, the girl told us. A girl. She even had a slight New England accent. It was unmistakable. She looked around for support. The people on Lexington Avenue had gathered in small groups. There were knots of people up and down the sidewalks as far as I could see. The cars still weren't moving. Most of the drivers had gotten out to ask someone else about the voice. Say, pardon me, some man said to me. Am I hearing things, or did you hear? That's how it was for the next hour. Everyone, it seemed, had heard it. But every woman was sure it had been a woman's voice, and every man was sure it had been a man's. I left finally, and went to my store. Minnie, the sales girl, and Frank, my stop boy, were already there. They had the radio on, but they were talking over it. Say, Mr. Osterson, Frank called as I walked in. Did you hear it? I sat down and discussed it with them, but we couldn't tell each other much. Frank had been in the store when he heard it. Minnie had just been walking in, her hand on the doorknob. Minnie was sure it was a girl's voice, about her own age, with just the trace of a Bronx accent. Frank and I held out for a man's voice, but where I was sure the man was in his early forties or late thirties, Frank was positive it was a young man, about twenty or twenty-two. We noticed the radio finally. It had been broadcasting all that time, but we hadn't paid any attention. Voice was heard in all parts of the country at 9.03 this morning, Eastern Standard Time. This voice purporting to be that of, of the, uh, deity, announcing the Judgment Day was heard, uh, was heard in all parts of the country. The voice hesitated, then continued. In place of our usual program, we now bring you the Reverend Joseph Morrison, who will speak on... The voice stopped for a moment, then came back with renewed vigour. The Reverend Joseph Morrison. We listened to the radio most of the morning. The Reverend Joseph Morrison seemed as confused as the rest of us, but he was followed by news announcements. The voice had been heard, as far as they could make out, in every country on earth. It had spoken in every language, every dialect, and sub-dialect. Minnie looked dazed as the reports piled in, and Frank looked shocked. I suppose I looked as startled as my normal deadpan would show. At 11.45 I decided to call my wife. No use. I couldn't even get the operator. Possibilities that this is a hoax, a voice was saying from the radio in an unconvincing tone. Mass hallucinations are far from unknown, and the chance must be considered. In the Middle Ages, cutting through our conversation and through the blaring radio, smooth as a knife through butter, the voice came again. Judgment of the inhabitants of the planet Earth will be held in five days. Please prepare yourselves for final examination and departure. This announcement will be repeated. Departure, I thought. Where were we going? There, Frank shouted. You see, it was a young man. You're crazy, Minnie screamed at him. Her hair had fallen over her eyes. She looked like an impassioned cocker spaniel. You're crazy, Frank shouted back. They stood glaring at each other. Minnie seemed about ready to throw the cash register at him. Easy now, I said. It seems... It seems like the voice speaks in everybody's language, and sounds like the sort of voice everybody would know. But how's that possible? Frank asked me. I don't know, but it's certainly logical. If the voice spoke just in Latin, or Hebrew, or English, none of the Arabs would understand it, or the Armenians. So while it's speaking everybody's language, it might as well speak everybody's dialect at the same time. Should we call it it? Frank asked in a whisper. He glanced over his shoulder, as though he expected to find an avenging angel there. Shouldn't we refer to it as him? She, you mean, Minnie said. The old masculine idea that God must be a man is just so much ego wash. Why, the feminine principle is evident all through the universe. Why, why, you can't just say him when, when... Minnie had never been too strong on ideas. She ran out of breath and stood, panting and pushing back her hair. After a while we talked about it calmly, and listened to the radio. There were more speakers, and another survey of countries that had heard the second announcement. At two o'clock, I told them to go home. 
there was no use trying to get any work done that day. Besides, there were no customers. The subways were running again when I reached the BMT, and I rode to my home in Queens. Of course you heard it, my wife asked me at the door. Of course, I said. Was it spoken by a woman in her mid-thirties, with just the trace of a Queen's accent? Yes, Jane said. Thank God we can agree on something. But of course we couldn't. We talked about it all through supper, and talked about it after supper. At nine o'clock the announcement came again, from behind and above our shoulders. Judgment of the inhabitants of the planet Earth will be held in five days. Please prepare yourselves for final examination and departure. That is all. Well, Jane said, I guess she means it. I guess he does, I said. So we went to bed. The next day I went in to work, although I don't know why. I knew that this was it, and everyone else knew it too. But it seemed right to go back to work. End of the world or not. Most of my adult life had been bound up in that store, and I wanted a day more with it. I had some idea of getting my affairs in order, although I knew it couldn't matter. The subway ride was murderous. New York is always a crowded city, but it seemed as though the whole United States had moved in. The subways were so tightly jammed, the doors couldn't even close. When I finally got out, the streets were filled from one curb to the other. Traffic had given up, and people were piling out of cars and buses anywhere they were stopped, adding to the jam in the streets. In the store, Frank and Minnie were already there. I guess they had the same idea about gathering up loose ends. Gee, Mr. Osterson, Frank said. What do you think he'll do? About our sins, I mean. Frank was twenty-one. I couldn't see how he could have committed an unusual number of sin. But he was worried about them. The way he frowned and paced around, he might have been the devil himself. Minnie didn't have any sins on her mind, as far as I could see. She was wearing what must have been her best dress. She hadn't bought it in my store and her hair was a lighter brown than it had been yesterday. I suspected she wanted to look her best in front of the Almighty, be he man or woman. We talked about our sins most of the morning, and all listened to the radio. The radio had a lot to say about sins, but no two speakers agreed. Around lunchtime, Ollie Bernstein dropped in. Hi, Ajax competitor, he said, standing in the doorway. How's business? I sold five dozen halos, I told him. How's with you? What's it matter? He asked, coming sideways through the doorway. Four days before judgment. Who cares? Come have lunch with me, ex-competitor. Ollie and I had never been on really friendly terms. We sold the same price line, and our stores were too close for mutual comfort. Also, he was fat, and I've always been suspicious of fat men. But suddenly, I found myself liking him. It seemed a shame I hadn't recognised his solid qualities years ago. We went to Lotto's, a classy place up on East 73rd Street. We'd hoped to avoid some of the crowd by going uptown, but there wasn't a chance of it. Lotto's was packed, and we stood three quarters of an hour for a table. Seated, we ordered roast duck, but had to settle for hamburger steak. The waiter told us people had been walking in and ordering roast duck all morning. Lotto's had a radio, probably for the first time in its existence and a minister or rabbi was speaking, who was interrupted by a news announcement. The war in Indochina is over, the announcer said. Peace was declared at 7.30 this morning. Also, a general truce has been called in Mongolia and Tanganyika. There was a lot of that. In Indochina, it seemed that the rebels had given up the country to the French, declaring that all men should live in peace. The French immediately announced that they were withdrawing their forces as fast as they could get planes for them. Every Frenchman was going to spend the last three days before judgment in Paris. For a moment, I wished I was in Paris. The announcer also said the Russian Air Force had agreed to pilot the Frenchman home. It was the same everywhere. Every country was leaning over backwards, giving up this and that, offering land to its neighbours, shipping food to less fortunate areas and so forth. We listened over a bottle of Moselle, or the champagne had been drunk that morning. I think I got a little high. Anyhow, I walked back with my arms around two total strangers. We were assuring each other that peace, it was wonderful, and it was that. I went home early, to miss the evening rush. It was still rough going.
I grinned at my wife as I reached the door, and she grinned back. Jane was a little high, also. The next day I brought my wife into the city, with three days left to go. Two, really, because you couldn't count the day itself. We figured we'd move into a good hotel, buy an armload of classical records, and have our own private, quiet celebration. I thought we deserved it, although I could have been wrong. Frank was already at the store when we got there. He was all dressed up and had a suitcase with him. What's up, Frank? I asked. Well, Mr. Osterson, he said, with only two days left, I'm going to go on my first airplane trip. I'm flying to Texas. Oh, I asked. Yes, sir, Frank said. He shuffled his feet, as if he knew he was doing something foolish, but his face was set. He was waiting for me to tell him not to go. I'm going out to where I can ride a horse, Mr. Osterson. I've always dreamed of going to Texas and riding a horse. It isn't just the horses. I want the airplane ride too, and I want to see what all that land looks like. I was figuring on doing it this summer on my vacation, but now, well, I'm going. I walked to the back of the store and opened the safe. I had four thousand dollars there, the rest was in the bank. I came back and handed Frank two thousand. Here, kid, I said. Buy a horse for me. He just stared at me for a second, then dashed out. There wasn't much to say. Besides, it was an easy gesture. The stuff was as good as worthless. Might as well see the other fellow have a good time. For once my wife seemed to agree with me. She smiled. Minnie came in almost as soon as Frank left. She was all dressed up, too, in another dress she hadn't bought in my store. There was a young fellow with her. He wasn't good-looking or bad-looking. Just the sort of fellow you'd see anywhere, but Minnie seemed to think he was something pretty special, to judge by the way she was clutching his arm. Are you going to Texas too? I asked. Oh no, she said. I'm getting married. Oh, Jane asked. Yes, ma'am, Minnie said. Herb and I were going to wait till he finished dental school, so he shouldn't be living off his parents. But now, she looked very cute, I must say. Her hair was a light blonde. It looked fine on her. Here, Minnie, my wife said. She took the other two thousand out of my hand and gave it to her. Have a good time these last days. Hey, I said, when Minnie and a young man had gone. How about us? We'll never be able to get in a bank. What'll we do? Quit worrying, Jane told me. Don't you believe in young love? She found the one comfortable chair in the place, the one we reserved for customers, and sat down. I've been too careful, she said, when she saw me looking at her. I see, I said. And as far as money goes, she continued, haven't you any faith? The Lord will provide. That's fine by me, I said, and sat down beside her. The door opened, and in walked a short man, who was oldish and dressed like a banker, but I knew right away he was in the dress line. There's something about the dress line, you can always tell. Not much business, he asked, not much. There hadn't been a customer in all day, or all yesterday, now that I thought about it. That's understandable, he told me. It's because everyone is storming the big stores, the expensive stores. Everyone wants to wear the best dresses on their last days. Sounds logical, I said. Logical, but not entirely right, he said, frowning seriously through a little pince-nez. Why should the big, expensive stores drive the middle-class retailer out of business? I am here as a representative of Bonzelli's to reimburse you for your financial loss. With that, he dropped a thick manila envelope on the counter, smiled, and left. Bonzelli's, my wife commented coolly. There. Expensive. Inside the envelope, there was $8,000. That wasn't the end of it. Strangers dropped in every few minutes, leaving money. After a while, I started handing it back. I went down the block to Ollie Bernstein's store, with $20,000 in a paper bag. I met him on the way. He had a fistful of bills. I've got a little gift for you, ex-competitor, he said. It was about $15,000. Everyone with money was handing it over and getting it back from someone else. I've got an idea, I said. How about the unfortunate? You mean the Bronx dress shops, he asked. No, I mean the derelicts, the bums. Why shouldn't they share? Count me in for 15000 he said without hesitation. We talked it over, 
Plans for going down to the Bowery and handing it out didn't seem so good. The streets were still impossible, and I didn't want to leave Jane for long. We finally decided to give it to the nearest church. They'd see it got into the proper hands. The church on 65th and Madison was closest, so we went right there and formed on the end of the line. It stretched halfway down the block, but it was moving fast. I had no idea it was like this, Ollie said. He shook his head. Perspiration was dripping from him. He was working harder handing out money than he had ever worked to make it in his life. What kind of church is this? he asked me. I don't know. I tapped the man in front of me. What kind of church is this, Mac? The man turned around. He was almost as big as Ollie, but older, tireder looking. How should I know? he said. I'm from Brooklyn. We reached the inside of the church, and a man took our money. He didn't have time to thank us. There were too many behind, clamouring for their chance. The man just threw the bills on a table. Another man, a reverend of some kind, was walking back and forth, picking up handfuls of it and carrying it off. And then coming back for more, we followed him, just out of curiosity. I didn't have any doubt they'd dispose of it in the right way. But a fellow likes to know where his charity is going. Besides, Jane would probably ask me. At the side entrance of the church, there was a line of poorly clad, red-faced men. Their clothes were in tatters, but their faces were shining. The reverend was handing each man a handful of bills, then rushing back for more. Be simpler if they formed the line inside, I said to Ollie as we headed back for our stores. Just have the guys with money lined up in front of the guys without. Faster. Listen, Ollie said, you always have a middleman, can't avoid it. He coughed three or four times. I could see that the strain was getting him. A man all his size shouldn't run around handing out money that way. On my way back to the store, someone handed me $5,000. He just grinned, shoved it in my hands and hurried on. I did a double take. It was one of the bums who had just got it. Back in the store, there was more money piled up on the counter. My wife was still in the same chair, reading a magazine. It's been piling up since you left, she said. I threw my 5000 on the pile. You should have heard the radio, she said. Congress passed about two dozen laws in the last hour. They've given everybody every right you could think of, and a few I never dreamed existed. It's the age of the common man, I told her. For an hour I stood at the doorway handing out money. But it was just plain foolishness. The streets were mobbed with people handing out the stuff. Everyone wanted to give it away. It was a game. The rich gave it to the poor, and the poor turned around and handed it back to the rich. By two o'clock it was impossible to tell who had been rich and who poor. In the meantime, Jane kept me posted on what was going on over the radio. Every country on the face of the earth was passing emancipation acts as quickly as they could get a quorum together. The age of the common man really had come in. Two days before deadline. Jane and I left for lunch at three o'clock. We both knew it would be the last time we'd see the store. As a final gesture, we piled $50,000 or so on the counter and left the doors open. It seemed the only thing we could do. We ate at an East 63rd Street restaurant. The regular help had left. The people wandered in off the streets, cooked for a while, ate, and left. Jane fixed a dozen club sandwiches for our share, and then we ate. The next problem was where to sleep. I was sure all the hotels would be full, but we had to try. In an emergency, we could sleep in the store. We walked to the Stanton Carla, one of the biggest hotels in New York. There was a young man behind the desk, reading The World as Will and Idea by Schopenhauer. Any chance of a room? I asked him. Here's a passkey, he said. Take any vacant room you can find. How much? I asked, fanning a few thousand dollar bills. Are you kidding? he said, and returned to his book. He looked like a very serious young man. We found a vacant room on the 15th floor and sat down as soon as we were inside. Immediately, Jane jumped up again. Records, she said. I want to spend the last day before judgment listening to good music. I was dog tired, but wanted the same thing. Jane and I had never had enough time to listen to all the music we wanted to hear. Somehow, we had never gotten around to it. Jane wanted to go with me, but I thought, with the jam New York was in, it would be easier if I went alone. Lock the door until I get back, I told her. 
It may be the day before judgment, but not everyone's an angel yet. She winked at me. She hadn't winked in years. I scrambled through the crowd to a music store. It was deserted. I picked up a long playing recorder and all the records I could carry. Then I came back. I had to walk to the fifteenth floor because some guy was zooming up and down in one elevator and the rest were out of order. Put on the Debussy, I told Jane when I got back, throwing myself in an armchair. It was a joy and a pleasure to be off my feet. That's how we spent the rest of the day and the evening. We played records. I'd gotten some Bach, Debussy, Mozart, Haydn, and a few others I had never heard of. I listened to more music in that day than I had heard in five years previously. We woke up late the next day, about one thirty in the afternoon. I felt guilty. It didn't seem right to sleep away the day before judgment. Seems as good as any other way, Jane said. Perhaps she was right. Anyhow, we were both ravenously hungry. Jane's feet were blistered, because she hadn't moved around so much since we were courting. Stay put, I said. Your shining night will bring you lunch, my last good deed. Your first, she told me, smiling. Lock that door, I said, and left. I just don't trust people very much. I don't know why, even on the day before judgment, I couldn't trust everyone. The streets were empty when I finally got down. A few people walking around, peering nervously over their shoulders. A few more had joyous smiles on their faces, but the streets were very bare. Cars, taxis, and buses had been left haphazardly all over the street. The traffic lights were still clicking red and green, but there was no traffic to regulate. I saw no sign of a policeman, and remembered that I hadn't seen any since shortly after the announcement. I don't know if I like that, but I suppose that cops are human too. They might like to spend their last days with their families also. And who was going to steal anything? It might be a good idea, I thought to drop into a church and offer up a prayer, not that it would make any difference, or even that I especially wanted to, but I thought Jane would like me to. I tried three churches, but they were all packed, with hundreds waiting outside. Now, I knew where everybody was. I think I might have waited too, but Jane was expecting her lunch. I went on to a restaurant. On my way back with a bundle of food, five people stopped me and tried to give me money. They seemed desperate. They explained that they had to get rid of it, and they had no idea how to. After working for it all their lives, it didn't seem right to just throw it away, and no one would take it now. They were really perplexed. One man in particular struck me. Please take it, old man, he said. I've been unfortunate. I've accumulated so much of it, it's almost impossible to dispose of it all. And I don't want it on my hands. I really don't. Won't you accept a portion of it? I recognised him. He was an actor, and a well-known one. I had always enjoyed watching him, so I took a pile of bills off his hands, leaving it on the desk of the hotel. The young man who had been reading Schopenhauer was no longer there. Jane and I ate and listened to some more music. We listened to it the rest of the day, and didn't talk much. Towards evening, Jane's eyes were soft. I knew she was thinking back over our life. I thought back too. It didn't seem so bad, not really. I had made a few mistakes, but still, not so bad. Night came, and we made supper out of our leftovers. We didn't want to go out for anything, and we didn't want to go to sleep. It'll come just at dawn, Jane said. I tried to tell her you can't predict the ways of the Almighty, but she wasn't going to sell out her woman's intuition for anything. She was sure. That was a long night, and not a very good one. I felt as though I were a prisoner at the bar. It wasn't a very good way to feel, but I was frightened. I suppose everybody was. Standing at the window, I saw the first light of the false dawn. It was going to be a beautiful day over New York. There were no visible stars, but every light in the city was on, making stars of its own. It was as though the city was burning candles to the unknown. Goodbye, Jane, I said. I knew she was right. The announcement would come just at dawn. I hoped Minnie was in her husband's arms, and Frank, I felt he was probably on a horse, standing up in the unfamiliar saddle and looking toward the east. I hoped he was. Goodbye, dear, 
Jane said, and kissed me. There was a cool breeze from the open window, and darkness in the sky. It was beautiful at that moment. It should have ended just like that. There will be a slight delay, the voice said from behind my shoulder, as pleasant as ever, and as distant. In settling the affairs of the inhabitants of the planet Earth, the final examination and departure will be held ten years from this date. I stood at the window, my arm around Jane. We couldn't say anything for perhaps ten minutes. Well, I said to her finally. Well, well. Well, she said. We were silent for a few more minutes. Then she said, well, again. There was nothing else to say. I looked out the window. Below me the city was sparkling with lights. The sun was coming up, and everything was deadly quiet. The only sound I could hear was the buzzing of an electric sign. It sounded like a broken alarm clock. Or like a time bomb, perhaps. You'll have to go back to work, Jane said. She started to cry. Although I suppose ten years is only a second in eternity. Only a second to her. Less, I said. A fraction of a second. Less. But not to us, Jane said. It certainly should have ended there. Judgment Day should have come, bringing with it whatever it brought. We were ready. All the worldly goods were disposed of, in New York and I suppose in the rest of the world. But ten years was too long, too much of a strain on goodness. We should have been able to carry on. There was no reason why not. We could have gone back to our jobs. The farmers were still on the farms. The grocers and clerks were still around. We could have done such a bang-up job of it. We could have pointed to that ten years with pride and said, You see, our recorded history of thousands of years of avarice, cruelty and hate isn't the whole story. For ten years we were good and clean and noble. For ten years we were brothers. Unfortunately, it wasn't that way. The farmers didn't want to go back to their farms. And the grocers didn't want to return to their groceries. Oh, some did. Many did, for a while, but not for long. Everyone talked about high ideals, but it was just talk, just like before. For six months, Jane and I struggled along, not getting much to eat, frightened by the mobs that surged around New York. Finally, we decided to move out. We joined the exodus leaving New York, drifted through Pennsylvania, and headed north. The country was disrupted, but pulled itself together again after a fashion. Thousands were starving, then millions. Some had food, but they weren't very willing to share it. They were figuring what they'd do for ten years if they shared their food. Money they'd still hand out in basketfuls. It wasn't worth anything. In nine months, a million dollars wouldn't buy a rotten turnip. As time passed, fewer and fewer stayed on the job. The money they got wouldn't buy anything. Besides, why work when the end was so near? Why work for someone else? In about a year, there was the Bulgaria incident. An American in Sofia disappeared. He just vanished. The American embassy complained. They were told to go home. The Bulgarians didn't want any interference for their last nine years of existence. Besides, they added that they didn't know where the man was. Maybe they were telling the truth. People vanish, even here. Anyhow, after our third ultimatum, we bombed them. The attack coincided with a bombing launched on us by China, who decided we were interfering with her trade with Japan. Great Britain was bombed, and bombed someone else. Everyone started bombing everyone else. I took Jane out of the city where we were staying, and headed for the open country. We ran and stumbled over the fields, with the roar of the plains above us. We hid in ditches. Jane was cut down by machine gun bullets in one raid. Perhaps she was fortunate. She missed the atom bombs the next week, and she missed the hydrogen bombs a week later. I wasn't around when they dropped the H-bomb. I was in central Canada and heading for open country, but I heard the noise. I saw the smoke. They had bombed New York. After that, Everyone threw the biggest bombs they had, as fast as they could, at anything that might be called a target. 
Radioactive dust followed, and bacteria followed that. Gas was used, some stuff that hung close to the ground for days. Only a good-sized storm or two would blow it away. At this time I was heading north. Most of the traffic was south, because there was a famine in the north. But I figured I'd rather take my chances with starvation than with the bacteria and dust. As it was, the germs almost got me. I was sick for a day. I wanted to die. If I'd had a gun, I would have shot myself. But I lived, and the bacteria never touched me again. I joined up with a few men below the Arctic Circle, but had to leave them. One of them fell sick the day after I joined, and another followed him. I figured I was a carrier, so I left in the night, still heading north. They bombed the north too, to make sure no one got the pitch blend. I ran through the woods, I hid in caves. At night I would look at the moon, and the little sprinkling of stars left across the sky. After the fourth year, I didn't see any more human beings. I didn't have time to look. All my day was spent filling my belly. It was a full-time job just to gather grasses and perhaps kill a rabbit with a stone. I became pretty handy with stones. I didn't even know when the ten years were up. To sum up, I don't suppose I'm the last man on earth. There must be others hiding in caves in other parts of the world waiting on islands, on mountain tops. You can check my story with them, if you can find them. But I think you'll find it pretty accurate. Now, as for me, I suppose I've been as sinful as most, but that's for you to judge, sir. My name is Adam Osterson. I was born in Pine Grove, Maine, in June of... End of Final Examination by Robert Sheckley Recording by Glenn Carruthers, Ghana Country. The Fire and the Sword by Frank M. Robinson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Fire and the Sword by Frank M. Robinson Why do people commit suicide? Templin tightened his safety belt and lay back on the acceleration bunk. The lights in the cabin dimmed to a dull red glow that meant the time for takeoff was nearing. He could hear noises from deep within the ship and the tiny whir of the ventilation fan, filling the air with the Swedish smell of sleeping gas. To sleep the trip away was better than to face the dull monotony of the stars for days on end. Oh, they kill themselves for lots of reasons. Maybe ill health or financial messes or family difficulties. An unhappy love affair. Or more complex ones if you went into it deeper. The failure to achieve an ambition. Failure to live up to one's own ideals. Welshmers, perhaps. He could smell the bitter fragrance of tobacco smoke mingling with the gas. Eckert had lit a cigarette and was calmly blowing the smoke at the neon no-smoking sign which winked on and off in mechanical disapproval. He turned his head slightly so he could just see Eckert in the bank facing him. Eckert, one of the good gray men in the service. The old reliables, the ones who could take almost anything in their stride because, at one time or another, they had had to. It was Eckert who had come into his office several days ago and told him that Don Pendleson had killed himself. Only, Pendleson wasn't the type. He was the kind who have everything to live for. The kind you instinctively know will amount to something some day. And that was a lousy way to remember him. The clichés always come first. Your memory plays traitor and boils friendship down to the status of a breakfast food testimonial. The soft red lights seemed to be dancing in the darkness of the cabin. Eckert was just a dull, formless blur opposite him. His cigarette was out. Eckert had come into his office without saying a word and had watched his scenery window. It had been snowing in the window the white flakes making a simple pattern drifting past the glass. Eckert had fiddled with the controls and changed it to sunshine, then to a weird mixture of hail amid the brassy golden sunlight, and then Eckert had told him that Pendleton had taken the short way out. He shouldn't get sentimental, but how the hell else should he remember Pendleton? Try to forget it and drink a toast to him at the next class reunion? And never, never be so crude as to speculate why Pendleton should have done it? 
if, of course, he had. The cabin was hazy in the reddish glow, the sleeping gas a heavy perfume. Eckert and he had talked it out and gone over the records. Pendleton had come of good stock. There had been no mental instability in his family for as far back as the genetic records went. He had been raised in a middle-class neighborhood and attended a local grammar school where he had achieved average grades and had given his instructors the normal amount of trouble. Later, when he had made up his mind to enter the diplomatic service, his grades had improved. He had worked hard at it, though he wasn't what you would call a grind. In high school and later in college, he was the well-balanced type. Athletic, popular, hard-working. How long would it be before memories faded, and all there was left of Pendleton was a page of statistics? He had been on this team. He had been elected president of that. He had graduated with such and such honors. But try getting a picture of him by reading the records. Resurrect him from a page of black print. Would he be human? Would he be flesh and blood? Hell no. In the statistics, Pendleton was the all-around boy. The cold marble statue with the finely chiseled muscles and the smooth blank sockets where the eyes should be. Maybe someday fate would play a trick on a hero-worshipping public, and there would actually be kids like that. But they wouldn't be human. They wouldn't be born. Parents would get them by sending in so many box tops. He was drowsy. The room was filled with the gas now. It would only be a matter of minutes before he would be asleep. Pendleton had been in his second year as attaché on Tunpesh, a small planet with a G-type sun. The service had stumbled across it recently and decided the system was worth diplomatic recognition of some kind, so Pendleton had been sent there. He had been the first attaché to be sent, and naturally he had gone alone. There was no need to send more. Tunpush had been inspected and certified and approved. The natives were primitive and friendly, or maybe the service had slipped up, as it sometimes did, and Tunpesh had received something less than a thorough survey. And then an unscheduled freighter had put in for repairs, one of the very few ships that ever came by Tunpesh. The captain had tried to pay his respects to Pendleton, only Pendleton wasn't there. The natives said he had killed himself and showed the captain the little flower-covered plot where they had buried him. Tunpesh had been Pendleton's second assignment. The natives were oh so friendly, so friendly that he had made sure that a certain box was on board, filled with shiny atomic rifles, needle pistols, and the fat little gas guns. They might be needed. People like Pendleton didn't kill themselves, did they? No, they didn't. But sometimes they were murdered. It was almost black inside the cabin now. Only a thin red line around the ceiling told how close they were to take off. His head was thick with drowsiness, his eyelids a heavy weight that he knew he couldn't keep open much longer. Eckert and he had been chosen to go to Tunpesh and investigate. The two of them, working together, should be able to find out why Pendleton had killed himself. But that wasn't the real reason. Maybe Eckert thought so, but he knew better. The real reason they were going there was to find out why Pendleton had been killed and who had killed him. That was it. Who had killed Cock Robin? The thin red line was practically microscopic now, and Templin could feel his lashes lying gently on his cheeks. But he wasn't asleep. Not quite. There was something buzzing about in the dim recesses of his mind. Their information on Tunpesh was limited. They knew that it had no trading concessions or armed forces and that nobody from neighboring systems seemed to know much about it or even visited it. But a staff anthropologist must have been routinely assigned to Tunpash to furnish data and reports. Ted? He murmured sleepily, a faint stirring in the black bulk opposite him. Yes? How come our anthropologist on Tunpash didn't come across with more information? A drowsy mumble from the other cot. He wasn't there long enough. He committed suicide not long after landing. The room was a whirling pool of blackness into which his mind was slowly slipping. Takeoff was only seconds away. Why do people commit suicide? It's a nice day, isn't it, Ted? Eckert took a deep and pleasurable breath. It's the type of day that makes you feel good just to be alive. Warm breezes rustled through Eckert's graying hair and tugged gently at his tunic. The air smelled as if it had been washed and faintly perfumed with the balsamy scent of something very much like pine. A few hundred yards away, a forest towered straight and slim and coolly inviting, and brilliantly colored birds whirled and fluttered in the foliage. The rocket port, where they were standing, surrounded by their luggage, was a grassy valley where the all-too-infrequent ships could land and discharge cargo or make repairs. There was a blackened patch on it now, with little blast-ignited flames dying out around the edges. 
It won't be long before it will be green again, he thought. The grass looked as though it grew fast. It would certainly have plenty of time to grow before the next ship landed. He looked at the slim, dwindling shape that was the rocket, and was suddenly acutely aware that he and Templin would be stranded for six months on a foreign, and very possibly, dangerous planet, and there would be no way of calling for help or of leaving before the six months were up. He stood there for a moment, drinking in the fresh air and feeling the warmth of the sun against his face. It might be a pleasant six months at that, away from the din and the hustle and confusion, spending the time in a place where the sun was warm and inviting. I must be getting old, he thought, thinking about the warmth and comfort, like old dogs and octogenarians. Templin was looking at the scenery with a disappointed expression on his face. Eckert stole a side glance at him, and for a fleeting moment felt vaguely concerned. Don't be disappointed if it doesn't look like cloak and dagger right off, Ray. What seems innocent enough on the surface can prove to be quite dangerous underneath. It's rather hard to think of danger in a setting like this. Eckert nodded agreement. It wouldn't fit, would it? It would be like a famous singer suddenly doing a jazz number in an opera, or having the princess in a fairy tale turn out to be ugly. He gestured toward the village. You could hardly class that as dangerous from its outward appearance, could you? The rocket port was in a small valley surrounded by low wooded hills. The village started where the port left off and crawled and wound over the wooded ridges. Small houses of sun-baked whitewashed mud crouched in the shadow of huge trees and hugged the banks of a small stream. It looked fairly primitive, Eckert thought, and yet it didn't have the earmarks, the characteristics of most primitive villages. It didn't seem cluttered or dirty, and you didn't feel like beating a hasty retreat when the wind was blowing toward you. A few adults were watching them curiously in the usual bunch of kids that always congregated around rocket ports quickly gathered. Eckert stared at them for a moment, wondering what it was that seemed odd about them. And they stared back with all the alert dignity of childhood. They finally came out on the field and clustered around him and Templin. Templin studied them warily. Better watch them, Ted. Even kids can be dangerous. It's because you never suspect kids, Eckert thought. You never think they'll do any harm. But they can be taught. They could do as much damage with a knife as a man could, for instance, and they might have other weapons. But the idea still didn't go with the warm sun and the blue sky and the piney scent of the trees. One of the adults of the village started to walk toward them. The reception committee, Templin said tightly. His hand went inside his tunic. He couldn't be blamed for being jumpy, Eckert realized. This was his first time out, his first mission like this, and of course... Pendleton had been a pretty good friend of his. I'd be careful of what I did, Eckert said softly. I would hate to start something merely because I misunderstood their intentions. The committee of one was a middle-aged man dressed in a simple strip of white cloth, twisted about his waist and allowed to hang freely to his knees. When he got closer, Eckert became less sure of his age. He had the firm, tanned musculature of a much younger man, though a slightly seamed face and white hair aged him somewhat. Eckert still had the feeling that if you wanted to know his exact age, you'd have to look at his teeth or know something about his epiphyseal closures. "'You are Menshers from Earth,' the voice was husky and pleasant, and the pronunciation was very clear. Eckert regarded him thoughtfully and made a few mental notes. He wasn't bowing and scraping like most natives who weren't too familiar with visitors from the sky— and yet he was hardly either friendly or hostile. "'You learned our language from Pendleton and Reynolds?' Reynolds had been the anthropologist. "'We have had visitors from Earth before.' He hesitated a moment and then offered his hand, somewhat shyly, Eckert thought, in the terrestrial sign of greeting. "'You may call me Jothong, if you wish.' He paused a moment to say something in his native tongue to the kids who were around. They promptly scattered and picked up the luggage. While you are here, you will need a place to stay. There is one ready if you will follow me. He was polite, Eckert thought. He didn't ask what they were there for or how long they were going to stay. But then again, perhaps the natives were a better judge of that than he and Templin. The town was larger than he had thought at first, stretching over a wide expanse of the countryside. There wasn't, so far as he could see, much manufacturing above the level of handicrafts and simple weaving, Colored patches on far hillsides indicated the presence of farms, and practically every house in the village had its small garden. What manufacturing there was seemed to be carried on in the central square of the town, 
where a few adults and children squatted in the warm afternoon sun and worked industriously at potter's wheels and weaver's looms. The other part of the square was given over to the native bazaar where pots and bolts of cloth were for sale, and where numerous stalls were loaded with dry fruits and vegetables, and the cleaned and plucked carcasses of the local variety of fowl. It was late afternoon when they followed Jathong into a small whitewashed house midway up a hill. "'You are free to use this while you are here,' he said. Eckert and Templin took a quick tour of the few rooms. They were well furnished in a rustic sort of way, and what modern conveniences they didn't have they could easily do without. The youngsters who had carried their luggage left it outside and quietly faded away. It was getting dark. Eckert opened one of the boxes they had brought along took out an electric lantern and lighted it. He turned to Jathong. You've been very kind to us, and we would like to repay you. You may take what you wish of anything within this box. He opened another of the boxes and displayed the usual trade goods, brightly colored cloth and finely worked jewelry and a few mechanical contrivances that Eckert knew usually appealed to the primitive imagination. Jathong ran his hand over the cloth and held some of the jewelry up to the light. Eckert knew by the way he looked at it that he wasn't at all impressed. "'I am grateful,' he said finally. "'But there is nothing I want.' He turned and walked away into the gathering darkness. "'The incorruptible native,' Templin laughed sarcastically. Eckert shrugged. "'That's one of the things you do out of habit. Try and buy some of the natives so you'll have friends in case you need them.' He stopped for a moment, thinking. "'Did you notice the context?' He didn't say he didn't want what we showed him. He said there was nothing that he wanted, implying that everything he wanted he already had. That's not very typical of a primitive society, is it? No, I'm afraid it's not. Eckert started unpacking some of the boxes. You know, Ray, I got a kick out of the kids. They're a healthy-looking lot, aren't they? Too healthy, Templin said. There didn't seem to be any sick ones, or ones with runny noses, or cuts, or black eyes, or bruises. It doesn't seem natural. They're probably just well-brought-up kids, Eckert said sharply. Maybe they've been taught not to get in fights or play around in the mud on the way home from school. He felt faintly irritated, annoyed at the way Templin had put it, as if any deviation from an earth norm was potentially dangerous. Ted, Templin's voice was strained, this could be a trap, you know. In what way? The words came out slowly. The people are too casual, as though they're playing a rehearsed part. Here we are from an entirely different solar system, landed in what must be to them an unusual manner. They couldn't have seen rockets more than three or four times before. It should still be a novelty to them, and yet, how much curiosity did they show? Hardly any. Was there any fear? No. And the cute, harmless little kids? He looked at Eckert. Maybe that's what we're supposed to think. Just an idyllic, harmless society. Maybe that's what Pendleton thought, right to the very end. He was keyed up, jumpy, Eckert realized. He would probably be seeing things in every shadow and imagining danger to be lurking around every corner. It hadn't been established yet that Pendleton was killed, Ray. Let's keep an open mind until we know for certain. He flicked out the light and lay back on the cool bed, letting his body relax completely. The cool night wind blew lazily through the woods, slat blinds, carrying the fragrance of the trees and the grass, and he inhaled deeply and let his thoughts wander for a moment. It was going to be pleasant to live on Tunpesh for six months, even if the six months were all they had to live. The climate was superb, and the people seemed to cut above the usual primitive culture. If he ever retired some day, he thought suddenly, he would have to remember Tunpesh. It would be pleasant to spend his old age here, and the fishing was probably excellent. He turned his head a little to watch Templin get ready for bed. There were advantages in taking him along that Templin probably didn't even realize. He wondered what Templin would do if he ever found out that the actual reason he had been chosen to go was that his own psychological chart was very close to Pendleton's. Pendleton's own feelings and emotions would almost exactly be duplicated in Templin's. A few stray wisps of starlight pierced through the blinds and sparkled for an instant on a small metal box strapped to Templin's waist. A power pack, Eckert saw grimly, probably leading to the buttons on his tunic. A very convenient, portable, and hard-to-detect weapon. There were disadvantages in taking Templin, too. Just how primitive do you think the society is, Ted? Eckert put down the chain he had been whittling and reached for his pipe and tobacco. 
I don't think it's primitive at all. There are too many disparities. Their knowledge of a lot of things is a little more than empirical knowledge. They associate the growth of crops with fertilizer and nitrogen in the soil as well as sunlight, rather than the blessings of some native god. And they differ a lot in other respects. Their art and their music are advanced. Free art exists along with purely decorative art, and their techniques are finely developed. I'm glad you agree, then. Take a look at this. Templin threw a shiny bit of metal on the rough-hewn table. Eckert picked it up and inspected it. It was heavy, and one side of it was extremely sharp. What's it for? They've got a hospital set up here. Not a hospital like any we know, of course, but a hospital nonetheless. It's not used very much. Apparently the natives don't get sick here. But occasionally there are hunting accidents and injuries that require surgery. The strip of metal there is a scalpel. He laughed shortly. <laughs> Primitive little gadget, but it works well, as well as any of ours. Eckert hefted it in his palm. The most important thing is that they have the knowledge to use it. Surgery isn't a simple science. Well, what do you think about it? The obvious. They evidently have as much technology as they want, at least in fields where they have to have it. How come they haven't gone any further? Why should they? You can live without sky cars and rocket ships, you know. Did you ever wonder what kind of weapons they might have? The important thing, Eckert mused, is not if they have them, but if they'd use them, and I'd rather doubt that they would. We've been here for two weeks now, and they've been very kind to us, seeing that we've had food and water and what fuel we need. It's known in the livestock trade as being fattened up for the slaughter, Templeton said. Eckert sighed and watched a fat bug waddle across a small patch of sunlight on the wooden floor. It was bad enough drawing an assignment in a totally foreign culture, even if the natives were humanoid. It complicated things beyond all measure when your partner in the project seemed likely to turn into a vendettist. It meant that Eckert would have to split his energies. He'd have to do what investigating he could among the Tunpeshans, and he'd have to watch Templin to see that he didn't go off half-cocked and spoil everything. You're convinced that Pendleton was murdered, aren't you? Templeton nodded. Sure. Why? The two Peshans know why we're here. We've dropped enough hints along those lines. But nobody has mentioned Pendleton. Nobody has volunteered any information about him. And he was an attaché here for three years. Didn't anybody know him during that time? We've let it slip a few discreet statements that we would like to talk to Pendleton's friends. Yet, nobody comes around. Apparently in all the three years he was here, Pendleton didn't make any friends. And that's a little hard to believe. It's more likely that his friends have been silenced and any information about him is being withheld for a reason. What reason? Templeton shrugged. Murder! What other reason could there be? Eckert rolled up the thin slatted blinds and stared out at the scenery. A hundred feet down the road, a native woman was going to market, leading a species of food animal by the halter. They grow their women nice, don't they? Physically perfect, like the men... Templeton grumbled. You could get an inferiority complex just from watching the people here. Everybody's so damn perfect. Nobody's sick, nobody's unhealthy, nobody's too fat or too thin, nobody's unhappy. The only variation is that they don't all look alike. Perfection. It gets boring after a while. Does it? I hadn't noticed. Eckert turned away from the blinds. His voice was crisp. I knew Don Pendleton quite well, too, he said but it isn't blinding me to what I'm here for. We came to find out what happened to him, not to substantiate any preconceived notions. What we find out may be vitally important to anybody serving here in the future. I would hate to see our efforts spoil because you've already made up your mind. You knew Pendleton? Templin repeated grimly. Do you think it was suicide? I don't think there's such a thing as a suicide type when you come down to it. I'm not ruling out the possibility of murder, either. I'm trying to keep an open mind. What have we accomplished so far? What have we found out? We've got six months, Eckert said quietly. Six months in which we'll try to live here inconspicuously and study the people and try to cultivate informants. We would get nowhere if we came barging in asking all sorts of questions. And don't forget, Ray, we're all alone on Tunpesh. If it is a case of murder, what happens when the natives find out that we know it is? Templin's eyes dueled for a moment. Then he turned his back and walked to the window. I suppose you're right, he said at last. 
It's nice living here, Ted. Maybe I've been fighting it, but I can't help thinking that Don must have liked it here, too. One of the hardest things to learn in a foreign culture, Eckert thought, is when to enjoy yourself, when to work, and when to worry. Pelash Menchar? Shara. He took the bowl of Pelash nuts, helped himself to a few, and passed the bowl on. This was definitely the time to enjoy himself, not to work or worry. He had learned about the Halera a few days ago, and by judicious hinting to the proper authorities, he and Templin had been invited. It was a good chance to observe native customs, a little anthropology with refreshments. The main courses started making the rounds, and he took generous helpings of the roasted ulami and the broiled halunch, and numerous dabs from the side dishes of steaming vegetables. Between every course, they passed around a small flagon of the hot-spiced native wine, but he noticed that nobody drank to excess. The old Greek ideal, he thought. Moderation in everything. He looked at Templin, sitting across from him in the huge circle, and shrugged mentally. Templin looked as if he was about to break down and enjoy himself, but there was still a slight bulge under his tunic, where he had strapped his power pack. Any fool should have known that nothing would happen at a banquet like this, the only actual danger lay in Templin's getting excited and doing something he was bound to regret later on, and even that danger was not quite as likely now. There will be hell to pay, Eckert thought, if Templin ever finds out that I sabotaged his power pack. You look thoughtful, Minshar Eckert. Eckert took another sip of the wine and turned to the Tunpeshan on his left. He was a tall, muscular man with sharp eyes, a firm chin, and certain aura of authority. I was wondering if my countryman Pendleton had offended your people in any way, Nayova. Now was as good a time as any to pump him for what he knew about Pendleton's death. So far as I know, Minshar, Pendleton offended no one. I do not know what duties he had to perform here, but he was a generous and courteous man. Eckert gnawed the dainty meat off a slender ulami bone and tried to appear casual in his questioning. I'm sure he was, Nayova. I'm... Sure, too, that you were as kind to him as you have been to Templin and myself. My government is grateful to you for that. Nayova seemed pleased. We tried to do well for Minshar Pendleton as we could. While he was here, he had the house that you have now, and we saw that he was supplied with food and all other necessities. Eckert had a sudden clammy feeling, which quickly passed away. What Nayova had said was something he'd make sure Templin never heard about. He wiped his mouth on a broad flat leaf that had been provided, and took another sip of the wine. We were shocked to find out that Minshar Pendleton had killed himself. We knew him quite well, and we could not bring ourselves to believe he had done such a thing. Nayova's gaze slid away from him. Perhaps it was the will of the Great One, he said vaguely. He didn't seem anxious to talk about it. Eckert stared bleakly at his wine glass and tried to put the pieces of information together. They probably had a taboo about self-destruction, which would make it difficult to talk about. That would make it even harder for him to find out by direct questioning. A native fife trilled shrilly, and a group of young men and women walked into the room. The circle broke to let them through, and they came and knelt before Nayova. When he clapped his hands sharply, they retreated to the center of the circle and began the slow motions of a native dance. The sound of the fife softened and died, and the slow, monotonous beat of drums took its place. The beat slowly increased, and so did the rhythm of the dancers. The small fires at the corners of the hut were allowed to dwindle, and the center of the circle became filled with the motions of shadows intermixed with the swift shore movements of glistening limbs. Eckert felt his eyebrows crawl upward. Apparently the dance was the Tunpeshan version of the rites de passage. He glanced across the circle at Templin. Templin's face, what he could see of it by the flickering light, was brick-red. A voice spoke in his ear. It is hard for us to imagine anybody doing what Minshar Pendleton did. It is... And he used a native word that Eckert translated as being roughly equivalent to obscene. The dancers at the center of the circle finally bowed out with small garlands of flowers on their heads that signified their reaching adulthood. Acrobats then took the stage and went through a dizzying routine, and they in turn were succeeded by a native singer. They were all excellent, Eckert thought. If anything, they were too good. The bowl of palash nuts made its way around again, and Nayova leaned over to speak to him. If there is any possibility that I can help you while you are here, Menshar Eckert, you have but to ask. 
It would probably be a mistake to ask for a list of Pendleton's friends, but there was a way around that. I would like to meet any of your people who had dealings with Pendleton, either in business or socially. I will do everything not to inconvenience them in any way. I think they would be glad to help you. I shall ask them to go to you this coming week. It wasn't a driving rain, just a gentle drizzle that made the lanes muddy and plastered Eckert's tunic against him. He didn't mind it. The rain was warm and the trees and grass smelled good in the wet. How would you classify the culture after seeing the ceremony, Ted? Templin asked. About what you would expect. An Apollonian culture, simple and dignified. Nothing in excess, no striving for a great emotional release. Templin nodded soberly. It grows on you, doesn't it? You find yourself getting to like the place. And I suppose that's dangerous, too. You tend to let your guard down, the way Pendleton must have. You... what was that? Eckert tensed. There was a gentle padding in the mud, several hundred feet behind them. Templin flattened himself in the shadows alongside a house. His hand darted inside his tunic and came out with the slim deadliness of a needle gun. Don't use it, Eckert whispered tersely. Templin's eyes were thin, frightened slits in the darkness. Why not? Eckert's mind raced. It might be nothing at all, and then again it might be disaster. But there was still a chance that Templin might be wrong. And there were more immediate reasons. How many charges do you have for that? Twelve? You think you can stand there and hold them off with only twelve charges for your needle gun? There's my power pack. It's no good, Eckert said softly. The batteries in it are dead. I was afraid you might do something foolish with it. The footsteps were only yards away. He listened intently, but it was hard to tell how many there were by the sound. What do we do, then? See if they're following us first, Eckert said practically. They might not be, you know. They slid out from the shadows and ducked down another lane between the houses. The footsteps behind them speeded up and came down the same lane. We'll have to head back for our house, Eckert whispered. They started running as quietly as they could, slipping and sliding in the mud. Another stretch past the shuttered, crouching houses and they found themselves in the square they had visited on the day they had landed. It was deserted, the looms and pottery wheels covered with cloth and reeds to keep off the rain. They darted across it two thin shadows racing across the open plaza, and hurried down another path. The last path led to a small river that cut through the city. Templin looked around, gestured to Eckert, waded into the water and crouched under the small bridge that spanned it. Eckert swore silently to himself, then followed Templin in. The cold water swirled under his armpits, and he bit his lips to keep himself from sneezing. Templin's emotions were contagious. Would he have worried about the footsteps? He frowned and tried to be honest with himself. Perhaps he would, and perhaps he wouldn't have. But he couldn't have let Templin stay there and face the unknown approachers. Not Templin. Footsteps approached the bridge, hesitated a moment, then pattered on the wooden structure and faded off down the muddy path. Eckert let out his breath slowly. The footsteps were curiously light. There was only one pair of them. I would like to know something, Templin said coldly. He stripped off his power pack and let it fall to the floor of their house. Why did you decide to substitute dead batteries in the pack? Because, Eckert said shortly. I was afraid you would do something with it that you might regret later. You're inexperienced in situations like this. Your reactions aren't to be trusted. One false move here and we could follow Pendleton however he died. You know that. He wriggled out of his tunic and slowly peeled off his wet trousers. There was a timid knock at the door. He wrapped a blanket about himself and motioned to Templin to stand to one side. Templin grabbed a small stool, hefted it in one hand, and complied. Eckert went to the door and casually threw it open. A girl stood there, half in the outer darkness and half in the yellowish light from the room, covered with mud to the knees and drenched to the skin. The Menshar forgot this at the Halera, she said softly. She quickly handed him his pipe and soggy bag of tobacco, and disappeared instantly into the rain. He listened for the sound of her footsteps in the soft mud and then closed the door. Templin put down the stool and stared stupidly at the pipe and tobacco sack. Eckert placed them carefully on the table and began to towel himself. We probably face as much danger from our own imaginations as from anything else, he said grimly. Tell me, would you have fired first or would you have waited until you found out for sure who she was and what she wanted when she first started to follow us? I don't know, Templin said sullenly. Then I'll leave your imagination to the position we would be in now if you had given in to your impulse. 
We haven't found out much, have we? Templin demanded some days later. No, Eckert admitted. We haven't. He riffled through the thick stack of cards on the table. Statistically, the results were not only interesting, but slightly phenomenal. During the three years or so that Pendleton had been on Tunpesh, he had met and known approximately 700 of the natives. By far the greater majority of these, of course, were purely casual and meant nothing. Almost a hundred, though, had had extended relations with Pendleton in business or social affairs. Of this hundred, none, not a single one, would admit that he had known Pendleton well or could be considered a friend of his. About all they had to say was that Pendleton had been healthy and easy to get along with, and one warm night he had shocked the community by going off and shooting himself. Like Richard Corey, Eckert said aloud. Like who? Templeton asked. Richard Corey, a character in a poem by a 20th century poet, Edwin Arlington Robinson. Apparently he had everything to live for, but Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. I'll have to look it up some day, Templin said. He pointed to a stack of cards. That's so much waste paper, isn't it? Yes, it is, Eckert said reluctantly. To be frank, I'd hoped we'd know a lot more by now. I still can't understand why we haven't dug up anybody who will admit to having been his friend. How do you know they're telling the truth? Or for that matter, how do you know that the ones we've seen so far are the ones who actually knew Pendleton? Eckert drummed his fingers on the table. You handle different human cultures for 25 years, and you get to the point where you can tell if people are lying or not. Or do you? Maybe just an old man's conceit. Age alone never lent wisdom. Regardless of the personal reasons that Templin might have for thinking the Tun Peshans are lying, the fact remains that they very easily could be. And what should you do if they are? There was a polite knock at the door. Well, you've got another visitor, Templin said sarcastically. He probably saw Pendleton at a Halera four years ago and wants to be sure we know all about it. The Tun Peshan looked faintly familiar to Eckert. There was something about the man's carriage. I met you the day you landed. The Tun Peshan began, and Eckert remembered, Jathong, the guide who had shown them to the house. You knew Pendleton? Jathong nodded. I and a fellow weaver took over his small office after he had left it. Eckert recalled the small office in the square with the bolts of cloth on display, and the small mud brick on the window ledge with the incised lettering reading, Donald Pendleton, service attaché. Why didn't you tell us this before? I didn't know what kind and how much information you wanted. We didn't ask him, Eckert thought, so we didn't volunteer any information. Polite to say the least. How long did you know him? Since he landed, I was the one appointed to him. What do you mean, appointed to him? To try to learn his language and try to teach him ours. Eckert felt his interest rising. Jathong, then, must have known Pendleton fairly well. Did he have any enemies that you know of? Enemies. Jathong seemed ignorant of the meaning of the word, so Eckert explained. No, he had no enemies. He would naturally have none such on Tunpesh. Templin leaned forward, tense. If he had no enemies, why did he have no friends? You, for example, knew him longer and better than most. Why is it that you weren't his friend? Jathong looked unhappy as if being forced to say something he wanted not to say. Pendleton was Kava. I cannot explain it. The concept is difficult. You would not understand. He might be running the danger of throwing too many questions at Jathong, Eckert realized, and having him freeze up or turn vague. But it couldn't be helped. They had made no progress at all by subtlety, and time would eventually run out. He tried to broach the next question delicately. Did... Pendleton know any of the women of your race? He knew some of the women, as he knew the men. The answer didn't tell Eckert what he wanted to know. Was he in love with any woman? It sounded crude the way he put it, but it was hard to think of any other way of asking it. Jathong looked at him incredulously, as if Eckert had asked him if Pendleton had had two heads. That would have been impossible. None of our women would have could have been in love with Menshar Pendleton. One line of inquiry just gone f Eckert thought. But Pendleton wasn't one to let a broken heart get him down anyway. Why not? Templin cut in harshly. 
He wasn't hard to look at, and he would have made a good husband. Jathong diplomatically turned around to face Templin. I have told you once, Pendleton was Kava. It would have been quite impossible. The answer to what had happened to Pendleton probably lay in Jathong's inability to explain his own terms, Eckert believed. One could get just so close, and then the definitions became vague and useless. He asked a few more questions and finally dismissed Jathong. The interview, like all the others he and Templin had held during the last week, had been worthless. They knew nothing more than they had when they landed. I still think they're lying, Templin said almost savagely. Or perhaps the ones who really know something haven't come around. Eckert got his pipe and sat near the doorway, letting the sun streaming through the foliage of a nearby tree dapple his face with a checkerboard pattern of modulated lights and velvety shadows. If they're evading us or if they're lying, then the society is a dangerous one for us. But I still can't believe it. They're not warlike. They don't seem to have many weapons and definitely none of an advanced type. How could anybody know for sure? Eckert methodically knocked the cold ashes out of his pipe and added more tobacco. Easy. Despite what you read in storybooks, no civilization lives simply, governs itself simply, and yet possesses super blasters. The sword and blaster combination just doesn't exist. Any weapon above the level of bows and arrows or knives is the product of a well-advanced technology. Along with weapons, of course, you have to have good communications. Now take an ordinary radio and think of the degree of knowledge, technology, and industrialization that would have to exist to supply it. There's nothing like that here. Templin came over to the warmth, streaming in through the doorway. It almost seems like they're acting in concert, though, as if there was some kind of plot where, by prearrangement, everybody knows exactly what to say. You're wrong again. You can practically smell a dictatorship or a tyranny, which is the only situation in which almost 100% of the population will follow the same line through fear of consequences if they don't. In a situation like that, the people are frightened, unhappy. You can hardly say that's the case on Tunpesh. No, Templin admitted, you couldn't. But still, you have to admit that the answers we've received so far are just too unanimous and too sketchy. All agree that Pendleton was a fine fellow. All agree that he had no native friends. Eckert nodded. I'll go along with that, and I think it's time we did something about it. Tonight we'll have to start eliminating certain ideas. He took a small case from their pile of luggage and opened it. Inside was a small battery-powered box with various dials set on the front and the usual electrodes and nerve probes protruding from the sides and top. Templin looked at it with surprise. That will be dangerous to use, won't it? It might be more dangerous not to. Time is getting to be a factor, and we have to make some progress. We have a safety margin of a sort, and that we can erase memories of its use, but the procedure is still risky. Who do we use it on? As long as we're going to use it, Eckert said grimly. We might as well start at the top. When they had started out, the investigation had seemed fairly simple to Eckert. There were two possibilities. Either Pendleton had committed suicide, or he had been murdered. Knowing Pendleton's record, the first possibility had seemed remote. A few weeks on Tunpesh had convinced him that the second possibility was also remote. One or the other had to be eliminated. The second would be the easiest. There were other reasons as well. Templin was still convinced that Pendleton had been killed and Templin was an emotional man with access to powerful weapons. The question was not what he might eventually do, but when. The night looked as if it would be another rainy one. It was cooler than usual, and dark clouds were scudding across the starlit sky. Eckerd and Templin stood in the shadows of the house, watching the dark lane for any casual strollers. Eckerd looked at his watch. A few minutes more and Niova would come out for his evening walk. Eckert had just started to think longingly of his bed and the warmth inside his house when the door opened and Naova appeared in the opening. Eckert held his breath while the chieftain stood uncertainly in the doorway, testing the night air, and then let it out slowly when Naova started down the lane. They closed in on him. The Minshars from Earth, he said without alarm. Is there something you wish? We would like you to come with us to our house for a while, Eckert started in. Naova looked puzzled. I do not understand. Would not tomorrow do as well? I'm afraid it'll have to be tonight. Naova was obviously not quite sure of their threat. 
No, I... Eckert caught him before he touched the ground. Templin took the rag off the butt of the needle gun, lifted the ruler's feet, and they disappeared into the brush along the lane. They would have to sneak back to the house, Eckert knew, and hoped that nobody saw them lugging the unconscious native. He laughed a little grimly to himself. Templin had expected cloak and dagger. It looked as if he was going to get more than his share of it, after all. Once inside the house, Eckert arranged the electrodes and the small nerve probes on Niova, who had come too. I am sorry, Eckert said formally, but we find this necessary. You understand that we have to find out all we can about Pendleton. We have no choice. He found it difficult to look the ruler in the face, even with the realization that this was strictly in the line of duty, and that the chieftain would not be hurt. But I have cooperated with you in every way possible, Niova protested. I have told you everything we know. That's right, Templin said bluntly. And now we're going to ask you the same questions. Niova looked blank for a moment and then reddened as he understood. Templin turned to the dials on the little square box. We would like to know, Eckert said politely, where you were two weeks ago at this time of night. Niova looked surprised. You know that I was at the Halera, the coming-of-age ceremony. You were there with me as my guests. You should assuredly know I was there. Eckert looked over at Templin, who nodded shortly. It had been a standard question to test the apparatus. Did Pendleton have any enemies here on Tunpesh? Niova emphatically shook his head. To the best of my knowledge, Minshar, Pendleton had no enemies here. He would have none. Templin's face showed its disappointment. Who were his friends? He had no friends. Templin glowered angrily, but he said nothing. Eckert frowned, the same answer. Pendleton had had no enemies, and yet he had had no friends. Would you say he was well-liked here? I would say no. Why not? A shrug. It is hard to explain, and you would not be able to understand. Did somebody here kill Pendleton? Eckert could hear Templin suck in his breath. No. Ask him that again, Templin cut in. Did somebody kill Pendleton? No. Did Pendleton kill himself? A trace of disgust showed on Nayova's face. Yes. Why? I do not know. Templin gestured to Eckert to take the box. Let me ask him. He came around and faced the native. Why did your people kill Pendleton? We did not kill him. We had no reason to wish him harm. Do you expect us to believe that Pendleton killed himself? We knew him better than that. You may believe whatever you wish, but men change, and perhaps he did. We did not kill him. Such an act would have been repugnant to us. I think that's enough, Eckert said calmly. Templin bit his lip as Eckert touched another dial on the machine. Niova suddenly jerked, looked blank, and slumped in the chair. Eckert took off the electrodes. Help me take him back, will you, Ray? They carried Niova to his house, stayed with him until he showed signs of recovering, and then left. Why didn't you use a drug? Templin demanded. Possible allergy or serum reaction. We don't know enough about these people to take chances. They're humanoid, not human. They can fool machines, though, can't they? Eckert didn't reply. All right, I know they can't, Templin said grudgingly. He was telling the truth all the time, wasn't he? Eckert nodded. I never did think he was lying. They don't seem to be the type. Their culture doesn't allow for it. They were silent for a while, walking quietly in the lanes between the shuttered, seemingly untenanted houses. I'm glad, Templin said quietly. It's off my mind. It's hard to believe that anybody here would deliberately kill somebody else. Templin's reactions would be worth something now for Eckert to study. They wouldn't be inhibited by his conviction that the natives had murdered his best friend. Just what reactions and emotions he would display, Eckert wasn't sure, nor how Templin's psychology, so similar to Pendleton's, would help solve the problem. They had eliminated one possibility, but that still left them with the one they had started with. Why had Pendleton taken the short way out? A breeze scampered through the open door and played tag with the papers on the desk. Eckert swore without annoyance and calmly started chasing those that had been blown on the floor. 
What did Pendleton have to say in his reports? Templeton sat in the doorway, his eyes barely open. He had begun taking siestas in the early afternoon after their usual light lunch. It was pleasant to sit on the worn wood and feel the warmth of sun and smell the crisp freshness of the outdoors, or maybe watch the kids playing in the lane, catching the butterflies that floated past in the afternoon air. Uh, about what you'd expect, mostly reports on the industry, climate, system of government, and general anthropological information that he thought might prove interesting. As far as I can see, he didn't lack enthusiasm for making the reports. If anything, he grew more enthusiastic as time went on. He practically wrote us treatises on every phase of life on Tunpesh. Templin's eyes closed all the way. Any indication in his reports that he didn't like it here? Just the other way around. Everything points to the fact that he liked the climate, the people, the way they lived. I don't blame him, Templin murmured. This is a lovely place to be. The climate is wonderful. The people are happy, hardworking. The society itself seems to be perfect. Sometimes you can't help but compare it too damn favorably to Earth. Eckert shoved the papers to one side and came over to where Templin sat. He felt rather lazy himself. The warmth and sunshine corroded ambition as it did in most climates like this. You know, there isn't any crime here, Templin continued. He laughed to himself. Except the minor crime wave we caused when we landed here five months ago. No criminals, no villains foreclosing mortgages, no gamblers bleeding the gullible white, and nobody trying to sell gold bricks. I can't get over it. A butterfly flapped into the sunlight that glistened on his tunic, like a drop of water on a piece of black velvet. It hung there for a moment and then was off, its wings flashing. Eckert watched it go in a sort of torpor. It was pleasant to relax and slip the leash off your thoughts quietly and see where they took you. Maybe it was a sort of letdown. They had expected six months of danger in a potentially criminal culture, and instead it had been paradise. As Templin said, you couldn't help but compare it to Earth. No greed, no belligerency, no contempt for the rights of others, no cynicism, no sarcasm, and no trampling crowds in the stores. The little important things. Where did you go last night, Ray? Templin stirred. A community meeting, almost like a Quaker meeting. You get up and say what you think. The one last night was about some local government issues. They talked it over, decided what to do, and how much each person should contribute. The original democracy, Ted. Eckert was wide awake. I wonder why I wasn't invited. He felt slightly put out that Templin should have been asked to something like that, and he hadn't been. Well, I wasn't invited, Templin said. I invited myself. Have you noticed, Eckert mused, we haven't been invited to too many functions lately? They know we're busy, Templin said lazily. They're too polite to ask us to go someplace if they thought we were busy doing something else. You like it here, don't you, Ray? Templin brushed idly at a marauding mosquito. It took me pretty long to warm up to it, but I guess I do. They only had a month left, Eckert knew. A month to do practically nothing but lie in the sun and watch the people. Oh, they could go through the motions of investigating and look over Pendleton's old records and reports, but there was nothing in them of any value. He yawned and sat down and settled his back against the door frame. It began to look as if they'd never find out why Pendleton had done what he had. And it didn't seem to matter somehow. Eckert opened the door slowly. Templin was asleep on the bed, the sunlight lying in bands across his tanned bare back. He had on a strip of white cloth, knotted at the waist in imitation of what the natives wore. It was must now, and the knot had started to come loose. He looked a lot healthier than he had when they first landed. More peaceful, more content. He appeared to have gained ten pounds and shed five years in the last six months. And now the vacation was over. It was time to go back. Ray? Eckert called out to him softly. Templin didn't stir, but continued his soft and very regular breathing. Eckert found a book and dropped it on the floor with a thud. Templin woke up, but didn't move. What do you want, Ted? How did you know it was me? Templin chucked as if it were hugely funny. <laughs> Riddles yet? Who else would it be? No tune Peshin would be rude enough to wake somebody up in the middle of a nap, so it had to be you. You know what you would have done if somebody had awakened you like that five months ago? Templin tried to nod, but was slightly handicapped by the bed underneath him. I would have pulled my rusty atom gun and plugged him. 
Eckert went over to where they kept their luggage and started pulling the boxes out from the wall. Well, I've got good news for you. A liner just landed to pick us up. They were going through this sector and they got an order from the service to stop by for us. Some cargo wallopers will be here in a few minutes to help us with our gear. Ted? Eckert paused. Yes? I'm not going back. Why not? Eckert's face had a look of almost clinical curiosity on it. Why should I? I like it here. I want to live here the rest of my life. The pieces began to fall in place. I'm not so sure you'd like it, Ray. Not after a while. All your friends are back on Earth. Everybody you know is back there. It's just the novelty of something new and something different here. I felt that way a lot of times in different cultures and different societies. You'd change your mind after a while. Those aren't reasons, Ted. Why should I go back to a world where most of the people are unhappy at some time? And a few people all the time. As far as I'm concerned, Tunpash is my home now, and I don't intend to leave it. Eckert was fascinated. It was like a case history unfolding right before his eyes. Are you sure you would enjoy it here for the rest of your life? Have you made any friends to take the place of those back home? It takes time to become acquainted, even more time to make friends, Templin said defensively. You can't desert the service, Eckert pointed out. You still have your duty. Templin laughed in his pillow. It won't work, Ted. Duty's just a catchword, a jingo phrase. They can get along without me, and you know it. What about Pendleton, Ray? He died here, you know, in mysterious circumstances. Would going back help him any? He wasn't murdered, we know that. And why do people commit suicide? For what one of several thousand possible reasons did Pendleton? We don't know. We'll never know. And if we did know, what good would it do? He had changed a lot in six months, Eckert saw. Too much. What if I told you I knew why Pendleton killed himself? Eckert asked. And that you would do the same if you stayed here. Don't use it, Ted. It's poor psychology. It won't work. The pieces made a perfect picture. But Templin was going back whether he wanted to or not. The only difficulty was that deep underneath, Eckert sympathized with him. Perhaps if he had been younger, less experienced. Then you won't go back with us. Templin closed his eyes and rolled over on his back. No. There was dead silence. Templin could smell the piney scent of the woods and feel the warmth of soft sunlight that lanced through the blinds. Some place far away there was the faint chatter of kids at play, but outside of that it was quiet. Too quiet. Templin opened his eyes in sudden alarm. Ted, don't! He caught the gas full in the face and tumbled back on the bed, unconscious. Eckert opened the hatch to the observation cabin as quietly as he could. Templin was seated on one of the pneumatic couches, staring soberly at a small yellow star in the black sky. He didn't look up. It's me, Ray, Eckert said. Templin didn't move. I suppose I owe you an apology, Eckert began. But I had to gas you to get you to leave, otherwise you wouldn't have left, and the same thing would have happened to you that happened to Don Pendleton. You're sure of that? Templin asked bitterly. Reasonably. You're a lot like Pendleton, you know. In fact, that's why you were selected to go. Not so much because you knew him as the fact that psychologically you were a lot like him. We thought that by studying your response to situations there, we would have a picture of what Pendleton's must have been. Templin didn't want to talk about it, Eckert realized, but it had to be explained to him. Do you want to know why Pendleton killed himself? Templin shrugged listlessly. I suppose we should have seen it right away, Eckert continued. Any race that is so happy with their way of life that they show no curiosity about strangers, the way they live, or what possessions they have, must have something to be happy about. Tunpesh is something that might happen only once in a thousand civilizations, maybe less, Ray. The environment is perfection, and so are the people, or at least as near to perfection as it's possible to get an intelligent people who have as much technology as they desire, living simply with themselves and each other. A fluke of nature, perhaps. No criminals, no insane, no neurotics. Perfect cultural pattern. Tunpesh is a paradise. You didn't want to leave. Neither did I, and neither did Pendleton. Templin turned on him. So it was paradise. Would it have been criminal if I'd stayed there? Who would it have hurt? It would have hurt you. 
Eckert said gravely. Because the Tunpeshans would never have accepted you. We're too different, Ray. We're too aggressive, too pushy, too persistent. We're not perfect. You see, no matter how long we stayed there, we would never have fit in. We lived in a harsh society, and we bear the scars of it. Our own environment has conditioned us, and we can't change. Oh, we could try, but it would crop up in little ways. Because of that, the natives could never genuinely like us. We'd never belong. Their own cultural pattern wouldn't allow them to accept us. Their cultural pattern is like the fire and the sword that were placed outside the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve were driven out, to keep it sacrosanct. If you're an outsider, you stay outside. You can never come in. He paused a moment, waiting for Templin to say something. Templin didn't. The natives have a word for it. Kava. It means, I suppose, different, not necessarily inferior, just different. We should have seen it as time went on. We weren't invited places. They seemed to avoid us. A natural reaction for them, I guess, I have to admit. Eckert cleared his throat huskily. You see, what happened to Pendleton, he continued awkwardly, is that he fell in love with Paradise. But Paradise would have nothing to do with him. By the time three years were up, he knew that he was an outcast in Eden, and he couldn't leave to come back and try to forget. He was stranded in Paradise and had to look forward to spending four more years there as a pariah. He couldn't do it, and neither could you. He was quiet for a moment thinking of the cool scented air and the warm sunshine and the happy kids playing on the grassy lanes. I suppose it didn't affect you at all, did it? Templin asked, venomously. A shadow crossed Eckert's face. You should know better than that, Ray. Do you think I'll ever forget it? Do you think I'll ever be satisfied with my own culture again? What are you going to do about it? It's dangerous to human beings, Ray. Looking at it brutally, their culture has killed two of our people, as surely as if Tunpesh were populated by murderous savages. We'll probably send a larger commission, throw it open to commerce, try to change it. Templin gripped the sides of the couch, his face strained and tense with anxiety. What happens to it depends on the report you make, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Then make up something in your report. Say the climate is bad for Earthmen. Say anything, but don't let them change Tunpesh. Eckert looked at him for a long moment, remembering. Okay, Ray, he said slowly. We'll leave Paradise alone. Strictly alone. It'll be put on the quarantine list. He turned and left. Behind him, Templin swiveled around in his chair and gazed bleakly at the tiny moat of yellow, fading in the blackness of space. End of the Fire and the Sword by Frank M. Robinson. This is The First Man on the Moon by Alfred Koppel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Atomic Dragons of Mars The First Man on the Moon by Alfred Koppel First printed in Planet Stories, Spring, 1950 John Thurman swore he'd be the first man on the moon, but he wasn't. He was only the first murderer. The ship lay at a crazy angle on the stark whiteness of the pumice plain. The rocket nozzles were a fused lump of slag, the fire-darkened hull crumpled and warped by the impact of landing. And there was silence, complete and utter silence. There could be no return. Thurman realized this. At first the thought had brought panic, but as the scope of his achievement dawned on him, the fear retreated. Bruised, giddy, half-crazed, the certainty of death held no terrors. Not yet. And it was worth it. 
fame, immortality, glory. In return for the last few years of a blighted, embittered, overshadowed life? Yes, it was well worth it. And except for the crash landing and the certainty of no return, it had all come to pass, just as he had planned it for so long. On his knees he caressed the gritty soil. He lifted his arms towards the day star, flaming in the day night of space, and new completion. Tears streaked down his stubbled face, and strange noises came from his slack mouth. The ecstasy of success was almost unbearable. For this he had labored a lifetime, for this he had murdered a friend. Across the abyss, the whole world waited for word. The transmitter in the rocket had survived the crash. The word would come, thought Thurman, when he was ready to send it, and, sending it, he would place the official seal of immortality on his brow. The book would close, but wonderfully, satisfyingly. There would be no other to steal his rightful glory. Only Wayne could have done that, and Wayne was dead. He laughed weirdly within his helmet. So simply done. The sea of serenity stretched out before him in weird magnificence. In the far distance, a mountain range rose precipitously from the wilderness of pumice to hump its spiny backbone at the brilliant stars. A limbo of black shadows and stark white talus slopes. Moonscape. Thurman stumbled to his feet and fought the wave of nausea that surged over him as his equilibrium teetered from the low gravity. Then, in an instant, his discomfort was forgotten. Standing on the brink of the cosmos, his ego drank of grandeur. All the splendor of creation lay before him like a jeweled carpet. All his. All for John Thurman. Genius. Explorer. Murderer. For John Thurman. First man on the moon. With an effort, he dragged his eyes from the sky. Slowly, his reason was returning. There was work to do. Wayne must be hidden. The next to come must never know. And it should be done quickly. Time would fly, and in the last hours, the fear would return. He knew that. Right now, his triumph sustained him. There was the broadcast to look forward to. A billion people waited for his words. It was a sob to his ego, but it could not make him forget that this was costing him his life. On occasion, Thurmond could be realistic, and he knew that, when there was nothing left to do but sit and wait for the end, he would be afraid. Terribly, hideously afraid, and alone. It was the only flaw in his plan for immortality. Yet his life had been a barren thing devoid of love or any real success. It was little enough to trade. And this was his only chance for lasting fame. He could not let it go. The plan was working, almost of its own inertia. He was alone. He was on the moon where no man had ever been before him. Not even Wayne. Wayne, who had designed the rocket and guided it. Wayne, who had stolen every chance Thurman ever had for recognition. Well, Wayne was dead now. He had never put a living foot on the soil of the moon. 
only Thurman had done that. And it was his passport to eternal glory. No one, no one could take that away from him. Weighed in the loaded balance of his mind, it more than compensated for dying alone on an alien world. In fact, even the dying would add to the legends, and Thurman would live forever. The first man on the moon. He ran his tongue over dry lips and stooped to pick up the thing at his feet. Wayne's corpse was still bloated from internal pressures, and the naked flesh was drying fast to a parchment-like consistency. Moisture was still seeping in awful little globules from the shattered skull where Thurman's unseen blow had landed. Thurman found himself shuddering. The murder had been the hardest part, but now it was done, and all that remained was to give his dead companion a secret resting place somewhere in the vast expanse of pumice that lay out there under the blistering sun. Thurman's unsteady mind swerved from high elation to sadness. Poor Wayne. He felt he could afford to be generous now. So many years of work, so soon to be forgotten. Just one quick blow, and poor, poor Wayne slipped into the limbo of the Earth's forgotten. Under the light gravity, he carried the naked, grisly bundle easily. And, as he walked out into the mare tranquillitatis, his spirits rose again. How wonderful it was to be certain that no one could steal his triumph. Not even Wayne. Particularly not Wayne. <laughs> he looked down at the thing in his arms and chuckled. The sound was uncanny within the Pyrex bubble of his helmet. After what seemed a long time, Thurman stopped and set down his burden. With his pack spade, he set to work digging a trench in the pumice. As he dug, he found himself crooning happily to the corpse. His voice was high-pitched and hysterical, but of course, he did not notice it. There. There. Wayne, old friend, see? I am making a grave for you. The very first grave, Wayne. And you shall have it, old friend. Yours the grave and mine the glory. He laughed hilariously at the thought. I I'll say you didn't make it alive. You didn't, did you? <laughs> but I made it, Wayne. Me. Alone. All alone. With no help from you. Do you hear? Thurman chattered on, the sound of his crazed voice dying within the confines of his helmet, while all around him the eternal silence of the Sea of Serenity continued unbroken. The stars shone steadily in the airless sky, and the sun flamed in impotent splendor, furiously silent. At last, the pit was done, and Thurman lowered the nude corpse into the shadows. Goodbye, Wayne. You see, you shouldn't have come here with me. You shouldn't have tried to steal my success. That was a wrong thing. But you're sorry now, aren't you, old friend? Don't feel too badly, Wayne. I'll join you soon. Goodbye, Wayne. Goodbye. Laboriously, he shoveled pumice into the pit and tamped it down with his leaded boots. Then he smoothed the surface of the dig until it was as smooth as the rest of the surrounding plain. Satisfied, he turned his back on the grave and started for the rocket. He sang on the way back, so happy was he to have done with his ghastly companion. Recklessly prodigal of his oxygen supply, he ran towards the open valve of the ship. Breath coming hard, he stumbled into the rocket and across the buckled deck plates to the radar phone. The tiny atomic batteries hummed as he removed the cadmium dampers. 
power flickered the needles of the main set. Thurman adjusted the selector to relay and tuned in his suit radio. Then he returned to sit in the open valve and call the monitoring station. He smiled with satisfaction as the response cut through the blanket of hissing solar static. Hello? Hello, yes, one. This is White Sands. My lord, we're giving you up for lost. Where are you? Thurman took a steadier grip on his dancing mind and replied, Listen carefully. Carefully, you understand. This is John Thurman. I am on the westernmost edge of the Sea of Serenity on the moon. Wayne is dead. He didn't make it. Died during acceleration, and I had to dispose of his body in space. Did you get that? I am alone here. The ship crashed on landing. I can't get back. But it's worth it. I haven't much time left, but I want everyone to know that I made it. It will be easier now for others, after I've pointed the way. I'm the first. And it's worth it. Did you get that? There was a long silence. Finally, the radar man spoke respectfully. Yes, Thurman, we got that. Your transmission is being shunted onto the commercial bands. Can you tell us what you see up there? And, and Thurman, we all want you to know that our prayers are with you. Tears were flowing on earth now, Thurman knew. Tears for a martyr to science, doomed to death alone on an alien world. He smiled thinly. Even this tiny taste of deference and respect was heady wine to his frustrated psyche. Thurman stepped through the valve and lowered himself to the plane. His heart was pounding triumphantly. Carefully, painstakingly, he began to describe his surroundings, interspersing his words with scientific data. He played the hero well. There was no hysteria recognizable in his voice. And if it trembled slightly, there was reason enough for that. He rounded the bulge of the rocket's nose and looked for the first time at the western edge of the mare. In the near distance, an irregularly shaped outcropping of rock caught his eye. Transmitting as he went, he made his way toward it. He drew nearer, and as he did, fear began to stir within him. His steps faltered, but some awful power drew him on. His voice became a shrill rasp in his ears, and on earth a billion people gasped with horror. Wayne! Thurman shouted the name in fear and threw his arms over his face. But the thing remained. It was real. Wayne! No! It can't be! No! But the figure did not move. The vast colossus loomed stark white and naked in the brilliant sunlight. Legs apart, arms folded on its breast, it stared with brooding eyes at the vast emptiness of the lunar plain. Thurman howled with terror and fury. Damn you! Damn you! Why don't you enter me? I killed you once! I'll kill you again! I'm the first one here! Do you hear me? I'll kill you again! He lowered his head and charged. The last thing he remembered was the soundless tinkle of his shattering helmet and the terrible pain as his skull cracked under the suddenly shifting pressures. And strangely enough, the story of the race's first conquest of space is the story of one man, Sargon, the Lemurian immortal, who led his people to the moon in the misty past of Earth's youth. The Lemurians are gone now, but on the westernmost edge of the Sea of Serenity there stands a statue of Sargon. 
It stands in magnificent isolation, a monument to the first man on the moon. Essays on Tellurian History, Quintus Bland, Geneva Keep Press, 12.50 credits. And that is the end of The First Man on the Moon by Alfred Koppel, recorded by the Atomic Dragons of Mars. Green Grew the Lasses by Ruth Laura Wainwright This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winifred Asman Green Grew the Lasses by Ruth Laura Wainwright The September evening was hot and humid, and Helen Raymond, watching her husband pace nervously about the living room, grew tenser by the minute. Robert would walk up to an open window, sniff abstractedly, move to the next window and repeat the performance. "'For goodness sakes, Robert, what are you snuffling about?' she finally demanded in exasperation. She had been on edge ever since her cousin Dora had arrived that afternoon. Dora had lost another of a long succession of short-lived jobs and, as usual, had descended on them without warning for an indefinite visit. Wasn't it enough to have to bear that and the heat, too, without Robert's acting up? Smog's getting worse all the time, Robert complained. Dora lifted her nose to sniff daintily. It is an odd smog. Now in New York, we don't. Her voice trailed off and left the sentence hanging as she drew in another sample of the night air. Helen sniffed, too. We look like a bunch of rabbits, she thought irritably. But Dora was right. It was an odd smog, sort of sweet and bitter at the same time. Not so furic like most of the smog they were used to, or the spoiled onions frying in rancid fat smell of oil wells when the wind was off the land. This odor made her think of rank tropical weeds, a jungle miasma, though she had never been near a jungle. There was something familiar about it, though. And then she remembered that her hands had smelled like that the morning after she had weeded the tiny garden alongside their house. The flower bed had been cluttered with weeds of a kind she had never seen before, horrible-looking things. Could they be the cause of that awful smell? They had sprung up everywhere lately, and while she had pulled them out of their own garden, they were growing all over, and she couldn't very well weed the whole town, could she? I think, wait, I want to get something, she said, and ran outdoors. She came back with a sample of the weed, one that she pulled from the garden of the vacant house next door. The plant was about a foot high, with a straight, stiff stem of a bright metallic green, with a single row of inch-wide rosettes of chartreuse leaves or petals down one side of the stem. There could be no doubt about its being the cause of the unpleasant odor, and Helen held it out at arm's length. "'What the heck is that?' Robert asked. "'Smell,' she said. "'Phew, so that's it. What is it, anyway?' Helen shook her head. "'Never saw anything like it until recently.' I pulled them out of our garden, but they're all over. Helen carried the offending plant to the back door. When she came back, Robert peered at her intently, shut his eyes and shook his head quickly, and then stared at her again. Think you'll know me next time you see me? she asked, annoyed. First good look I've had at you this evening. What kind of face powder is that you're using? Don't tell me that peculiar shade is the latest fashion. Puzzled, Helen put her hand to her face, as if she should be able to feel the color. "'Um's green,' chortled eight-year-old Bobby. "'You ought to see yourself!' "'Green?' Helen asked worriedly. "'Green,' Robert said. "'You feel all right?' "'Anemia,' Dora declared positively. "'You don't eat properly. Not enough vitamins. Now while I'm here—' A quick look in the mirror, and Helen told herself that she wasn't really a green-green, just sort of greenish if you looked at her in the right light. 
By morning, the odd colour ought to be all gone. There was no sense in worrying. Anybody could look sort of off-colour now and then. Maybe Dora was right. She was anemic. But she was stunned by the first sight of herself in the mirror the next morning. There was no mistaking it this time. She was as green as grass, and Dora, too, was beginning to show signs of becoming that unbecoming colour. Reluctantly, Dora conceded that it might not be the diet after all. She hadn't been there long enough for it to have that much effect. Robert and Bobby were still shockingly normal. What, whatever can it be? Helen asked shakily, holding out her green hands. The only answer was hysterical screaming that sent them all racing to the front door. The Raymonds lived in a typical California court with four small houses facing four other small houses across a central walk that ran at right angles to the street. On this walk, most of the tenants were now gathered, and the Raymonds and Dora joined them. Helen didn't know whether to feel relieved or more dismayed when she saw that all the women and girls were as green as she, and just as terrified. Someone, of course, had called the police, and a prowl car hummed to a stop at the curb. A harassed, white-faced policeman leaned out of the window. We're doing all we can, he called. It's like this all over town. Don't know yet what caused it, but we're investigating. The car sped away. It was soon apparent that only Mimosa Beach was affected. Why, no one could guess. Some said it was all a publicity stunt of some kind. Advertising a movie or television show, or a chlorophyll product, perhaps. But they couldn't explain how it worked, or why only women and girls were affected. And how could it possibly help sell anything? Overnight, Mimosa Beach became famous, and infested with reporters and color photographers, all male. There would have been a mass exodus if there had been any place to go. But other communities, fearing that their womenfolk would catch the greenness, like measles, refused to let them in. Besides, in Mimosa Beach they had the dubious comfort of all being alike, while elsewhere they would have been freaks. There was so little they could do to make themselves look attractive. The cosmetics they had, or that were available, were all wrong. But they did the best they could, though there was no hiding that ghastly green complexion. "'What a shame your hair isn't red,' Dora said one day to Helen. "'Amy Olson now, her hair really goes with green skin.' Cocking her head to one side, she studied the younger woman intently. "'Your hair, that mousy brown, wonder if we couldn't touch it up just a wee bit.' Helen clenched her teeth against the coy, criticizing voice. "'I'm not the flamboyant type,' she said. Dora was as green as Helen by this time, and it certainly wasn't a bit more becoming to her. She seemed to be enjoying the publicity, though. Besides, it gave her a good excuse for not leaving. If only the greenness had come before Dora, they might have been spared one calamity. Four girls moved into the house next to the Raymonds, the last house in the row. Neither the Raymonds nor Dora noticed that they had moved in. They came so quietly. The houses in the court were furnished, and they must have paid the rent, obtained the keys, and walked in, all settled as soon as they closed the door behind them. It wasn't until they rang the Raymond's doorbell in the early evening that anyone in the household was aware of them. "'We move next door,' one of them said brightly to Helen when she answered the door. "'We come see you. Get acquainted. We come in?' "'Of course,' Helen said, and they trooped in. "'We're the Raymond's.' and this is my cousin, Dora Hastings. The new neighbor, who had spoken first, pointed to her companions, one by one. Patricia Pontiac, she said, Clara Ford, Mary Maroon, me, poking a thumb at her own midriff, Jack Jones. Jack Jones? Helen repeated. That's a man's name. Man? the girl asked blankly. Man, Robert said impatiently, like me. The four girls noticed him for the first time, and then they saw Bobby. They stared at the two of them, their mouths slightly open, their eyes wide with horror. They drew closer to each other as if for protection, and shivered. Robert and Bobby looked at each other in bewildered embarrassment. "'My husband and son,' 
Helen said tartly. Did these odd creatures think all males were wolves, including eight-year-old Bobby? That, that color, Mary Maroon quavered. Not green. Only dames are green, Bobby scornfully said. Imagine, Dora tittered nervously, afraid of Robert and Bobby. Won't you sit down, Helen asked. This nonsense of being scared of her menfolk had gone on long enough. She didn't want them to sit down. She wanted them to go. But she could hardly ask them to do that. Naturally, they sat down. Bobby turned on the television for a space opera, and the four new neighbors watched it avidly. When the spaceship landed on what was supposed to be Venus, they giggled behind their hands and looked at each other sidewise. Had they ever seen a show like that before? What was so unusually funny about this one? When the commercial came on, Robert turned off the sound. Mary Maroon looked at Bobby, and then at Helen, who was sitting with her arm around her son. "'You, baby?' she asked. Helen smiled proudly. "'Yes, this is my baby.' Bobby squirmed indignantly. Mary Maroon then turned to Robert. "'You got baby?' Robert said, "'Sure, this is my baby,' patting Bobby on the knee. To Helen he muttered, "'What does she think, anyway?' The four stared at Robert and Bobby and Helen in such obvious confusion that Robert jumped up nervously to turn the sound back on. After the girls had gone home, Bobby was sent off to bed, and Robert, loosening his tie, demanded, "'What's the matter with them, anyhow?' Do they have to stare at me as if I were a damned biological error? Don't they know what a man is, for heaven's sake? Really, Robert, Dora protested, blushing a deeper green. Well, for gosh sake. Those names, Helen said. Clara Ford, that's not too bad. I'm not so sure about Mary Maroon. Dora nodded. Mary White, Mary Black, so why not Mary Maroon? But Patricia Pontiac? Helen threw up her hands. They must have made that one up. But Jack Jones? Crazy, if you ask me, Robert said, pretending they were scared of me and Bobby. There's a Patricia Beauty Shop next to the Pontiac Agency, Dora suggested. Maybe. Funny way to get a name. Where the heck are they from? Robert wondered. Must be from right here in town, Helen reminded him. Otherwise, they wouldn't be green. You know, the greenness sort of looks natural on them, Dora said thoughtfully. Well, I think I'll go to bed. After she had gone, Helen said wistfully in a whisper, If only awful things could sort of counteract each other the way some poisons do. She started making up the Davenport bed. Dora had their room. First Dora's coming, and our turning green. And now those crazy girls right next door. But three poisons. No, it wouldn't come out even. It was a day or two later when Helen found her new neighbors working in the little flower bed alongside their house. They were busily transplanting weeds of the kind responsible for the unpleasant odor. For goodness sake, Helen exclaimed, disgusted. What in the world do you want with that stuff? Why, it took the rest of us here in the court days to get it all out, and now you want to bring it back. Throw it away. Oh, no, Patricia Pontiac objected, holding a bunch of the weeds against her heart protectingly. It's feinweed. You mean you've seen this stuff before? Patricia nodded. We have it all over where we came from. Must have feinweed. But you couldn't have come from someplace else, Helen pointed out. You wouldn't be green if you did. All green where we come from, Mary Maroon said. I don't know where that stuff, feinweed you call it, came from, Helen said, refusing to pay any attention to their claim that they came from some place else where everyone was green. There just wasn't any such place. We drop seed other time we come, Patricia said. Then she added indignantly, You no believe we come from other place? What other place? asked Helen, with weary politeness. You call it Venus. That picture the other night, Clara Ford giggled. Not like Venus at all. So funny. Helen could stand no more. So are you, she said rudely and went into the house. 
They were even crazier than she'd thought. Greener, too, when you saw them in broad daylight. Did the greenness affect the mind, and the greener you got, the zanier you became? Would she get to be like that? The idea frightened her. No turn green, Patricia Pontiac asked Robert plaintively one day, as if she were blaming him for her bewilderment. No, he answered shortly, but I don't blame you for envying us men. It must be tough to be that lousy-looking color. Green is good color, Mary Maroon declared stoutly. You know, have baby yourself? Of course not. Patricia turned to Helen. Then what's she for? He, Robert corrected, and then added sarcastically, Papa works to buy baby shoes. Now does that answer your question? Helen sighed. There was just no use trying to explain anything to those four girls. Fall and winter passed. The dull monotony of being green was accented now and then by articles and pictures in newspapers and magazines, and by rumors, always proved false, that a remedy had been found, though chemists, biologists, and doctors continued hunting for the cause of the catastrophe. Autopsies provided no clue. Women protested that the doctors were looking at them with a wishful drop-dead expression as if the next autopsy might be the one that would supply the answer. The greenness was still confined to Mimosa Beach. Other communities kept up their quarantine. The four girls next door to the Raymonds were as zany as ever, and Dora Hastings stayed on of necessity. And then the monotony was broken by greater calamities. First, there was the matter of Patricia Pontiac's approaching motherhood. While this, of course, made no difference as far as the town was concerned, Dora was greatly perturbed, and ever being one to insist on others keeping within the limits of her own narrow paths, she took the girl to task. Patricia, she insisted sternly, there simply must be a man to blame for your condition. You must marry him. Think of the baby. You want him to be fatherless? Fatherless? Him? Patricia repeated, frowning in perplexity. What you talking about? My little baby girl, all mine. This man business I don't understand. Nonsense. You're just trying to pretend innocence. Oh, give it up, Dora, Helen urged wearily. She doesn't know what you're talking about. Dora raised skeptical eyebrows. In her condition? After that, Dora went around with a great air of virtue condescending to help the wayward. It must be a burden, Helen felt to have to feel superior because of other people's faults. Such a negative sort of superiority. During the next few weeks, Dora had plenty of chance to feel superior. Other unmarried girls and women besides Patricia became pregnant, and like Patricia, they insisted no man was responsible. But they were not complacent about it the way Patricia was. To them it was an indignity they did not deserve. "'What's this town coming to, anyway?' Dora demanded. Parthenal genetic births, maybe? Helen ventured. No one would have believed that we'd turn green, but we did. Honestly, Dora, I'm getting so I'd believe almost anything in this nightmare existence of ours, even that you were about to have a baby. That, Dora rejoined acidly, is not at all likely. But are you trying to imply that our turning green could have something to do with these shameful births? I didn't say that, but you could be right. <laughs> Dora snorted. A lot of nonsense. The four girls were in the Raymond's living room one afternoon, a week later, talking with Helen, when Dora, who had been feeling ill and had gone to the doctors, walked in. She glared at the four girls. I'm going to have a baby, she accused them. Helen drew her breath in sharply. Oh, no, not you, too. Of course, Clara Ford said complacently. Everyone have babies, except Robert and Bobby and the ones like them. Jack and Mary and I have ours before we leave Venus. I've only one each, of course. But why am I like this? How can I have a baby this way? Dora's voice was shrill with anger and panic. How else? Jack asked calmly. A little chill of horror raced down Helen's spine. Could these odd girls really be telling the truth? Were they from Venus, as they insisted? She could just imagine them coming to Earth, on a flying saucer, maybe, listening to the radio to learn the language. 
spying on us but not learning as much as they thought they did. She choked off a giggle, an incipient hysteria, as another thought struck her. Will I have one of those, those... You already have baby, Patricia said. Can't see how you have baby before we come with Fainweed to make you green. Helen and Dora stared at her. You mean, Helen finally was able to ask, that that weed caused all this? That little weed? That is what we tell you all along, only you always walk away angry. All those scientists working so hard, Helen realized bitterly, and all the time what they were looking for was literally under their feet. How could anyone have thought that the fane weed was responsible for anything but the bad smell they had finally become accustomed to? Why didn't I listen to these girls? Pay more attention to what they said, Helen asked herself. She might have been able to prevent a lot of things that had happened. She got up from her chair and walked nervously about. Well, she couldn't change the past, but she could stop further evil from the faneweed. I'll bet they don't have men on Venus, she said to Dora, judging from the way they act. Then they'd have to have parthenogenetic births. She turned to Patricia. Why did you come to Earth? And why just to Mimosa Beach? We try little place, what you call sample, before we change whole world, Patricia explained. And then she added sadly, So many of our babies die. Not enough people left on Venus. We think maybe you like to come to Venus with us, so we make you as us. That was very, very wicked of you, Dora said severely. The four Venusians shrugged resignedly. Might as well go home, Mary Maroon said. They don't like it our way. And leave me like this, Dora demanded shrilly. Get rid of Faneweed, be as before, Patricia assured her. With a baby I'll have trouble accounting for, Dora said bitterly. Oh, no, you don't. You stay right here. And Helen, don't you tell anybody that it's the Faneweed. Then people from other places won't know about my baby, and it won't matter here as long as things are the way they are. You come with us, Clara suggested wheedlingly. You'll like Venus. Venus so pretty. No work, all happiness. No work? No wonder the babies die, Dora exclaimed. Helen could see the yeast of reform beginning to work in Dora. The four Venusians looked puzzled. They do that all the time, Helen thought irritably. Aloud, she said, Dora, of course I have to tell about the faneweed. There are others involved, you know. I don't suppose, Dora interrupted, that you girls know anything about diet. Those babies could probably be saved with a little intelligence and some hard work. When the four Venusians left shortly thereafter for their home, they took along Dora Hastings, who had great plans for their planet. With the faneweed on earth destroyed, the women and girls of Mimosa Beach returned to their original color. Even the parthenogenetic baby girls born as a result of the unfortunate experiment of the Venusians were white. Well, the bad things went in pairs after all, Helen said to Robert when everything was normal again. The faneweed was the fourth evil, though we didn't know it. And when we got rid of the faneweed, the greenness left. The Venusians went away, and... And I do hope Dora's all right. She finally got what should be a lifetime job, Robert answered. He crossed his fingers and, looking out of a western window at Venus, bright against the darkening sky, added, At least Venus is farther away than New York. That ought to help. End of Green Grew the Lasses by Ruth Laura Wainwright Jonah of the Jove Run by Ray Bradbury This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker Jonah of the Jove Run by Ray Bradbury Nibley stood in the changing shadows and sounds of Marsport, watching the great supply ship Terra being entered and left by a number of officials and mechanics. Something had happened. Something was wrong. There were a lot of hard faces and not much talk. There was a bit of swearing, and everybody looked up at the night sky of Mars, waiting. 
but nobody came to Nibley for his opinion or his help. He stood there, a very old man with a slack-gummed face and eyes like the little bubbly stalks of crayfish looking up at you from a clear creek. He stood there fully neglected. He stood there and talked to himself. They don't want me or need me, he said. Machines are better nowadays. Why should they want an old man like me with a taste for Martian liquor? They shouldn't. A machine isn't old and foolish and doesn't get drunk. Way out over the dead sea bottoms, Nibbly sensed something moving. Part of himself was suddenly awake and sensitive. His small sharp eyes moved in his withered face. Something inside of his small skull reacted and he shivered. He knew. He knew that what these men were watching and waiting for would never come. Nibbly edged up to one of the astrogators from the Terra. He touched him on the shoulder. Say, he said. I'm busy, said the astrogator. I know, said Nibbly. But if you're waiting for that small repair rocket to come through with the extra auxiliary asteroid computator on it, you're wasting your time. Like hell, said the astrogator, glaring at the old man. That repair rocket's got to come through, and quick. We need it. It'll get here. No, it won't said Nibley, sadly, and shook his head and closed his eyes. It just crashed a second ago, out on the Dead Sea bottom. I felt it crash. I sensed it going down. It'll never come through. Go away, old man, said the astrogator. I don't want to hear that kind of talk. It'll come through. Sure, sure, it has to come through. The astrogator turned away and looked at the sky, smoking a cigarette. I know it as a fact, said Nibley but the young astrogator wouldn't listen. He didn't want to hear the truth. The truth was not a pleasant thing. Nibley went on to himself. I know it for a fact, just like I was always able to know the course of meteors with my mind, or the orbits or parabolas of asteroids. I tell you... The men stood around waiting and smoking. They didn't know yet about the crash out there. Nibley felt a great sorrow rise in himself for them. That ship meant a great deal to them, and now it had crashed. Perhaps their lives had crashed with it. A loudspeaker on the outer area of the landing tarmac opened out with a voice. Attention! Crew of the Terra! The repair ship just radioed in a report that it has been fired upon from somewhere over the Dead Seas. It crashed a minute ago. The report was so sudden and quiet and matter-of-fact that the standing, smoking men did not for a moment understand it. Then, each in his own way, they reacted to it. Some of them ran for the radio building to verify the report. Others sat down and put their hands over their faces. Still more of them stood staring at the sky, as if staring might put the repair ship back together again and get it here safe and intact. Instinctively, at last, all of them looked up at the sky. Jupiter was there, with its coterie of moons, bright and far away. Part of their lives lived on Jupiter. Most of them had children and wives there, and certain duties to perform to ensure the longevity of said children and wives now with the speaking of a few words over a loudspeaker, the distance to Jupiter was suddenly an immense impossibility. The captain of the rocket Terra walked across the field slowly. He stopped several times to try and light a cigarette, but the night wind blew it out. He stood in the rocket shadow and looked up at Jupiter and swore quietly, again and again, and finally threw down his cigarette and healed it with his shoe. Nibbly walked up and stood beside the captain. Captain Kroll... Kroll turned. Oh, hello, Grandpa. Tough luck. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's what you'd call it. Tough luck. You're going to take off anyway, Captain. Sure, said Kroll quietly, looking at the sky. Sure. How's the protective computator on board your ship? Not so hot. Bad, in fact. It might conk out before we get halfway through the asteroids. That's not good, said Nibbly. It's lousy. I feel sick. I need a drink. I wish I was dead. I wish we'd never started this damn business of being damn pioneers. My family's up there. He jerked his hand halfway to Jupiter violently. He settled down and tried to light another cigarette. No go. He threw it down after the other. Can't get through the asteroids without an asteroid computator to protect you. Without that old radar set up, Captain, said Nibley, blinking wetly. He shuffled his small feet around in the red dust. "'We had an auxiliary computator on that repair ship coming from Earth,' said Kroll, standing there. "'And it had to crash.' The "'Martian shoot it down, you think?' "'Sure. They don't like us going up to Jupiter. They got claims there, too. 
They'd like to see our colony die out. Best way to kill the colony is to starve the colony. Starve the people. That means my family and lots of families. Then, when you starve out the families, the Martians can step in and take over. Damn their filthy souls. Kroll fell silent. Nibbly shifted around. He walked around in front of Kroll so Kroll would see him. Captain? Kroll didn't even look at him. Nibbly said, Maybe I can help. You? You heard about me, Captain. You heard about me? What about you? You can't wait a month for another auxiliary computator to come through from Earth. You gotta push off tonight. To Jupiter. To get to your family and the colony. And all that, Captain. Sure. Nibbly was hasty. He sort of fidgeted around, his voice high and excited. And if, if your only computator conks out in the middle of the asteroids, well, you know what that means. Bang! No more ship. No more you. No more colony on Jupiter. Now, you know about me, my ability, you know, you heard? Kroll was cool and quiet and far away. I heard about you, old man. I heard lots. They say you got a funny brain and do things machines can't do. I don't know. I don't like the idea. But you've got to like the idea, Captain. I'm the only one can help you now. I don't trust you. I heard about your drinking that time and wrecking that ship. I remember that. But I'm not drinking now. See? Smell my breath. Go ahead. You see? Kroll stood there. He looked at the ship and he looked at the sky and then at Nibbly. Finally, he said, Old man, I'm leaving right now. I might as well just take you along as leave you. You might do some good. What can I lose? Not a damn thing, Captain. And you won't be sorry, cried Nibbly. Step lively, then. They went to the rocket, Kroll running, Nibbly hobbling after. Trembling excitedly, Nibbly stumbled into the rocket. Everything had a hot mist over it. First time on a rocket in ten years, by God. Good. Good to be aboard again. He smelled it. It smelled fine. It felt fine. Oh, it was very fine indeed. First time since that trouble he got into off the planet Venus. He brushed that thought away. That was over and past. He followed Kroll up through the ship to a small room in the prow. Men ran up and down the rungs. Men who had families out there on Jupiter and were willing to go through the asteroids with a faulty radar set up to reach those families and bring them the necessary cargo of machinery and food they needed to go on. Out of a warm mist, old Nibbly heard himself being introduced to a third man in the small room. Douglas, this is Nibbly, our auxiliary computating machine. Uh, poor time for joking, Captain. It's no joke, cried Nibbly. Here I am. Douglas eyed Nibbly with a very cold and exact eye. No, he said. No, I can't use him. I'm a computant mechanic. And I'm Captain, said Kroll. Douglas looked at Kroll. We'll shove through to Jupiter with just our leaky set of radar computators. That's the way it'll have to be. If we're wrecked halfway, well, we're wrecked. But I'll be damned if I go along with the decrepit son of a witch doctor. Nibley's eyes watered. He sucked in on himself. There was a pain round his heart, and he was suddenly chilled. Kroll started to speak, but a gong rattled and banged, and a voice shouted, Stations! Gutters up! Helix! Take off! Take off! Stay here. Kroll snapped it at the old man. He leaped away and down the rungs of the ladder, leaving Nibbly alone in the broad shadow of the bitter-eyed Douglas. Douglas looked him up and down in surly contempt. So you know arcs, parabolas, and orbits as good as my machines, do you? Nibbly nodded, angry now that Kroll was gone. Machines? shrilled Nibbly. Can't do everything. They ain't got no intuition. Can't understand sabotage and hatreds and arguments or people. Machines are too damn slow. Douglas lidded his eyes. You? You're faster? I'm faster, said Nibbly. Douglas flicked his cigarette toward a wall disposal slot. Predict that orbit, Nibbly's eyes jerked. Gonna miss it? The cigarette lay smoldering on the deck. Douglas scowled at the cigarette. Nibbly made wheezy laughter. He minced to a shock hammock, zipped into it. Not bad, not bad, eh? The ship rumbled. Angrily, Douglas snatched up the cigarette, carried it to his own hammock, rolled in, zipped the zipper. Then, deliberately, he flicked the cigarette once more. It flew. Another miss, predicted Nibbly. Douglas was still glaring at the floored cigarette when the rocket burst gravity and shot up into space toward the asteroids. Mars dwindled into the sun. 
Asteroids swept silently down the star tracks, all metal, all invisible, shifting and shifting to harry the rocket. Nibbly sprawled by the great thick visiport, feeling the computators giving him competition under the floor in the level below, predicting meteors and correcting the Terra's course accordingly. Douglas stood behind Nibbly, stiff and quiet. Since he was competent mechanic, Nibbly was his charge. He was to protect Nibbly from harm. Kroll had said so. Douglas didn't like it at all. Nibbly was feeling fine. It was like the old days. It was good. He laughed. He waved at nothing outside the port. Ha there, he called. Meteor, he explained in an aside to Douglas. You see it? Lives at stake and you sit there playing. Nope, not playing, just warming up. I can see him beating like hell all up and down the line, son. God's truth. Kroll's a damned fool, said Douglas. Sure, you had a few lucky breaks in the old days before they built a good computator. A few lucky breaks and you lived off of them. Your day's done. I'm still good. How about the time you swilled a quart of rot gut and almost killed a cargo of civilian tourists? I heard about that. All I have to say is one word and your ears would twitch. Whiskey. At the word, saliva ran alarmingly in Nibley's mouth. He swallowed guiltily. Douglas, snorting, turned and started from the room. Nibley grabbed a monkey wrench on impulse, heaved it. The wrench hit the wall and fell down. Nibley wheezed. Wrench got in orbit like everything. Fair bit of computation I did. One point over and not a flink that crumb. There was silence now as he hobbled back and sat warily to stare into the stars. He felt all of the ship's men around him. Vague, warm electrical stirrings of fear, hope, dismay, exhaustion. All their orbits coming into a parallel trajectory now all living in the same path with him, and the asteroids smashed down with an increasing swiftness. In a very few hours, the main body of missiles would be encountered. Now, as he stared into space, he felt a dark orbit coming into conjunction with his own. It was an unpleasant orbit, one that touched him with fear. It drew closer. It was dark. It was very close now. A moment later, a tall man in a black uniform climbed the rungs from below and stood looking at Nibley. I'm Bruno, he said. He was a nervous fellow and kept looking around, looking around at the walls, the deck, at Nibley. I'm a food specialist on board. How come you're up here? Come down to mess later. Join me in a game of Martian chess. Nibley said, I'd beat the hell out of you. Wouldn't pay. It's against orders for me to be down below anyways. How come? Never you, never mind. Got things to do up here. I notice things. I'm charting a special course in a special way. Even Captain Kroll don't know every reason why I'm making this trip. I got my own personal reasons. I see them coming and going, and I got their orbits picked neat and dandy. Meteors, planets, and men. Why, well, let me tell you. Bruno tensed somewhat forward. His face was a little too interested. Nibbly didn't like the feel of the man. He was off trajectory. He smelled funny. He felt funny. Nibley shut up. Nice day, he said. Go, go ahead, said Bruno. You were saying. Douglas stepped up the rungs. Bruno cut it short, saluted Douglas, and left. Douglas watched him go coldly. What Bruno want, he asked of the old man. Captain's orders, you're to see nobody. Nibley's wrinkles made a smile. Watch that guy, Bruno. I got his orbit fixed all around and arced. I see him going now, and I see him reaching a Aphelion, and I see him coming back. Douglas pulled his lip. You think Bruno might be working for the Martian industrial clique? If I thought he had anything to do with stopping us from getting to the Jovian colony. He'll be back, said Nibley, just before we reach the heavy asteroid belt. Wait and see. The ship swerved. The computators had just dodged a meteor. Douglas smiled. That griped Nibley. The machines were stealing his feathers. Nibley paused and closed his eyes. Here come two more meteors. I beat the machine this time. They waited. The ship swerved. Twice. Damn it, said Douglas. Two hours passed. It got lonely upstairs, said Nibley apologetically. Captain Kroll glanced nervously up from the mess table where he and twelve other men sat. William, Simpson, Haynes, Bruno, McClure, Lieber, and the rest. All were eating, but not hungry. They all looked a little sick. The ship was swerving again and again, steadily, steadily, back and forth. In a short interval, the heavy belt would be touched. Then there would be a real sickness. 
Okay, said Kroll to Nibley. You can eat with us, this once, and only this once. Remember that. Nibley ate like a starved weasel. Bruno looked over at him again and again and finally asked, How about that chess game? Nope, I always win. Don't want to brag, but I was the best outfielder playing baseball when I was at school. Never struck out at bat, neither. Damn good. Bruno cut a piece of meat. What's your business now, Gramps? Finding out where things is going, evaded Nibley. Curl snapped his gaze at Nibley. The old man hurried on. Well, I know where the whole blame universe is heading. Everybody looked up from their eating. But you wouldn't believe me if I told you, laughed the old man. Somebody whistled. Others chuckled. Kroll relaxed. Bruno scowled. Nibley continued. It's a feeling. You can't describe stars to a blind man or God to anybody. Why, hell's bells, lads. If I wanted, I could write a formula on paper, and if you worked it out in your mind, you'd drop dead a symbol poison. Again, laughter. A bit of wine was poured all around as a bracer for the hours ahead. Nibley eyed the forbidden stuff and got up. Well, I got to go. Have some wine, said Bruno. No, thanks, said Nibley. Go ahead, have some, said Bruno. I don't like it, said Nibley, wetting his lips. That's a laugh, said Bruno, eyeing him. I gotta go upstairs. Nice to have ate with you boys. See you later after we get through the swarms. Faces became wooden at the mention of the approaching belt. Fingers tightened against the table edge. Nibley spidered back up the rungs to his little room alone. An hour later, Nibley was drunk as a chromium-plated pirate. He kept it a secret. He hid the wine bottle in his shock hammock, groggily. Stroke of luck. Oh, yes, oh, yes, a stroke. A stroke of luck. Yes, yes, yes. Finding that lovely, fine, wonderful wine in the storage cabinet near the visiport? <laughs> Why, yes. And since he'd been thirsty for so long, so long, so long. Well, gurgle, gurgle. Nibley was drunk. He swayed before the visiport drunkenly deciding the trajectories of a thousand invisible nothings. Then he began to argue with himself, drowsily as he always argued when wine webs were being spun through a skull by red drowsy spiders. His heart beat dully, his little sharp eyes flickered with sudden flights of anger. "'You're some liar, Mr. Nibley,' he told himself. "'You point at meteors, but who's to prove you right or wrong? Right or wrong, eh? You sit up here and wait and wait and wait.' Those machines down below spoil it. You never have a chance to prove your ability. No, Captain won't use you. He won't need you. None of those men believe in you. Think you're a liar. Laugh at you. Yes, laugh. Yes, they'll call you an old, old liar. Nibley's thin nostrils quivered. His thin, wrinkled face was crimsoned and wild. He staggered to his feet, got hold of his favorite monkey wrench, and waved it slowly back and forth. For a moment, his heart almost stopped in him. In a panic, he clutched at his chest, pushing, pulling, pumping at his heart to keep it running. The wine. The excitement. He dropped the wrench. No, not yet. He looked down at his chest, wildly tearing at it. Not just yet. Oh, please, he cried. Not until I show them. His heart went on beating, drunkenly, slowly. He bent, retrieved the wrench, and laughed numbly. I'll show them, <laughs> he cried, weaving across the deck. Show them how good I am. Eliminate competition. I'll run the ship myself. He climbed slowly down the rungs to destroy the machines. It made a lot of noise. Nibley heard a shout. Get him! His hand went down again, again. There was a scream of whistles, a jarring of flung metal, a minor explosion. His hand went down again, the wrench in it. He felt himself cursing and pounding away. Something shattered. Men ran towards him. This was the computator. He hit upon it once more. Yes! Then he was caught up like an empty sack, smashed in the face by someone's fist, thrown to the deck. Cut acceleration! A voice cried far away. The ship slowed. Somebody kicked Nibley in the face. Blackness. Dark. Around and around, down into darkness. When he opened his eyes again, people were talking. We're turning back! The hell we are. Kroll says we'll go on anyway. That's suicide. We can't hit that asteroid belt without radar! Nibley looked up from the floor. Kroll was there, over him, looking down at the old man. I might have known, he said over and over again. He wavered in Nibley's sobering vision. The ship hung motionless, silent. Through the ports, Nibley saw they were based on the sunward side of a large planetoid, waiting, shielded from most of the asteroid particles. Um, sorry, said Nibley. 
He's sorry, Kroll swore. The very man we bring along as relief computator sabotages our machine. Hell. Bruno was in the room. Nibley saw Bruno's eyes dilate at Kroll's exclamation. Bruno knew now. Nibley tried to get up. We'll get through the swarm anyway. I'll take you through. That's why I broke that blasted contraption. I don't like competition. I can clear a path through them asteroids big enough to lug Luna through on track five. Who gave you the wine? I found it. I just found it, that's all. The crew hated him with their eyes. He felt their hatred like so many meteors coming in and striking at him. They hated his shriveled, wrinkled old man guts. They stood around and waited for Kroll to let them kick him apart with their boots. Kroll walked around the old man in a circle. You think I'd chance you getting us through the belt? He snorted. What if we got halfway through and you got potted again? He stopped with his back to Nibley. He was thinking. He kept looking over his shoulder at the old man. I can't trust you. He looked out the port at the stars. At where Jupiter shone in space. And yet... He looked at the men. Do you want to turn back? Nobody moved. They didn't have an answer. They didn't want to go back. They wanted to go ahead. We'll keep on going then, said Kroll. Bruno spoke. We crew members should have some say. I say go back. We can't make it. We're just wasting our lives. Kroll glanced at him, coolly. You seem to be alone. He went back to the port. He rocked on his heels. It was no accident Nibley got that wine. Somebody planted it, knowing Nibley's weakness. Somebody who was paid off by the Martian industrials to keep this ship from going through. This was a clever setup. The machines were smashed in such a way as to throw suspicion directly on an innocent, well, almost innocent party. Nibley was just a tool. I'd like to know who handled that tool. Nibley got up, the wrench in his gnarled hand. I'll tell you who planted that wine. I've been thinking, and now... Darkness. A short circuit. Feet running on the metal deck. A shout. A thread of fire across the darkness. Then a whistling as something flew, hit. Someone grunted. The lights came on again. Nibley was at the light control. On the floor, gun in hand, eyes beginning to numb, lay Bruno. He lifted the gun, fired it. The bullet hit Nibley in the stomach. Nibley grabbed at the pain. Kroll kicked at Bruno's head. Bruno's head snapped back. He lay quietly. The blood pulsed out between Nibley's fingers. He watched it with interest, grinning with pain. I knew his orbit, he whispered, sitting down cross-legged on the deck. When the lights went out, I chose my own orbit back to the light switch. I knew where Bruno'd be in the dark. Having a wrench handy, I let fly, choosing my arc, naturally. Guess he's got a hard skull, though. They carried Nibley to a bunk. Douglas stood over him dimly growing older every second. Nibley squinted up. All the men tightened in upon it. Nibley felt their dismay, their dread, their worry, their nervous anger. Finally, Kroll exhaled. Turn the ship around, he said. Go back to Mars. The crew stood with their limp hands at their sides. They were tired. They didn't want to live anymore. They just stood with their feet on the deck. Then, one by one, they began to walk away like so many cold, dead men. Hold on, cried Nibley, weakening. I ain't through yet. I got two orbits to fix. I got one to lay out for this ship to Jupiter. And I gotta finish out my own separate, secret, personal orbit. You ain't turning back nowhere. Kroll grimaced. Might as well realize it, Grandpa. It takes seven hours to get through the swarms, and you haven't another two hours in you. The old man laughed. Think I don't know that? Hell, who's supposed to know all these things, me or you? You, Pop. Well then, damn it, bring me a bulger. Now look, you heard me by God, a bulger. Why? You ever hear of a thing called triangulation? Well, maybe I won't live long enough to go with you, but by all the sizes and shapes of behemoths, the ship is jumping through to Jupiter. Kroll looked at him. There was a breathing silence, a heart-beating silence in the ship. Kroll sucked in his breath, hesitated, then smiled a gray smile. You heard him, Douglas. Get him a bulger. And get a stretcher, and tote this ninety pounds of bone out on the biggest asteroid around here. Got that? You heard him, Haynes. A stretcher. Stand by for maneuvering. 
Kroll sat down by the old man. What's it all about, Pop? You're sober? Clear as a bell. What are you going to do? Redeem myself of my sins, by George. Now get your ugly face away so I can think. And tell them bucks to hurry. Kroll bellowed and men rushed. They brought a space suit, inserted the ninety pounds of shrill and wheeze and weakness into it. The doctor had finished with his probings and fixings, buckled, zipped, and welded him into it. All the while they worked, nibbly talked. Remember when I was a kid? Stood up to that there plate, pounding out baseballs north-south and six ways from Sundays. He chuckled. We used to hit them and predict which window and what house they'd break. Wheezy laughter. One day I said to my dad, Hey, Dad, a meteor just fell on Simpson's garage over in Jonesville. Jonesville's six miles from here, said my father, shaking his finger at me. You quit your line, nibbly boy, or I'll trot you out to the woodshed. Save your strength, said Kroll. That's all right, said Nibbly. You know, the funny thing was always that I lied like hell, and everybody said I lied like hell. But come to find out later, I wasn't lying at all. It was the truth. I just sensed things. The ship maneuvered down on a windless, empty planetoid. Nibbly was carried on a stretcher out onto alien rock. Lay me down right here. Prop up my head so I can see Jupiter and the whole damned asteroid belt. Be sure my headphones are tuned neat. There, now give me a piece of paper. Nibbly scribbled a long, weak snake of writing on paper, folded it. When Bruno comes to, give him this. Maybe he'll believe me when he reads it. Personal. Don't pry into it yourself. The old man sank back, feeling pain drilling through his stomach, and a kind of sad happiness. Somebody was singing somewhere. He didn't know where. Maybe it was only the stars moving on the sky. Well, he said clearly, guess this is it, children. Now get the hell aboard. Leave me alone to think. This is going to be the biggest, hardest, damnedest job of computating I ever latched on to. There will be orbits and cross orbits, big balls of fire and little bitty specules, and by God, I'll chart them all. I'll chart a hundred thousand of the damn monsters and their offspring. You just wait and see. Get aboard. I'll tell you what to do from there on. Douglas looked doubtful. Nibbly caught the look. Whatever happens, he cried, will be worth it, won't it? It's better than turning back to Mars, ain't it? Well, ain't it? It's better, said Douglas. They shook hands. Now, all of you, get... Nibbly watched the ship fire away, and his eyes saw it in the asteroid swarm in that brilliant point of light that was massive Jupiter. He could almost feel the hunger and want and waiting up there in that star flame. He looked out into space, and his eyes widened, and space came in, opened out like a flower, and already natural as water flowing. Nibbly's mind, tired as it was, began to shiver out calculations. He started talking. Captain, take the ship straight out now. You hear? Fine, answered the captain. Look at your dials. Looking. If number seven reads 13287, okay? Keep her there. If she varies a point, counteract it on dial 20 to 5690. Keep her hard over 70,000 miles. All that is clear so far. Then, after that, a sharp veer in the number two direction, over a thousand miles. There's a big sweep of meteors coming in on that other path for you to dodge. Let me see, let me see, he figured. Keep your speed at a constant of 100,000 miles. At that rate, check your clocks and watches. In exactly an hour, you'll hit the second part of the big belt. Then... Switch to a course roughly 5,000 miles over to number three direction. Veer again five minutes on the dot later, and... Can you see all those asteroids, Nibbly? Are you sure? Sure, lots of them. Every single one going every which way. Keep straight ahead until two hours from now, after that last direction of mine. Then slide off at an angle toward Jupiter. Slow down to 90,000 for ten minutes, then up to 100, 10,000 for... Fifteen minutes. After that, one hundred fifty thousand all the way. Flame poured out of the rocket jets. It moved swiftly away, growing small and distant. Give me a read on dial sixty-seven. Four. Make it six, and set your automatic pilot to sixty-one and fourteen and thirty-five. Now, everything's okay. Keep your chronometer reading this way. Seven, nine, twelve. There'll be a few tight scrapes, but you'll hit Jupiter square on in 24 hours. If you jump your speed to 700,000 six hours from now and hold it that way. 
Square on it is, Mr. Nibley. Nibley just lay there a moment. His voice was easy and not so high and shrill anymore. And on the way back to Mars, later, don't try to find me. I'm going out in the dark on this metal rock. Nothing but dark for me. Back to Perihelion and Sun for you. No. Know where I'm going? Where? Centaurus, Nibley laughed. So help me God, I am. No lie. He watched the ship going out then, and he felt the compact, collected trajectories of all the men in it. It was a good feeling to know that he was the guiding theme, like in the old days. Douglas's voice broke in again. Hey, Pop! Pop, you still there? A little silence. Nibley felt blood pulsing down inside his suit. Yep, he said. We just gave Bruno your little note to read. Whatever it was, when he finished reading it, he went insane. Nibley said, quiet like, Burn that there paper. Don't let anybody else read it. A pause. It's burnt. What was it? Don't be inquisitive, snapped the old man. Maybe I proved to Bruno that he didn't really exist. To hell with it. The rocket reached its constant speed. Douglas radioed back. All's well. Sweet calculating, Pop. I'll tell the rocket officials back at Marsport. They'll be glad to know about you. Sweet, sweet calculating. Thanks. How goes it? I said. How goes it? Hey, Pop. Pop? Nibley raised a trembling hand and waved it at nothing. The ship was gone. He couldn't even see the jet wash now. He could only feel that hard metal movement out there among the stars, going on and on through a course he had set for it. He couldn't speak. There was just emotion in him. He had finally, by God, heard a compliment from a mechanic of radar computators. He waved his hand at nothing. He watched nothing moving on and on into the crossed orbits of other invisible nothings. The silence was now complete. He put his hand down. Now he had only to chart that one last personal orbit, the one he had wanted to finish only in space and not grounded back on Mars. It didn't take lightning calculation to set it out for certain. Life and death were the parabolic ends to his trajectory. The long life, first swinging in from darkness, arcing to the inevitable perihelion, and now moving back out, out and away, into the soft, encompassing dark. By God, he thought weakly, quietly, right up to the last, my reputation's good. Never fluked a calculation yet, and I never will. He didn't. End of Jonah of the Jove Run by Ray Bradbury Know Thy Neighbor by Elizabeth R. Lewis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winifred Asman Know Thy Neighbor by Elizabeth R. Lewis It began with a dead cat on the fire escape and ended with the green monster in the incinerator chute. But still, it wouldn't be quite fair to blame it all on the neighborhood. The apartment house was in the heart of the district that is known as the Tenderloin, that section of San Francisco from Ellis to Market, and east from Leavenworth to Mason Street, not the best section. To Ellen's mind, it was an unsavory neighborhood, but with apartments so hard to get, and this one only $38 a month, and in a regular apartment building with an elevator and all. Well, as she often told the girls at the office, you can't be too particular these days. Nevertheless, it was an ordeal to walk up the two blocks from Market Street, particularly at night, when the noise of jukeboxes dinned from the garish bars, when the sidewalks spilled over with soldiers and sailors, with peroxided, blousy-looking women, and the furtive gamblers who haunted the back rooms of the innocent-appearing cigar stores that lined the street. She walked very fast then, never looking to left or right, and her heart would pound when a passing male whistled. But once inside the apartment house lobby, she relaxed. In spite of its location, the place seemed very respectable. She seldom met anyone in the lobby or the elevator, and except on rare occasions like last night, the halls were as silent as those in the swanky apartment houses on Knob Hill. 
She knew by sight only two of her neighbors, the short, stocky young man who lived in 410, and Mrs. Moffat in 404. Mrs. Moffat was the essence of lavender and old lace, and the young man, he was all right, really. You couldn't honestly say he was shady-looking. On this particular morning, the man from 410 was waiting for the elevator when Ellen came out to get her paper. He glanced up at the sound of the door and stared. Quickly, she shut the door again. She didn't like the way he looked at her. She was wearing a housecoat over her nightgown and a scarf wrapped around her head to cover the bobby pins, a costume as unrevealing as a nun's. But she felt as though he had invaded her privacy with his stare, like surprising her in the bathtub. She waited until she heard the elevator start down before opening her door again. The boy must have aimed from the stairs. Her paper was several yards down the hall, almost in front of 404. She went down to get it. Mrs. Moffat must have heard Ellen's footsteps in the hall. An old lady with a small income, from her late husband as she had explained to Ellen, and little to do, she was intensely interested in her neighbors. She opened the door of her apartment and peered out. Her thin white hair was done up in tight kid curlers. With her round, faded blue eyes and round, wrinkled apple cheeks, she looked like an inquisitive, aged baby. "'Good morning,' said Ellen pleasantly. "'Good morning, my dear,' the old lady answered. "'You're up early for a Saturday.' "'Well, I thought I might as well get up and start my house cleaning. I didn't sleep a wink after four o'clock this morning, anyway.' Did you hear all that racket in the hall? Why, no, I didn't. The old lady sounded disappointed. I don't see how I missed it. I guess because I went to bed so late. My nephews, you've seen them, haven't you? They're such nice boys. They took me to a movie last night. Well, I'm surprised you didn't hear it, said Ellen. Thumping and scratching like somebody was dragging a rake along the floor. I just couldn't get back to sleep. The old lady clicked her tongue. I'll bet somebody came home drunk. Isn't that terrible? I wonder who it was. I don't know, said Ellen, but it was certainly a disgrace. I was going to call Mrs. Anderson. With the door open, the hall seemed filled with the very odd odor of Mrs. Moffat's apartment. Not really unpleasant, but musty with the smell of antiques. The apartment itself was like a museum. Ellen had been inside once when the old lady invited her in for a cup of tea. Its two rooms were crammed with a bizarre assortment of furniture, bric-a-brac, and souvenirs. "'Oh, how's your bird this morning?' Ellen asked. In addition to being a collector, Mrs. Moffat was an animal fancier. She owned three cats, a pair of lovebirds, goldfish, and even a cage of white mice. One of the lovebirds, she had informed Ellen yesterday, was ailing. Oh, Buzzy's much better today, she beamed. The doctor told me to feed him whiskey every three hours, with an eyedropper, you know, and you'd be surprised how it helped the little fellow. He even ate some bird seed this morning. I'm so glad, said Ellen. She picked up her paper and smiled at Mrs. Moffat. I'll see you later. The old woman closed her door, shutting off the musty smell, and Ellen walked back to her own apartment. She filled the coffee pot with water and four tablespoons of coffee, then dressed herself while the coffee percolated. Standing in front of the medicine cabinet mirror, she took the bobby pins out of her hair. Her reflection looked back at her from the mirror, and she felt that unaccountable depression again. I'm not bad-looking, she thought, and young and not too dumb. What have other women got that I haven't? She thought of the days and years passing, the meals all alone, and nothing ever happening. That kind of thinking gets you nowhere. Forget it. She combed her hair back, pinned it securely behind her ears, ran a lipstick over her mouth. Then she went into the kitchenette, turned off the gas flame under the coffee pot, and raised the window shade to let in the sun that was just beginning to show through morning fog. A dead cat lay on the fire escape under the window. She stared at it, feeling sick to her stomach. It was an ordinary grey cat, the kind you see in every alley, but its head was twisted back so that its open eyes and open mouth leered at her. She pulled the blind down fast. Sit down, light a cigarette. It's nothing, just a dead cat, that's all. But how did it get on the fire escape? 
fell, maybe, from the roof? And how did it get on the roof? Besides, I thought cats never got hurt falling. Isn't there something about landing on your feet like a cat? Maybe that's just a legend like the nonsense about nine lives. Oh, what do I do, she thought. I can't sit here and drink coffee with that under the window. And God knows I can't take it away myself. She shuddered at the thought. Call the manager. She got up and went to the telephone in the foyer. She found the number scribbled on the back of the phone book. Her hand was shaking when she dialed. This is Ellen Tiege in 402. Mrs. Anderson, there's a dead cat on the fire escape outside my window. You'll have to do something about it. Mrs. Anderson sounded half asleep. What do you mean, a dead cat? Are you sure it's dead? Maybe it's sleeping. Of course I'm sure it's dead. Can't you send Pete up to take it away? It's a horrible thing to have under my window. All right, I'll tell Pete to go up. He's washing down the lobby now. As soon as he's finished, I'll send him up. Ellen set the phone back on its stand. She felt a little silly. What a fuss to make over a dead cat. But really, outside one's window, and before breakfast, who could blame me? She went back into the kitchenette, carefully not looking toward the window, even though the shade was drawn, and poured herself a cup of coffee. Then she sat at the table in the little nook, drinking coffee, smoking a cigarette, and leafing through the paper. The front page was all about a flying saucer scare in Marin County. She read the headline, then thumbed on through the paper, stopping to read the movie reviews and the comic page. At the back section, she was attracted by a headline that read, Liquor strong these days, customer turns green, says bartender. It was a brief item, consciously cute. John Martin, 38, a bartender of 152 Mason Street, was arrested early this morning, charged with drunkenness and disturbing the peace, after firing several shots from a 38 revolver on the sidewalk in front of his address. No one was injured. Martin's defense, according to police records, was that he was attempting to apprehend a pale green, claw-handed customer who fled after eating a live mouse and threatening Martin. Upon questioning, Martin admitted that the unidentified customer had been in the bar for several hours and appeared perfectly normal. But he insisted, When I refused to serve him, after he ate the mouse, he turned green and threatened to claw me to death. Martin has a permit to carry the gun and was dismissed with a $50 fine and a warning by Judge Greeley against sampling his own stock too freely. Drunken fool, thought Ellen. With fresh indignation, she remembered the disturbance in her own hall this morning. Nothing but drunks and gangsters in this neighborhood. She thought vaguely of looking at the for rent section of the want ads. There was a noise on the fire escape. Ellen reached over and lifted up the shade. The janitor was standing there with a big paper sack in his hand. Ellen opened the window and asked, How do you think it got there, Pete? I don't know. Maybe fall off of the roof. Must have been in a fight. What makes you think so? Neck's all torn. Big teeth marks. Maybe dog get him. Up here? Somebody fine. Maybe throw here. I don't know. Pete scratched his head. You don't worry any more, though. I take away now. No smell, even. He grinned at her and scuttled to the other end of the fire escape where he climbed through the window to the fourth-floor corridor. Ellen poured herself a second cup of coffee and lighted another cigarette, then turned to the woman's page in the paper. She read the advice column and the psychology and glanced through the help-wanted women in the classifieds. That finished the morning's reading. She looked at her watch, almost ten. She carried her coffee cup to the sink, rinsed it out, and set it on the drain board. There was still a cup or more coffee left in the pot. That could be warmed over later, but she took out the filter and dumped the grounds into the paper bag that held garbage. The bag was almost full. I'll throw it in the incinerator now, she thought, before I straightened the apartment. She emptied the ashtrays, the one beside her bed, and the other on the breakfast table, then started down the hall with the garbage bag in her hand. The incinerator chute was at the rear of the hall, next to the service stairs. Ellen could see the door standing slightly open. She hesitated. 410 might be there. It was bad enough to ride in the elevator with him, feeling his eyes on her, 
but there was something unbearably intimate about standing beside him emptying garbage. The door seemed to move a little, but nobody came out. She waited another minute. Oh, well, maybe the last person out there just forgot to shut the door tight. She opened it wider, stepped out on the stair landing. No one was there. The chute was wide, almost three feet around. Ellen opened the top and started to throw the bag down. Something was stuck in there. Her eyes saw it, but her brain refused to believe. What was there, blocking the chute, looked like, looked like, a chicken's foot, gnarled, clawed, but as large as a human foot, and an ugly, sickly green. Automatically, she reached in and clutched it. Her stomach turned at the cold feel of the thing, but still she tugged at it, trying to work it loose. It was heavy. She pulled with all her strength, felt it start to slide back up the chute. Then it was free. She gaped in sick horror at the thing she held. Her hand opened weakly, and she sat down on the floor, her head swimming and her throat muscles retching. Dimly, she heard the thing rattle and bump down to the incinerator in the basement. The full horror of it gradually hit home. Ellen stood up, swaying, and ran blindly down the hall. Her feet thudded on the carpeted floor. As she passed 404, she was vaguely conscious of Mrs. Moffat's concerned face poking around the door. Is there something wrong, Miss Tige? No, Ellen managed to gasp. It, it's all right, really, all right. She kept on running, burst through the apartment door, slammed it behind her, fell on her knees in the bathroom, and became thoroughly, violently ill. She continued to kneel, unable to think, her head against the cool porcelain bowl. Finally, she stood up weakly, ran cold water, washed her face and streaming eyes. Thank God the wall bed was still down. She fell on it, shaking. What was that unbelievable, ghastly, impossible thing? It was the size of a man, but thin, skeleton thin, and the color of brackish water. It had two legs, two arms, like a man, but ending with those huge, bird-like claws. Heaven alone knew what its face was like. She had let go before it was that far clear of the chute. She thought of the story in the paper. So that was what the bartender saw. He wasn't drunk at all. And what happened when he told the police? They laughed at him. They'd laugh at me, too, she thought. The proof is gone, burned up in the incinerator. Why did this happen to me? Dead cats on the fire escape? Dead monsters in the incinerator shoot? It's this terrible neighborhood. She tried to think coherently. Maybe the cat had something to do with it. The bartender said the thing ate a mouse. Maybe it had tried to eat the cat, too. A monster like that might eat anything. Her stomach started churning again at the thought. But what was it doing in the incinerator chute? Someone in the building must have put it there, thinking it would slide all the way down and be burned up. Who? One of them, probably. But there couldn't be any more green monsters around. They can't live in an apartment house, walk the streets like anyone else, not even in this neighborhood. She remembered something else in the bartender's story. He said it looked perfectly normal at first. That meant they could look like humans if they wanted to. Hypnotism? Then any man could be... Suddenly another thought struck her. Supposing they find out I saw. What will they do to me? She jumped up from the bed, white with fear, her faintness forgotten in the urge to escape. She snatched her bag from the dresser, threw on her brown coat. At the door, she hesitated, afraid to venture into the hall, yet afraid to stay inside. Finally, she eased open the door, peered out into the corridor. It was deserted. She ran to the elevator, punched the bell, heard the car begin its creaky, protesting ascent. The elevator door had an automatic spring closing. The first time she tried it, her hands shook and the door sprang closed before she got in. She tried it again. This time she managed to hold it open long enough to get inside. She pushed the button, felt the elevator shake and grind and move slowly down, out into the lobby, out into the street. 
The fog was completely gone now. The sun shone on the still damp street. There were very few people around. The tenderloin sleeps late. She went into the restaurant next door, sat down at the white-tiled counter. She was the only customer. A sleepy-eyed waitress, her black hair untidily caught into a net, waited, pad in hand. Just coffee, Ellen mumbled. She drank it black, and it scalded her throat going down. The waitress put a nickel in the jukebox, and then Bing Crosby was singing Easter Parade. Everything was so normal. Listening to Bing Crosby, how could you believe in things like green monsters? In this sane, prosaic atmosphere, Ellen thought, I must be batty. She said to herself, I'm Ellen Tiege, bookkeeper, and I just saw the body of a green man with claws on his feet. No, that didn't help a bit. Put it this way, I'm Ellen Tiege, and I'm 27 years old, and I'm not married. Let's face it, any psychiatrist will tell you that's enough cause for neurosis, so I'm having delusions. It made more sense that way. I read that story in the paper, Ellen thought, and it must have registered way down in my subconscious. That had to be it. Any other way, it was too horrible, too impossible to be born. I'll go back to the apartment and call Dr. Clive, thought Ellen. She had the feeling, no doubt held over from the days of measles and mumps, that a doctor could cure anything, even green monsters on the brain. She drank the last of the coffee and fished in her coin purse for change. Picking up the check, she walked over to the cash register at the end of the counter facing the street. The untidy waitress came from the back of the restaurant to take the money. Ellen looked out at the street through the glass front. The man from 410 was standing out there, smoking a cigarette, watching her. When their eyes met, he abruptly threw away the cigarette and started walking toward the apartment house. Again, she felt that faint dread she had experienced in the hall earlier. The waitress picked up her quarter, gave her back a nickel and a dime. Ellen put the change into her purse, got out her keychain, and held it in her hand while she walked quickly next door. 410 was just ahead of her in the lobby. He held the front door open for her. She kept her head down, not looking at his face, and they walked, Indian file, across the lobby to the elevator. He opened the elevator doors, too, and she stepped in ahead of him. When the doors clanged shut, she had a feeling of panic. Alone with him, cut off from help. He didn't pretend not to know her floor, but silently pressed the proper button. While the car moved slowly upward, her heart was beating wildly. I'm not convinced, she thought. I'm not convinced. I saw it so plainly. I felt it, cold in my hands. The elevator stopped. The man held the door open, and for a moment she thought he was going to say something. His free hand made a swift, involuntary movement, as though he were going to catch her arm. She shrank away, but he stepped back and let her through. Ellen almost ran down the hall. Behind her, she heard his footsteps going in the opposite direction, toward his apartment. She was panting when she reached her door. She fumbled for the right key, front door, office, and then she froze. There was a scratching sound in the apartment. She put her ear close to the door, listened. There was a rasping noise like somebody dragging a rake, or like claws, great heavy claws moving over the hardwood floors. Ellen backed away from the door. It was true, then. She retreated, inch by inch, silently. Get away, leave before it catches you. She turned, ready to make a dash for the elevator, and faced the man from 410. Down at the end of the hall, in front of his apartment, he was watching her. The way he lingered outside the restaurant, the way he looked at her. One of them! Maybe underneath that homely, ordinary face, his skin was green and clammy. Maybe there were long, sharp claws on his feet. She was breathing unevenly now. Trapped! The thing in the apartment? The man in the hall? Her eyes darted to the elevator, then back, down the hall, past the door marked 404. The door marked 404. She covered the few yards in a mad dash, flung herself at the door, pounding wildly. Please, please, she sobbed. Mrs. Moffat, open, please. The door opened at once. 
Mrs. Moffat's round, wrinkled face beamed at her. Come in, my dear, come in. She almost fell over the landing. The door closed behind her. She stumbled to the Davenport, sank down, gasping. Two cats rubbed against her legs, purring. Two cats? She heard herself say stupidly, Mrs. Moffat, where's the other cat? And wondered why she said it. Then she understood. The old lady's face quivered, altered, melted into something, something green. Outside in the hall, the man from 410 slowly returned to his apartment. Pushing open the door, he thought, I'll never get the nerve to ask her out. Well, probably wasn't a chance anyhow. What would a girl like her have to do with a lousy cop like me? End of Know Thy Neighbor by Elizabeth R. Lewis Mars Confidential by Howard Brown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker Mars Confidential by Howard Brown Psst! Here we go again. Confidential. We turn New York inside out. We turn Chicago upside down. In Washington, we turn the insiders out and the outsiders in. The howls can still be heard since we dissected the USA. But Mars was our toughest task of spectroscoping. The cab drivers spoke a different language and the bellhops couldn't read our currency. Yet, we think we have x-rayed the dizziest, and this may amaze you, the dirtiest planet in the solar system. Beside it, the Earth is as white as the moon, and Chicago is as peaceful as the Milky Way. By the time we went through Mars, its canals, its caves, its satellite, and its catacombs, we knew more about it than anyone who lives there. We make no attempt to be comprehensive. We have no hope or aim to make Mars a better place in which to live. In fact, we don't give a damn what kind of place it is to live in. This will be the story of a planet that could have been another proud and majestic sun with a solar system of its own. It ended up instead in the comic books and the pulp magazines. We give you Mars Confidential. 1. The Lowdown Confidential Before the spaceship which brings the arriving traveler lands at the Martian National Airport, it swoops gracefully over the nearby city in a salute. The narrow ribbons, laid out in geometric order, gradually grow wider until the water in these man-made rivers become crystal clear and sparkles in the reflection of the sun. As Mars comes closer, the visitor from Earth quickly realizes it has a manner and a glamour of its own. It is unworldly. It is out of this world. It is not the air of distinction one finds in New York or London or Paris. The Martian feeling is dreamlike. It comes from being close to the stuff dreams are made of. However, after the sojourner lands, he discovers that Mars is not much different than the planet he left. Indeed, men are pretty much the same all over the universe, whether they carry their plumbing inside or outside their bodies. As we unfold the rates of crime, vice, sex irregularities, graft, cheap gambling, drunkenness, rowdyism, and rackets, you will get thrown on a large screen a peep show you never saw on your TV during the science fiction hour. Each day the Earth man spins on Mars makes him feel more at home. Thus it comes as no surprise to the initiated that even here, at least 35 million miles away from Times Square, there are hoodlums who talk out of the sides of their mouths and drive expensive convertibles with white-walled tires and yellow-haired frails. For the Mafia, the dread Black Hand is in business here, tied up with the subversives, and neither the Martian Committee for the Investigation of Crime and Vice nor the Un-Martian Activities Committee can dent it more than the Kefauver Committee did on Earth, which is practically less than nothing. This is the first time this story has been printed. We were offered four trillion dollars in bribes to hold it up. Our lives were threatened, and we were shot at with death ray guns. We got this one night on the fourth bench in Central Park, where we met by appointment a man who phoned us earlier but refused to tell his name. When we took one look at him, we did not ask for his credentials. We just knew he came from Mars. This is what he told us. Shortly after the end of World War II, a syndicate composed of underworld big shots from Chicago, Detroit, and Greenpoint planned to build a new Las Vegas in the Nevada desert. This was to be a plush project for big spenders, with Vegas and Reno reserved for the hoi polloi. There was to be service by a private airline. It would be so ultra, ultra that suckers with only a million would be thumbed away and guys with two million would have to come in through the back door. 
The Mafia sent a couple of front men to explore the desert. Somewhere out beyond the Atom Project, they stumbled on what seemed to be the answer to their prayer. It was a huge mausoleum-like structure, standing alone in the desert hundreds of miles from nowhere, unique, exclusive, and mysterious. The prospectors assumed it was the last remnant of some fabulous and long-dead ghost mining town. The entire population consisted of one, a little duffer with a white goatee and thick-lensed spectacles wearing boots, chaps, and a silk hat. "'This your place, bud?' one of the hoods asked. When he signified it was, the boys bought it. The price was agreeable, after they pulled a wicked-looking rod. Then the money guys came to look over their purchase. They couldn't make head or tail of it, and you can hardly blame them because inside the great structure they found a huge contraption that looked like a cigar, Havana Perfecto, standing on end. "'What the hell is this?' they asked the character in the opera hat, in what is known as a menacing tone. The old pappy guy offered to show them. He escorted them into the cigar, pressed a button here and there, and before you could say Al Capone, the roof of the shed slid back and they began to move upward at a terrific rate of speed. Three or four of the Mafia chieftains were old hopheads and felt at home. In fact, one of them remarked, Boy, are we gone. And he was right. The soberer Mafistas, after recovering from their first shock, laid ungentle fists on their conductor. What goes on? he was asked. This is a spaceship, and we are headed for Mars. What's Mars? A planet up in space, loaded with gold and diamonds. Any bims there? I beg your pardon, sir, what are bims? Get a load of this dope, he never heard of bims. Babes, broads, frails, pigeons, ribs. Catch on? Oh, I assume you mean girls. There must be, otherwise, what are the diamonds for? The outward trip took a week, but it was spent pleasantly. During that time, the Miami delegation cleaned out Chicago, New York, and Pittsburgh in a clobbyosh game. The hop back, for various reasons, took a little longer. One reason may have been the condition of the crew. On the return, the boys from Brooklyn were primed to the ears with Zorkel. Zorkel is a Martian medicinal distillation made from the milk of the Schnugel, a six-legged cow, seldom milked because few Martians can run fast enough to catch one. Zorkel is strong enough to rip steel plates out of battleships, but to stomachs accustomed to the stuff sold in Flatbush, it acted like a gentle stimulant. Upon their safe landing in Nevada, the Columbuses of this first flight to Mars put in long-distance calls to all the other important hoods in the country. The crime cartel met in Cleveland, in the third floor front of a tenement on Mayfield Road. The purpose of the meeting was to cut up Mars. Considerable dissension arose over the bookmaking facilities when it was learned that the radioactive surface of the planet made it unnecessary to send scratches and results by wire. On the contrary, the steel-shod hooves of the animals set up a current which carried into every pool room, without a payoff to the wire service. The final division found the apportionment as follows. New York mob, real estate and investments, if any. Chicago mob, bookmaking and liquor, if any. Brooklyn mob, protection and assassinations. Jersey mob, numbers, if any, and craps, if any. Los Angeles mob, girls, if any. Galveston and New Orleans mobs, dope, if any. Cleveland mob, casinos, if any. Detroit mob, summer resorts, if any. The Detroit boys incidentally burned up when they learned the Martian year is twice as long as ours. Consequently, it takes two years for one summer to roll around. After the summary demise of three grand counselors whose deaths were recorded by the press as occurring from natural causes, the other major and minor mobs were declared in as partners. The first problem to be ironed out was how to speed up transportation, and failing that to construct spacious spaceships, which would attract pleasure-bent trade from Terra, Earth to you, with such innovations as roulette wheels, steam rooms, cocktail lounges, double rooms with hot and cold babes, and other such inducements. 2. The Inside Stuff Confidential Remember you got this first from Leighton Mortimer, and we defy anyone to call us liars, and prove it. Only chumps bring babes with them to Mars, the temperature is a little colder there than on Earth, and the air is a little thinner. So, Terra Dames complain one mink coat doesn't keep them warm. They need two. On the other hand, the gravity is considerably less than on Earth. Therefore, even the heaviest BIM weighs less and can be pushed over with greatest of ease. However, the boys soon discovered that the lighter gravity played havoc with the marijuana trade. With a slight tensing of the muscles, you can jump 20 feet. So why smoke tea when you can fly like crazy for nothing? Martian women are bags. 
so perhaps you'd better disregard the injunction above and bring your own, even if it means two furs. Did you ever see an Alaska klooch? Pronounced klooch. Probably not. Well, these Arctic horrors are Zeke-filled buttes compared to the Martian fair sex. They slouch with knees bent and knuckles brushing the ground, and if Ringling Brothers is looking for a mate for Gargantua, here is where to find her. Yet their manner is habitually timid, as though they've been given a hard time. From the look in their deep-set eyes, they seem to fear abduction or rape, but not even the zoot-suited goons from Greenpunt gave them a second tumble. The visiting Mafia delegation was naturally disappointed at this state of affairs. They'd been led to believe by the little guy who escorted them that all Martian dames resembled Marilyn Monroe, only more so, and the men were Adonises and not Joe. Seems they once were at that. This was a couple of eons ago when Earthmen looked like Martians do now, which seems to indicate that Martians as well as men have their ups and downs. The citizens of the planet are apparently about halfway down the toboggan. They wear clothes, but they're not hand-stitched. Their neckties don't come from Sulka. No self-respecting goon from Gowanus would care to be seen in their company. The females always appear in public fully clothed, which doesn't help them either, but covering their faces would. They buy their dresses at a place called Cressworth and look like Paris Nouveau Riche. There are four separate nations there, though nation is hardly the word. It is more accurate to say there are four separate clans that don't like each other, though how they can tell the difference is beyond us. They are known as the East Side, West Side, North Side, and Gas House Gangs. Each stays in its own backyard. Periodic wars are fought, a few thousand of the enemy are dissolved with ray guns, after which the factions retire by common consent and throw a banquet at which the losing country is forced to take the wives of the visitors, which is a twist not yet thought of on Earth. Martian language is unlike anything ever heard below. It would baffle the keenest linguist, if the keenest linguist ever gets to Mars. However, the Mafia, which is a worldwide blood brotherhood with colonies in every land and clime, has a universal language. Knives and brass knucks are understood everywhere. The Martian lingo seems to be somewhat similar to Chinese. It's not what they say, but how they say it. For instance, Song Kul may mean I love you or you dirty son of a bitch. The Mafistas soon learned to translate what the natives were saying by watching the squint in their eyes. When they spoke with a certain expression, the mobsters let go with 45s, which, however, merely having a stunning effect on the gent on the receiving end because of lesser gravity. On the other hand, the Martian death ray guns were not fatal to the toughs from Earth. Anyone who can live through St. Valentine's Day in Chicago can live through anything. So it came out in a dead heat. Thereupon, the boys from the syndicate sat down and declared the Martians in for a 50-50 partnership, which means they actually gave them 1%, which is generous at that. Never having had the great advantages of a new deal, the Martians are still backward and use gold as a means of exchange. With no Harvard big domes to tell them gold is a thing of the past, the yellow metal circulates there as freely and easily as we once kicked pennies around before they became extinct here. The Mafistas quickly set the Martians right about the futility of gold. They eagerly turned it over to the Earthmen in exchange for green certificates with pretty pictures engraved thereon. 3. Rackets via Rockets Gold, platinum, diamonds, and other precious stuff are as plentiful on Mars as hay fever is on Earth in August. When the gangsters lamped the loot, their greedy eyes and greasy fingers twitched, and when a hood's eyes and fingers twitch, watch out. Something is twitching. The locals were completely honest. They were too dumb to be thieves. The natives were not acquisitive. Why should they be when gold was so common it had no value, and a neighbor's wife so ugly no one would covet her? This was a desperate situation indeed, until one of the boys from East St. Louis uttered the eternal truth. There ain't no honest man who ain't a crook, and why should Moss be any different? The difficulty was finding the means and methods of corruption. All the cash in Jake Guzik's strong box meant nothing to a race of characters whose brats made mud pies of gold dust. The discovery came as an accident. The first Earthman to be eliminated on Mars was a two-bit hood from North Clark Street, who sold a five-cent Hershey bar with almonds to a Martian for a gold piece worth 94 bucks. The man from Mars bit the candy bar. The hood bit the gold piece. Then the Martian picked up a rock and beamed the lad from the Windy City, after which the Martian's eyes dilated and he let out a scream. Then he attacked the first Martian female who passed by. Never before had such a thing happened on Mars, and to say she was surprised is putting it lightly. Thereupon, half the female population ran after the berserk Martian. When the organization heard about this, an investigation was ordered. 
That is how the Crime Trust found out there is no sugar on Mars, that this was the first time it had ever been tasted by a Martian, that it acts on them like junk does on an Earthman. They further discovered that the chief source of Martian diet is, believe it or not, poppy seed, hemp, and coca leaf, and that the alkaloids thereof, opium, hashish, and cocaine, have not the slightest visible effect on them. Poppies grow everywhere, huge russet poppies, ten times as large as those on Earth and one hundred times as deadly. It is these poppies which have colored the planet red. Martians are strictly vegetarian. They bake, fry, and stew these flowers and weeds and eat them raw with a goo made from fungus, and called schmortz, which passes for a salad dressing. Though the Martians were absolutely impervious to the narcotic qualities of the aforementioned flora, they got higher than Mars on small doses of sugar. So the Mafia was in business. The Martians sniffed granulated sugar, which they called snow. They ate cube sugar, which they called hard stuff. And they injected molasses syrup into their veins with hypos and called this mainliners. There was nothing they would not do for a pinch of sugar. Gold, platinum, and diamonds, narcotics by the acre. These were to be had in generous exchange for sugar, which was selling on Earth at a nickel or so a pound wholesale. The spaceship went into shuttle service, a load of diamonds and dope coming back, a load of sugar and blondes going up. Blondes made Martians higher even than sugar and brought larger and quicker returns. This is a confidential tip to the South African Diamond Trust. Ten spaceship loads of precious stones are now being cut in a cellar on Bleecker Street in New York. The mob plans to retail them for $25 a carat. Though the gangsters are buying sugar at a few cents a pound here and selling it for its weight in rubies on Mars, a hood is always a hood. They've been cutting dope with sugar for years on Earth, so they didn't know how to do it any different on Mars. What to cut the sugar with on Mars? Simple. With heroin, of course, which is worthless there. This is a brief rundown on the racket situation as it currently exists on our sister planet. Faked passports. When the boys first landed, they found only vague boundaries between the nations, and Martians could roam as they pleased. Maybe this is why they stayed close to home. Though, anyway, why should they travel? There was nothing to see. The boys quickly took care of this. First, in order to make travel alluring, they brought 20 strippers from Calumet City and set them peeling just beyond the border lines. Then they went to the chieftains and sold them a bill of goods, with a generous bribe of sugar, to close the borders. The next step was to corrupt the border guards, which was easy with any Oakleys to do the burlesque shows. The selling price for faked passports fluctuates between a ton and three tons of platinum. Vice. Until the arrival of the Earthmen, there were no illicit sexual relations on the planet. In fact, no Martian in his right mind would have relations with the native crop of females, and they in turn felt the same way about the males. Laws had to be passed requiring all able-bodied citizens to marry and propagate. Thus, the first load of bims from South Ackard Street in Dallas found eager customers. But these babes, who romanced anything in pants on Earth, went on a stand-up strike when they saw and smelled the Martians. Especially smelled... They smelled worse than Texas yahoos just off a cow farm. This proved embarrassing, to say the least, to the procurers. Considerable sums of money were invested in this human cargo, and the boys feared dire consequences from their Shylocks, should they return empty-handed. In our other confidential essays, we told you how the Mafia employs some of the best brains on Earth to direct and manage its far-flung properties, including high-priced attorneys, accountants, real estate experts, engineers, and scientists. A hurried meeting of the Grand Council was called and held in a bungalow on the shores of one of Minneapolis's beautiful lakes. The decision reached there was to corner chlorophyll, which accounts in part for the delay in putting it on the market down here, and ship it to Mars to deodorize the populace there, after which the ladies of the evening got off their feet and went back to work. Gambling. Until the arrival of the Mafia, gambling on Mars was confined to a simple game played with children's jacks. The loser had to relieve the winner of his wife. The Mafia brought up some fine gambling equipment, including the layouts from the Colonial Inn in Florida and the Beverly in New Orleans, both of which were closed, and taught the residents how to shoot craps and play the wheel, with the house putting up sugar against precious stones and metals. With such odds, it was not necessary to fake the games more than is customary on Earth. 4. Little New York Confidential Despite what Earthbound professors tell you about the Martian atmosphere, we know better. They weren't there. It is a dogma that Mars has no oxygen. Baloney. While it is true that there is considerably less on Earth than the surface atmosphere, the air underground in caves, valleys, and tunnels has plenty to support life lavishly. 
Though why Martians want to live after they look at each other, we cannot tell you, even confidential. For this reason, Martian cities are built underground, and travel between them is carried on through a complicated system of subways predating the New York IRT line by several thousand centuries. Though to the naked eye there is little difference between a Brooklyn Express and a Mars Express, yet the latter were built before the pyramids. When the first load of blackhanders arrived, they naturally balked against living underground. It reminded them too much of the days before they went legitimate, and were constantly on the lam and hiding out. So the Mafia put the Martians to work building a town. There are no building materials on the planet, but the Martians are adept at making gold dust hold together with diamond rivets. The result of their effort, for which they were paid in peppermint sticks and lump sugar, is named Little New York, with hotels, nightclubs, bars, haberdashers, Turkish baths, and horse rooms. Instead of air conditioning, it had oxygen conditioning, but the town had no police station. There were no cops. Finally, a meeting was held at which one punk asked another, What the hell kind of town is it with no cops? Who are we going to bribe? After some discussion, they cut cards. One of the Bergen County boys drew the black ace. What do I know about being a cop? He squawked. You can take graft, can't you? You've been shook down, ain't you? The boys also imported a couple of smart mouthpieces and a ship of blank habeas corpus forms, together with a judge who was the brother of one of the lawyers, so there was no need to build a jail in this model city. The only ones who ever get arrested anyway are the Martians, and they soon discovered that the coppers from Terra would look the other way for a bucket full of gold. Until the arrival of the Earthmen, the Martians were, as stated, peaceful, and even now crime is practically unknown among them. The chief problem, however, is to keep them in line on pay nights, when they go on sugar binges. Chocolate bars are as common on Mars as saloons are on Broadway, and it is not unusual to see gone Martians getting heaved out of these bars right into the gutter. One nostalgic hood from Seattle said it reminded him of Skid Row there. 5. The Red, Red Planet the gangsters had not been on Mars long before they heard rumors about other outsiders who were supposed to have landed on the other side of Mount Serum. The boys got together in a cocktail lounge to talk this over, and they decided they weren't going to stand for any other mobs muscling in. Thereupon, they dispatched four torpedoes with Tommy guns and a big black limousine to see what was going. We tell you this confidential. What they found was a communist apparatus sent to Mars from Soviet Russia. The cell was so active that commies had taken over almost half the planet before the arrival of the Mafia, with their domain extending from the Du Colonius region all the way over to Phaethontis and down to Titania. Furthermore, through propaganda and infiltration, there were communist cells in every quarter of the planet, and many of the top officials of the four Martian governments were either secretly party members or openly in fronts. The communist battle cry was, Men of Mars unite! You have nothing to lose but your wives! Comes the revolution, they were told, and all Martians could remain bachelors. It is no wonder the communists made such inroads. The planet became known as the Red Red Planet. In their confidential books about the cities of Earth, Late and Mortimer explored the community of interest between the organized underworld and the Soviet. Communists are in favor of anything that causes civil disorder and unrest. Gangsters have no conscience, and will do business with anyone who pays. On Earth, Russia floods the Western powers, and especially the United States, with narcotics, first to weaken them and provide easy prey, and second for dollar exchange. And on Earth, the Mafia, which is another international conspiracy like the Communists, sell the narcotics. And so, when the gangsters heard there were Communist cells on Mars, they quickly made a contact. For most of the world's cheap sugar comes from Russia. The Mafia inroad on the American sugar market had already driven cane up more than 300%. But the Russians were anxious, able, and willing to provide all the beets they wanted at half the competitive price. 6. The Honest Hoods As we pointed out in previous works, the crime syndicate now owns so much money its chief problem is to find ways in which to invest it. As a result, the Mafia and its allies control thousands of legitimate enterprises, ranging from hotel chains to railroads and from laundries to distilleries. And so it was on Mars. With all the rackets cornered, the gangsters decided it was time to go into some straight businesses. At the next get-together of the Grand Council, the following conversation was heard. What do these mopes need that they ain't getting? A big fat hole in the head. Cut it out, this is serious. A hole in the head ain't serious. There's no profit in them one-shot deals. It's the repeat business you make the dough on. Maybe you got something there. You can kill a jerk only once. But a jerk can have relatives. 
We're talking about legit stuff. All the rest has been taken care of. With the Martians I've seen, a bar of soap could be a big thing. From this random suggestion, there sprang up a major interplanetary project. If the big soap companies are wondering where all the soap went a few years ago, we can tell them. It went to Mars. Soap came on immediately. It was snapped up as fast as it arrived. But several questions popped into the minds of the Mafia soap salesmen. Where was it all going? A Martian in line for a bar in the evening was back again the following morning for another one. And why did the Martians stay just as dirty as ever? The answer was, the Martians stayed as dirty as ever because they weren't using the soap to wash with, they were eating it. It cured the hangover from sugar. Another group cornered the undertaking business, adding a twist that made for more activity. They added a department of elimination. The men in charge of this end of the business circulate through the chocolate and soap bars, politely inquiring, who would you like to be killed? Struck with the novelty of the thing, quite a few Martians remember other Martians they are mad at. The going price is 100 carats of diamonds to kill, which is cheap considering the average laborer earns 10,000 carats a week. Then the boys from the more dignified end of the business drop in at the home of the victim and offer to bury him cheap. 250 carats gets a Martian planted in style. Inasmuch as Martians live underground, burying is done in reverse, by tying a rocket to the tail of the deceased and shooting him out into the stratosphere. 7. One universe confidential. Mars is presently no problem to Earth, and will not be until we have all its gold and the Martians begin asking us for loans. Meanwhile, Leighton and Mortimer say, let the gangsters and communists have it. We don't want it. We believe Earth would weaken itself if it dissipated its assets on foreign planets. Instead, we should heavily arm our own satellites, which will make us secure from attack by an alien planet or constellation. At the same time, we should build an overwhelming force of spaceships capable of delivering lethal blows to the outermost corners of the universe and return without refueling. We have seen the futility of meddling in everyone's business on Earth. Let's not make that mistake in space. We are unalterably opposed to the UP, United Planets, and call upon the governments of Earth not to join that inter-solar system boondoggle. We have enough trouble right here. The Appendix Confidential Blast off, the equivalent of the takeoff of Terran aviation. Spaceships blast off into space, not to be confused with the report of a sawed-off shotgun. Blasting pit, place from which a spaceship blasts off. Guarded area where the intense heat from the jets melts the ground. Also used for cockfights. Spacemen, those who man the spaceships. See any comic strip. Heroscope, a very sensitive instrument for space navigation. The sighting plate thereon is centered around two crosshairs. Because of the vastness of space, very fine hairs are used. These hairs are obtained from the gloomph frog, found only in the heart of the dense Venusian swamps. The heroscope is a must in space navigation. Then how did they get to Venus to get the hair from the gloomph frog? Read Venus Confidential. Multiplanetary Agitation The interspatial methods by which the Russians compete for the minds of the Neptunians and the Plutonians and the Gowanians. Spacesuit, the clothing worn by those who go into space. The men are put into modernistic diving suits. The dames wear bras and panties. Grav plates, a form of magnetic shoe worn by spacemen while standing on the outer hull of a spaceship halfway to Mars. Why a spaceman wants to stand on the outer hull of a ship halfway to Mars is not clear, possibly to win a bet. Space platform, a man-made satellite rotating around Earth between here and the moon. Scientists say this is a necessary first step to interplanetary travel. Mars Confidential proves the fallacy of this theory. Space Academy, a college where young men are trained to be spacemen. The student body consists mainly of cadets who served apprenticeships as elevator jockeys. Asteroids, tiny worlds floating around in space, put there no doubt to annoy unwary spaceships. Extrapolation, the process by which a science fiction writer takes an established scientific fact and builds thereon a story that couldn't happen in a million years, but maybe two million. Science fiction, a genre of escape literature which takes the reader to faraway planets, and usually neglects to bring him back. SF, an abbreviation for science fiction. BIM, a word derived by using the first letters of the three words, bug-eyed monster. BIMs are ghastly-looking creatures in general. In science fiction yarns written by Terrans, BIMs are natives of Mars, in science fiction yarns written by Martians, 
Bims are natives of Terra. The Pile. The source from which power is derived to carry men to the stars. Optional on the more expensive spaceships at extra cost. Atom Blaster. A gun carried by spacemen which will melt people down to a cinder. A forty-five would do just as well, but then there's the Sullivan Act. Orbit. The path of any heavenly body. The bodies are held in these orbits by natural laws the Republicans are thinking of repealing. Nova. The explosive stage into which planets may pass. According to the finest scientific thinking, a planet will either nova or it won't. Galaxy. A term used to confuse people who have always called it the Milky Way. Sunspots. Vast electrical storms on the sun which interfere with radio reception, said interference being advantageous during political campaigns. Atomic cannons. Things that go zap. Audio screen. Television without Milton Berle or wrestling. Disintegrating ray. Something you can't see that turns something you can see into something you can't see. Geiger counter. Something used to count Geigers. Interstellar space. Too much, nothing at all, filled with rockets, flying saucers, advanced civilizations, and discarded copies of amazing stories. Mars. A candy bar. Pluto. A kind of water. Ray guns. Small things that go zap. Time machine. A machine that carries you back to yesterday and into next year. Also, an alarm clock. Time warp. The hole in time the time machine goes through to reach another time. A hole in nothing. Terra. Another name for Earth. It comes from terra firma or something like that. Hyperdrive. The motor that is used to drive a spaceship faster than the speed of light. Invented by science fiction writers, but not yet patented. Ether. The upper reaches of space, and whatever fills them. Also an anesthetic. Luna. Another name for the moon. Formerly a park in Coney Island. End of Mars Confidential by Howard Brown. The Men Return by Jack Vance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Men Return by Jack Vance. The relict came furtively down the crag, a shambling, gaunt creature with tortured eyes. He moved in a series of quick dashes, using panels of dark air for concealment running behind each passing shadow, at times crawling on all fours, head low to the ground. Arriving at the final low outcrop of rock, he halted and peered across the plain. Far away rose low hills, blurring into the sky, which was mottled and sallow like poor milk glass. The intervening plain spread like rotten velvet, black-green and wrinkled, streaked with ochre and rust. A fountain of liquid rock jetted high in the air, branched out into black coral, in the middle distance, a family of gray objects evolved with a sense of purposeful destiny. Spheres melted into pyramids, became domes, tufts of white spires, sky-piercing poles, then, as a final tour de force, tesseracts. The relict cared nothing for this. He needed food, and out on the plain were plants. They would suffice in lieu of anything better. They grew in the ground, or sometimes on a floating lump of water, or surrounding a core of hard black gas. There were dank black flaps of leaf, clumps of haggard thorn, pale green bulbs, stalks with leaves and contorted flowers. There was no recognizable species, and the relict had no means of knowing if the leaves and tendrils he had eaten yesterday would poison him today. He tested the surface of the plain with his foot. The glassy surface, though it likewise seemed a construction of red and gray-green pyramids, accepted his weight, then suddenly sucked at his leg. In a frenzy, he tore himself free, jumped back, squatted on the temporarily solid rock. Hunger rasped at his stomach. He must eat. He contemplated the plain. Not too far away, a pair of organisms played, sliding, driving, dancing, striking flamboyant poses. Should they approach, he would try to kill one of them. They resembled men, and so should make a good meal. He waited. A long time, a short time. It might have been either. Duration had neither quantitative nor qualitative reality. The sun had vanished, and there was no standard cycle or recurrence. Time was a word-blank of meaning. 
Matter had not always been so. The relict retained a few tattered recollections of the old days, before system and logic had been rendered obsolete. Man had dominated Earth by virtue of a single assumption, that an effect could be traced to a cause, itself the effect of a previous cause. Manipulation of this basic law yielded rich results. There seemed no need for any other tool or instrumentality. Man congratulated himself on his generalized structure. He could live on desert, on plain or ice, in forest or in city. Nature had not shaped him to a special environment. He was unaware of his vulnerability. Logic was the special environment. The brain was the special tool. Then came the terrible hour when Earth swam into a pocket of non-causality, and all the ordered tensions of cause-effect dissolved. The special tool was useless. It had no purchase on reality. From the two billions of men, only a few survived. The mad. They were now the organisms, lords of the era, their discords so exactly equivalent to the vagaries of the land as to constitute a peculiar wild wisdom. Or perhaps the disorganized matter of the world, loose from the old organization, was peculiarly sensitive to psychokinesis. A handful of others, the relics, managed to exist, but only through a delicate set of circumstances. They were the ones most strongly charged with the old causal dynamic. It persisted sufficiently to control the metabolism of their bodies, but could extend no further. They were fast dying out, for sanity provided no leverage against the environment. Sometimes their own minds sputtered and jangled, and they would go raving and leaping out across the plain. The organisms observed with neither surprise nor curiosity. How could surprise exist? The mad relict might pause by an organism and try to duplicate the creature's existence. The organism ate a mouthful of plant. So did the relict. The organism rubbed his feet with crushed water. So did the relict. Presently, the relict would die of poison or rent bowels or skin lesions, while the organism relaxed in the dank black grass. Or the organism might seek to eat the relict, and the relict would run off in terror, unable to abide any part of the world, running, bounding, breasting the thick air, eyes wide, mouth open, calling and gasping, until finally he floundered in a pool of black iron or blundered into a vacuum pocket to bat around like a fly in a bottle. The relics now numbered very few. Finn, he who crouched on the rock overlooking the plain, lived with four others. Two of these were old men and soon would die. Finn, likewise, would die unless he found food. Out on the plain, one of the organisms, Alpha, sat down, caught a handful of air, a globe of blue liquid, a rock, kneaded them together, pulled the mixture like taffy, gave it a great heave. It uncoiled from his hand like a rope. The relict crouched low, no telling what devilry would occur to the creature. He and all the rest of them, unpredictable. The relict valued their flesh as food, but they also would eat him if opportunity offered. In the competition, he was at a great disadvantage. Their random acts baffled him. If, seeking to escape, he ran, the worst terror would begin. The direction he set his face was seldom the direction the varying frictions of the ground let him move. But the organisms were as random and uncommitted as the environment, and the double set of vagaries sometimes compounded, sometimes cancelled each other. In the latter case, the organisms might catch him. It was inexplicable, but then what was not? The word explanation had no meaning. They were moving toward him. Had they seen him? He flattened himself against the sullen yellow rock. The two organisms paused not far away. He could hear their sounds and crouched, sick from conflicting pangs of hunger and fear. Alpha sank to his knees, lay flat on his back, arms and legs flung out at random, addressing the sky in a series of musical cries, sibilants, guttural groans. It was a personal language he had only now improvised, but Beta understood him well. A vision, cried Alpha. I see past the sky. I see knots, spinning circles. They tighten into hard points. They will never come undone. Beta perched on a pyramid, glanced over the shoulder at the mottled sky. An intuition, chanted Alpha. A picture out of the other time. It is hard, merciless, inflexible. Beta poised on the pyramid, dove through the glassy surface, swam under Alpha, emerged, lay flat beside him. Observe the relict on the hillside. In his blood is the whole of the old race, the narrow men with minds like cracks, he has exuded the intuition. Clumsy thing, a blunderer, said Alpha. They are all dead, all of them, said Beta, although three or four remain. 
when past, present, and future are no more than ideas left over from another era, like boats on a dry lake, then the completion of a process can never be defined. Alpha said, This is the vision. I see the relics swarming the earth. Then, whisking off to nowhere, like gnats in the wind, this is behind us. The organisms lay quiet, considering the vision. A rock, or perhaps a meteor, fell from the sky, struck into the surface of the pond. It left a circular hole, which slowly closed. From another part of the pool, a gout of fluid splashed into the air, floated away. Alpha spoke. Again! The intuition comes strong! There will be lights in the sky! The fever died in him. He hooked a finger into the air, hoisted himself to his feet. Beta lay quiet. Slugs, ants, flies, beetles were crawling on him, boring, breeding. Alpha knew that Beta could arise, shake off the insects, stride off. But Beta seemed to prefer passivity. That was well enough. He could produce another Beta should he choose, or a dozen of him. Sometimes the world swarmed with organisms, all sorts, all colors, tall as steeples, short and squat as flower pots. I feel a lack, said Alpha. I will eat the relict. He set forth, and sheer chance brought him near to the ledge of yellow rock. Finn the relict sprang to his feet in panic. Alpha tried to communicate, so that Finn might pause while Alpha ate, but Finn had no grasp for the many valued overtones of Alpha's voice. He seized a rock, hurled it at Alpha. The rock puffed into a cloud of dust, blew back into the relic's face. Alpha moved closer, extended his long arms. The relic kicked. His feet went out from under him, and he slid out on the plain. Alpha ambled complacently behind him. Finn began to crawl away. Alpha moved off to the right. One direction was as good as another. He collided with Beta, and began to eat Beta instead of the relic. The relic hesitated then approached and, joining Alpha, pushed chunks of pink flesh into his mouth. Alpha said to the relict, I was about to communicate an intuition to him whom we dine upon. I will speak to you. Finn could not understand Alpha's personal language. He ate as rapidly as possible. Alpha spoke on. There will be lights in the sky. The great lights. Finn rose to his feet and, warily watching Alpha, seized Beta's legs, began to pull him toward the hill. Alpha watched with quizzical unconcern. It was hard work for the spindly relict. Sometimes Beta floated. Sometimes he wafted off on the air. Sometimes he adhered to the terrain. At last he sank into a knob of granite which froze around him. Finn tried to jerk Beta loose and then to pry him up with a stick without success. He ran back and forth in an agony of indecision. Beta began to collapse, wither like a jellyfish on hot sand. The relict abandoned the hulk. Too late. Too late. Food going to waste. The world was a hideous place of frustration. Temporarily, his belly was full. He started back up the crag and presently found the camp, where the four other relics waited. Two ancient males, two females. The females, Giza and Reek, like Finn, had been out foraging. Giza had brought in a slab of lichen, Reek a bit of nameless carrion. The old men, bowed and taggart, sat quietly, waiting either for food or for death. The women greeted Finn sullenly. Where is the food you went forth to find? I had a whole carcass, said Finn. I could not carry it. Bode had slyly stolen the slab of lichen and was cramming it into his mouth. It came alive, quivered, and exuded a red ichor which was poison, and the old man died. Now there is food, said Finn. Let us eat. But the poison created a putrescence. The body, seethed with blue foam, flowed away of its own energy. The women turned to look at the other old man, who said in a quavering voice, "'Eat me if you must, but why not choose Reek, who is younger than I?' Reek, the younger of the women, gnawing on the bit of carrion, made no reply. Finn said hollowly, "'Why do we worry ourselves? Food is even more difficult, and we are the last of all men.' "'No, no,' spoke Reek. "'Not the last. We saw others on the green mound.' "'That was long ago,' said Giza. Now they are surely dead. Perhaps they have found a source of food, suggested Reek. Finn rose to his feet, looked across the plain. Who knows? Perhaps there is a more pleasant land beyond the horizon. There is nothing anywhere but waste and evil creatures, snapped Giza. What could be worse than here? Finn argued calmly. No one could find grounds for disagreement. 
Here is what I propose, said Finn. Notice this tall peak. Notice the layers of hard air. They bump into the peak. They bounce off. They float in and out and disappear past the edge of sight. Let us all climb this peak, and when a sufficiently large bank of air passes, we will throw ourselves on top and allow it to carry us to the beautiful regions which may exist just out of sight. There was argument. The old man Taggart protested his feebleness. The women derided the possibility of the bountiful regions Finn envisioned. But presently, grumbling and arguing, they began to clamber up the pinnacle. It took a long time. The obsidian was soft as jelly, and Taggart several times professed himself at the limit of his endurance. But still they climbed, and at last reached the pinnacle. There was barely room to stand. They could see in all directions, far out over the landscape, till vision was lost in the watery gray. The women bickered and pointed in various directions, but there was small sign of happier territory. In one direction blue-green hills shivered like bladders full of oil. In another direction lay a streak of black, a gorge or a lake of clay. In another direction were blue-green hills, the same they had seen in the first direction. Somehow there had been a shift. Below was the plain, gleaming like an iridescent beetle, here and there pocked with black velvet spots, overgrown with questionable vegetation. They saw organisms, a dozen shapes loitering by ponds, munching vegetable pods or small rocks or insects. There came Alpha. He moved slowly, still awed by his vision, ignoring the other organisms. Their play went on, but presently they stood quiet, sharing the oppression. On the obsidian peak, Finn caught hold of a passing filament of air, drew it in. Now, all on, and we sail away to the land of plenty. No, protested Giza. There is no room, and who knows if it will fly in the right direction. Where is the right direction? asked Finn. Does anyone know? No one knew, but the women still refused to climb aboard the filament. Finn turned to Taggart. Here, old one, show these women how it is. Climb on. No, no, he cried. I fear the air. This is not for me. Climb on, old man, then we follow. Wheezing and fearful, clenching his hands deep into the spongy mass, Taggart pulled himself out onto the air, spindly shanks hanging over into nothing. Now, spoke Finn, who next? The women still refused. You go then yourself, cried Giza. And leave you, my last guarantee against hunger, aboard now. No, the air is too small. Let the old one go and we will follow on a larger. Very well, Finn released his grip. The air floated off over the plain, Taggart straddling and clutching for dear life. They watched him curiously. Observe, said Finn, how fast and easily moves the air, above the organisms, over all the slime and uncertainty. But the air itself was uncertain, and the old man's raft dissolved. Clutching at the departing wisps, Taggart sought to hold his cushion together. It fled from under him, and he fell. On the peak, the three watched the spindly shape flap and twist on its way to earth far below. Now, Reek exclaimed vexatiously, we even have no more meat. None, said Giza, except the visionary Finn himself. They surveyed Finn. Together they would more than outmatch him. Careful, cried Finn. I am the last of the men. You are my women subject to my orders. They ignored him, muttering to each other looking at him from the side of their faces. Careful, cried Finn. I will throw you both from this peak. That is what we plan for you, said Giza. They advanced with sinister caution. Stop, I am the last man. We are better off without you. One moment, look at the organisms. The women looked. The organisms stood in a knot, staring at the sky. Look at the sky. The women looked. The frosted glass was cracking, breaking, curling aside. The blue, the blue sky of old times. A terribly bright light burnt down, seared their eyes. The rays warmed their naked backs. The sun, they said in awed voices. The sun has come back to earth. The shrouded sky was gone. The sun rode proud and bright in a sea of blue. The ground below churned, cracked, heaved, solidified. They felt the obsidian harden under their feet. Its color shifted to glossy black. The earth, the sun, the galaxy had departed the region of freedom. The other time, with its restrictions and logic, 
was once more with them. This is old earth, cried Finn. We are men of old earth. The land is once again ours. And what of the organisms? If this is the earth of old, then let the organisms beware. The organisms stood on a low rise of ground beside a runnel of water that was rapidly becoming a river flowing out onto the plain. Alpha cried, Here is my intuition. It is exactly as I knew. The freedom is gone. The tightness, the constriction are back. How will we defeat it? asked another organism. Easily, said a third. Each must fight a part of the battle. I plan to hurl myself at the sun and blot it from existence. And he crouched, threw himself into the air. He fell on his back and broke his neck. The fault, said Alpha, is in the air, because the air surrounds all things. Six organisms ran off in search of air and, stumbling into the river, drowned. In any event, said Alpha, I am hungry. He looked around for suitable food. He seized an insect which stung him. He dropped it. My hunger remains. He spied Finn and the two women descending from the crag. I will eat one of the relics, he said. Come, let us all eat. Three of them started off as usual in random directions. By chance, Alpha came face to face with Finn. He prepared to eat, but Finn picked up a rock. The rock remained a rock, hard, sharp, heavy. Finn swung it down, taking joy in the inertia. Alpha died with a crushed skull. One of the other organisms attempted to step across a crevasse twenty feet wide and disappeared into it. The other sat down, swallowed rocks to assuage his hunger, and presently went into convulsions. Finn pointed here and there around the fresh new land. In that quarter, the new city, like that of the legends, over here the farms, the cattle. We have none of these, protested Giza. No, said Finn. Not now, but once more the sun rises and sets, once more rock has weight, and air has none, once more water falls as rain and flows to the sea. He stepped forward over the fallen organism. Let us make plans. End of The Men Return by Jack Vance Mutiny in the Void by Charles R. Tanner this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by M.D. Peterson. Mutiny in the Void by Charles R. Tanner The tank room of the rocket ship Berenice, where the big tanks of waterweed were kept, was so spick and span that a man needed little psychology to realize that its manager was a dapper, finicky, careful little man. The room's lights were bright and efficient, the water in the tanks fresh and clean, and there were no decaying fronds of vegetation among the thousands of stems of waterweed which, floating about in the tank, absorbed the carbon dioxide which was pumped through the water and gave back a constant stream of tiny bubbles of oxygen. For this farm, as the tank room was called, was the oxygen producer for the rocket, and under the expert care of Manuel Saruk, the farmer, it kept the air as fresh and wholesome as the air of Earth. Manuel was proud of his work and of the way he handled it, just as he was proud of his appearance and the way he kept that. But at the moment, thoughts of pride and satisfaction were furthest from Manuel Saruk's mind. He had just opened the door of the tank room and entered and on his face were written terror and anxiety, and written in unmistakable characters. For Manuel had just been an unconscious eavesdropper on a conversation, a conversation between Gilligan, the tall, cadaverous mate of the ship, and one of the fuel wrestlers. Manuel didn't know the name of the wrestler, for most of the crew were new men picked by Gilligan on this, his second trip on the Berenice. But his name was of no moment. It was the gist of the conversation that mattered. It was that which made the dapper little farmer tremble with anxiety, and yes, terror. For they had spoken of mutiny, and of mutiny imminent and likely to break out at any minute. Manuel was neat, and Manuel was proud, but no one would call him brave. He was frightened now, frightened almost out of his wits, and uncertain as to what he should do. 
He mechanically reached into the breast of his jacket and drew out a tobacco let. He stuck it in his mouth and inhaled it, wishing it was a cigarette he was smoking. Ninety-nine farmers out of a hundred wasted oxygen by smoking tobacco, but not manure. The rule said no cigarettes, so it was no cigarettes for him. He tossed the tobacco let away before it was half empty and began to pace the floor nervously. He went to the washstand and brushed the stain of the tobacco let from his teeth. He made a test of the air and smiled a little as he noted that the oxygen content was well above par. He examined the weeds and removed a sickly looking frond or two. But his mind was not on his work and he soon resumed his uneasy pacing. And then there was a knock at the door. His heart flew into his mouth. He glanced around to see if there was any place to flee and then called out weakly, Who's there? It's me, Gilligan, came the sharp voice of the mate, and Manuel's panic became, if possible, greater. What, what do you want? he stammered. Gilligan's voice grew even sharper. What's the matter with you, Manuel? he snapped. Let me in, I want to have a talk with you. Manuel was trembling violently, but he moved forward and unlatched the door. The tall, abnormally thin mate strode in, a sort of ingratiating smile hovering over his face. Nice little place you got here, Manuel, he said with a forced smile. Too bad I never had a chance to visit you here before. He strode over to Manuel's stool, the only seat in the farm, and took possession of it. He looked about him, glanced at Manuel once or twice, and gradually his smile became more natural. Manuel, he said, you're an officer of sorts, maybe only a warrant officer, but still, you eat with them, so I've been considering you as an officer. But, well... I like you, Manuel, and you've heard more than you should, I believe, so I've come to have a little talk with you. He lowered his voice and looked around warily before he continued. Then, Manuel, he said, I'm going to make things plain. You heard me talking to Larry a while ago, and you must be suspicious. Well, your suspicion is right. There's going to be a mutiny aboard this hunk of fireworks, and Captain Tarrant is going to lose his job. Know why? "'Cause I'm one of Huddersfield's men, and I've been working to seize this ship for eight months.' Manuel shuddered. "'Huddersfield? The Syrian?' he asked. "'The very same. Huddersfield has seized an asteroid and intends to start a fleet of rockets. He's got a couple already, and this'll be his third. When we get enough, things'll pop, I'll tell you. Now listen, Manuel, you can throw in with us and go in for Huddersfield, or you can run and tell Cap Tarrant and get your bloody knob knocked off when we take the ship. Because the men are all with me, Manuel, all of them. And there ain't a chance of Tarrant winning if it comes to battle. He stopped, evidently waiting for Manuel to speak. The little farmer looked up miserably. But what can I do? He cried plaintively. Me? I ain't no fighter, Gilligan. You don't want me a for a fighter in your crew. Gilligan looked up, smiling broadly. Manuel's obvious terror of him seemed to have reassured him considerably. He winked confidently. Manuel, he said, your business is to keep the air clean, and that's all you have to do. Except to keep your mouth shut, too, because if you peep to the captain or to Navigator Rogers, you'll be the first to die when we cut loose. But, he winked again and his smile broadened, you keep the wind fair and the trap closed, and you won't be forgotten. He gave one final wink and stepped out, closing the door behind him. And he left Manuel in a turmoil of uncertainty. The little farmer knew well where his duty lay. If he did the right thing, he'd go at once to Captain Tarrant and inform him of the impending rebellion. But if he did, Gilligan would surely get him. He knew well that the threat the thin maid had made had been no idle one. But if he didn't inform the captain, if he didn't, he'd be a mutineer too and he'd have to take his share and leave the earth a fugitive, and probably cast his lot with the infamous Huddersfield. He certainly didn't want to do that either. He strode back and forth in the tank room, a victim of uncertainty. He didn't know what to do, he told himself plaintively. He still didn't know when dinner time came. Manuel's abstraction at the dinner table was so noticeable that young Captain Tarrant was forced to speak of it. Where's your appetite, Saruk? he asked. You haven't even finished your soup. Aren't you feeling well? Manuel's face reddened as he answered, but old Doc Slade looked up and eyed Manuel keenly. You better come in and see me after dinner, Saruk, he suggested. Maybe you got something wrong and I'll have some work to do. You stop in and see me. 
Manuel was about to insist that he had nothing wrong with him when he caught Doc's eye and realized the old man knew something. And then he realized that here was opportunity knocking. He could go in and see Doc Slade, and Gilligan would never suspect anything. He rose from the table murmuring, I'll be in to see you in a few minutes, Doc. Then he hurried back to the farm. He entered the tank room and checked everything again. He put on a clean shirt and brushed his teeth and combed his straight black hair. Then, after a moment's consideration, he brushed his teeth again. Doc might take a notion to examine him, and he certainly didn't want his teeth to be soiled if Doc looked at his mouth and throat. He was about to leave the tank room when he heard a cry from somewhere down the passage. It was a startled cry, and it was followed by a sharp command that ended in an oath. His heart leaped into his mouth. Not an officer on the ship ever used profanity to the men. Besides, he'd have recognized the voice of any of the four officers. That command had been shouted by one of the men, and the cry that had preceded it had been one of surprise. Had the mutiny started already? As if in answer to his question, the sharp report of an automatic rang out suddenly through the passageway. Manuel swung the door shut and ducked back as suddenly as if the bullet had been fired at him. He was beginning to tremble. He felt a smothering constriction of his throat. And yet, at the same time, an unreasoning thrill of excitement was rising within him. He felt an overpowering desire to see what was going on outside. For many minutes, his caution overcame his curiosity. But at last, the continual silence convinced him that, in all probability, the mutiny was over. So, ever so slowly, he crept out into the corridor and started down. The hall where he had heard the shot proved to be quite empty, and he wondered where everybody was. This was certainly a queer mutiny, nothing like he had ever read about. He trod more and more cautiously, and it dawned on him that this silence was more fearsome than tumult would have been. He was passing a storeroom just then, and when he was just abreast of the door, it was flung suddenly open, and there was one of the fuel wrestlers, with a loaded automatic leveled at Manuel's chest, and a spiteful look in his eyes. Manuel's reaction was almost automatic. He threw up his hands and shouted, Don't shoot! And from behind the fuel wrestler, another voice, Gilligan's, said, Let him alone, it's the farmer! Then it grew sharp as the mate snapped. Get in there, Manuel, what are you doing wandering around the halls? You want to get shot? Manuel was almost too scared to speak. I was looking for you, he answered. I think the fight is all over, so I look for you. It ain't all over by a damn sight, Gilligan snarled. You seen Doc Slade? I ain't seen nobody, Saruk answered truthfully. I just came out of the farm and walked down here. I heard a shot a while ago. That was when we took a pop at Slade. I think he must have had some suspicions the way he acted. Now look, Manuel, the mate went on. The stuff ain't exactly in your line. You better go back to the farm and lay low till I call you. Manuel was still a little trembly from the scare he'd got when he saw the pistol pointed at his breast. He nodded enthusiastically at Gilligan's suggestion, darted to the door, and, running down the corridor, he crept into the tank room without another word. He was in the tank room alone for hours, it seemed. It was almost time for supper when there was a knock at the door, and when he hesitatingly opened it, Gilligan came in with a big smile on his face. Well, it's all over but the shouting, Manuel, he boasted. We got Tarrant and Navigator Rogers cooped up in the dining room. They've got food and water, and they've locked themselves in, but we got a guard posted at the door, and we'll get him if they make a break. We got Doc Slade, too, alive. He fought like a tiger, hurt two of the boys before we nailed him, but we took him alive and we're holding him up in the weigh-in room. Cookie stirred up some supper, so come on up and eat. You needn't be afraid, he added as an afterthought. The fighting's all over. Manuel followed him out the door and down the passageway. They went up the stairs to the loading room near the central axis of the rocket, Manuel feeling again the dizziness that he always felt when he lost weight. He had never really become a spaceman in spite of all his years in space. He walked a little uncertainly and giddily into the room, a pace or two behind Gilligan. The entire crew was there, Doc Slade was there, too. He had a black eye and a long, deep scratch down one side of his face. His hands were tied, and he was seated on a stool with his legs tied to the stools. Doc's eyes widened when he saw Manuel walk in with Gilligan. Then a look of scorn came into them, and he turned his head away. Manuel squirmed uncomfortably under his gaze. He liked Doc Slade, and Doc had always liked him, up to now. 
He hoped these fellows wouldn't hurt the old doc. The table was set and the crew were about to sit down to eat. Manuel was seated beside Gilligan and they untied Doc's hands and sat him down too at the opposite end of the table. The meal was sheer torture for the little farmer. The crew ignored him, Gilligan ignored him, and Dr. Slade... Dr. Slade wouldn't ignore him, and Manuel wished he would. Before the meal was over, Manuel was in an agony of anxiety. He wondered what would become of Tarrant and Rogers. He wondered what they'd do to Doc Slade. He wondered also what they were going to do to him. The crew was uproariously jovial. They had broken out a case of gin that one of them had probably smuggled aboard, and they lit cigarettes and split a bottle and were having a glorious time. It grew more glorious after the third bottle, and one of them brought up the suggestion that they divide the cargo among them right then to see what they were going to get. Gilligan frowned and tried to wave the suggestion down, but half a dozen voices snarled angrily at his refusal and the slim mate was forced to acquiesce with as good as grace as possible. A loader was delegated to guard Doc Slade, then the entire remainder of the crew started aft to the hold. In those days, ships usually carried things that were mightily hard to get or make on Mars, and were not too scarce on Earth. In this case, there was a ton of U-235, a lot of organic chemicals that still can be synthesized from their elements, and an assortment of odds and ends that were prized by the Martian natives in spite of their cheapness. Into the bins where the stuff was stored, the shouting pirates, who had lately been a well-behaved crew, swarmed, shouting and pushing, and laying claim to this and that and the other. And in less than five minutes, three separate fights started. Gilligan stormed, threatened, and at last resorted to violence. This stuff will never be divided fair if you lugs try to settle it by fighting for it, he roared after he had clipped a couple of them. What do you think you are, a bunch of pirates? You fools kill each other off, and who brings the ship into port, eh? How long do you think we'd go on living if we shorthanded and damaged this can on landing? Huddersfield would kill you off like flies for that. Now calm down and let's get this thing settled. They stood meekly enough after that, while Gilligan looked the cargo over and assigned this portion of this fellow, that portion of that. He had apportioned a large part of the spoils to them when he came to a dozen or so large corrugated boxes. He read one of the labels and broke out into laughter. Look at this, you lugs, he chuckled. Who's going to get this for his share? The others looked, and grins began to spread over their faces. The label said, Dento Gleam Tooth Powder, one half gram, four ounces. The grins became laughs, and a dozen eyes turned to manure. The little farmer felt his face beginning to redden. It dawned on him that his habit of dental fastidiousness was not unknown to the crew. Gilligan's next remark made it obvious that this was the truth. Manuel, he said, this stuff was probably going to the Mars to polish the teeth of them shark-jawed natives. But it would have been wasted there, Manuel, wasted. But now, Manuel, it shall be awarded to you who will value it in appreciation for all you done for us during the mutiny. His eyes hardened for a moment, as if in anticipation of a complaint. Then... Seeing nothing in Manuel's eyes but plaintive acquiescence, he went on. Take it, Manuel, and get out of here. Take it down to the farm and gloat over it, farmer. There's enough there to last even you for twenty years. The crew looked at him, looked at the dazed Manuel, and burst into spasms of laughter. They poked jibes at him, made obscene puns at his expense, and Manuel stood there, taking it all in and getting redder and redder. He wished futilely that he had had time to do something before the mutiny. He wished that it wasn't too late to do something now. Then he realized that there was something for him to do. Gilligan was ordering him again, in no uncertain terms, to get that tooth powder down to his tank room. He smiled weakly at the ringleader and picked up one box. For the next half hour, he was busy carrying his fortune down to his quarters. And it was doubtful if... In all his life, Manuel Saruk had ever been so miserable. He upbraided himself at every step for his cowardice and vacillation. He racked his brain, striving to devise some brilliant plan to circumvent the mutineers. And even as he did so, another part of his mind was scoffing at the futility of daring to oppose that group of ruffians. By the time he came back for the last box, he had admitted the absurdity of even trying it. They had emptied the gin bottles by that time, 
Some of them were singing, and some were shooting crabs, gambling with their share of the cargo. Gilligan and a couple of others were gathered around Doc Slade. They had removed his bonds and had evidently been talking to him. You'll take a chance with us or you'll take a chance with them two in the officer's mess, Gilligan was saying menacingly as Manuel entered. It was evident that he had shared in the gin since Manuel had started his work. He was looking ugly and seemed to be feeling the same way. Doc Slade's lip was curling with contempt before Gilligan had finished the sentence. There's no choice, the doctor spat. You give me passage to the mess room and I'll go right now. What have I got in common with a pack of space rats like these? I don't like the smell of you, even. Okay, Gilligan snarled with an air of finality that showed that he was ending what had been an attempt to persuade Slade to join them. I'll give you passage. Get out of here and get down to the dining room. He flung the door open and gestured out into the passageway. Doc Slade looked at him with a look in his eyes that Manuel couldn't fathom. Get, repeated Gilligan and drew his weapon. Get out of here before I forget myself and let you have a dose of this. Doc hesitated the briefest second, then he shrugged and stepped out of the door. He started down the passageway swiftly, and Minol noticed that he neither slackened his pace nor looked backward. He was some sixty feet away when Gilligan muttered to the two or three who had crowded to the door, All right, let him have it. And to Manuel's horror, a half dozen shots cracked and echoed in the narrow confines of the hall. Doc staggered, put a hand out to the bulkhead, coughed and slumped to the floor. Gilligan ran forward and put another bullet in him. Manuel didn't even wait until Gilligan came back into the room. He grabbed up his last box mechanically and ran to the steps. His mind was a chaos of horror. He was choking, his eyes were filling with tears, and he was aware of only one thought, to get to the steps before a bullet smacked into his back too. He stumbled down the steps and along the corridor, sobbing as he went. They had killed Doc Slade, killed him in cold blood, They'd kill the other officers, too, if they got the chance. There was no good in them. There was no hope in trying to placate them or appeal to their good nature. At any minute, they'd be likely to take a notion to kill him, too, just for the fun of the thing. He hardly knew what he was doing by the time he entered the tank room and dropped the box of tooth powder onto the others, and then slammed the door shut and locked it. For a while, he was a little hysterical. He sobbed. He walked the floor, he beat his temples with his fists, and wondered if he could kill himself. He could see before him, with awful clarity, the form of Doc Slade, laying as he had lain in the passageway, with a gradually spreading pool of blood beneath his head. He covered his face with his hands and wept anew. He kicked savagely at the boxes that were the price of his neutrality in this little war. He felt that he was the lowest, the most despicable coward in history. He wrung his hands and wept again, and at last in time, he dried his eyes and took a deep breath. There was a new look in his eyes. The thought had come to him suddenly that he had held the lives of these madmen in his own hand. Of course he did. He had been worrying so much about the safety of his own paltry life that this thought had been entirely overlooked. He was the farmer on the ship. What was he weeping and wailing for? when every one of them depended for their air on his continued attention to the tanks. Why, they were a good 20 million miles from the nearest spaceport. If he wanted to die, if he was willing to give his life, he could destroy those tanks of vegetation, and not a man on this rocket would live to land on a planet again. He stood up and threw out his chest. He inhaled deeply and smothered an involuntary sob. He went to the washbowl and washed his face and eyes and combed his lank black hair. He absently reached for his toothbrush, then he shuddered. But habit was too great. In spite of the feeling of revulsion that the very thought of tooth powder brought to him, he wound up by carefully brushing his teeth. Then he felt better. He started to turn away from the washbowl and suddenly stopped. He turned back quickly and seized the can of tooth powder standing there. He picked it up poured some of the powder into his hand and let a drop or two of water fall on it. A sinister grin began to spread over his face. If he handled this thing right, the joke they had made in giving him the tooth powder was going to backfire with a vengeance. He sat down and began to think. He sat there for almost an hour. Once he got up and went over and examined the openings to the ventilator pipes, he removed the screen from one of them, a pipe about two feet in diameter, 
and looked into the blackness of the pipe's interior. What he saw evidently satisfied him, for he smiled again and went back to resume his pensive pose. At last he rose, and with the grim smile playing on his face, he went to work. He climbed up the ventilator pipe he had examined, and started to worm his way into its dark maw. His legs kicked futilely for a moment, then he was hunching his way along through the tube. He worked his way along for a dozen yards or so, then he came to a place where the tube divided in two. He unhesitatingly chose the path to the right. He knew these tubes well enough to traverse them with his eyes shut, even though he had never seen them from the inside before. After a few yards of further crawling, he saw a light ahead and increased his speed. Before long, he was lying in front of a grating and looked out into the officer's mess room. He could see Tarrant and Rogers. They were seated disconsolately at the table, speaking little, apparently, for Manuel watched them for five minutes before he tried to attract their attention, and in all that time, Tarrant only spoke once. When Manuel tapped on the grating, they looked up startled and reached for their weapons. Rogers was unable to locate the wrapping and swung about a little wildly until Tarrant pointed the ventilator opening. Then he recognized Manuel before Tarrant did. It's the farmer, he exclaimed in surprise. What are you doing up there, Saruk? Manuel beckoned them over to the ventilator. Don't talk too loud, he cautioned in a hoarse whisper. I can't say much. Somebody is guarding outside the door. Maybe they hear me. They killed Doc Slade and the chemist. I got a scheme. You take this grating off while I go back to the farm and get something. He backed away without waiting for an answer and made his way slowly back to the farm. He picked up one of his boxes of tooth powder and hoisted it up the ventilator shaft, shoving it back as far as he could. Then he climbed in after it and began his journey back to the mess room, pushing the box ahead of him. It was slow work, but he made it at last and called softly to Tarrant to come get the box. "'What's this all about, Manuel?' demanded the captain, but Manuel refused to answer. "'Can't talk too much, captain,' he whispered. Got to hurry. If someone tries to come in farm before I get these boxes over here, this whole plan be shot. Don't you talk now, please. Tarrant nodded his understanding, and Manuel started back for another box of tooth powder. As he hunched his way along, he heard Tarrant say to Rogers, quite plainly, Think he knows what he's doing, Ike? He smiled bitterly. It seemed impossible for anyone to expect anything important could be accomplished by little Manuel Saruk. Well, if things went right, he was certainly going to show them this time. In spite of his haste, and in spite of the fact that Rogers helped him after the third trip, it was some little time before Manuel dropped down in the tank room after that last box. He heaved a huge sigh of relief as he put it into the ventilator shaft and turned to do the one thing left to do. This was the one job he hated, but it was the most important job of all. He went to his locker and got out a big bottle and poured liquid from it into every one of the tanks. He turned off a valve under each tank and took a hammer and beat the valve handle into uselessness. Then, after checking to make sure he hadn't overlooked anything, he climbed into the tube and started pushing that last box of tooth powder ahead of him. At last he reached the mess room again and handed down his box. He climbed down himself and had no more than landed when Tarrant was on him with a whispered, Come on now, Manuel, tell us what this is all about. Just a couple more minutes, Captain, Manuel pleaded. You think they can get through that door? Not a chance, Roger spoke up. That's fine. Maybe then you help me fix that ventilator, too. They pulled the grill back on the ventilator and covered it by nailing boards from the table over it. By and by, we make that air tight, said Manuel and gave his next order. Yes, he was giving orders to the captain and the navigator now, and he was quite conscious that he was doing it. You get all the bowls and pans and pots in here and fill them with water. No telling when those fellows decide to cut our water lines. It took them half an hour to do that, and it wasn't until it was done that Manuel felt satisfied. Then he began to break open one of the cartons of tooth powder, explaining his plans as he did so, in the same whisper he had used all along. Those fellows out there got the whole ship to themselves, he said. They got lots of food and lots of water and lots of air. They got fuel too, and someone who can lay in orbit for contact with Ceres but I don't think they ever get there. There's a whole lot of fellows too, said Manuel dubiously. I think maybe the air they got won't last them. Their air? ejaculated Tarrant. Manuel, you haven't monkeyed with the tanks, have you? I just killed the water weed, that's all. Are you nuts, little man? asked Tarrant at last. How in thunder are we going to breathe when the air gets stale? You may smother those pirates, but we're all in the same boat here, you know. 
Manuel smacked his fist into his hand to emphasize his remark. We may be in the same boat, but we three, we're in a different part of this boat. Maybe them rats outside quit breathing all right, but not us. Look here. He seized them both by the shoulder and hauled them across the room. He broke open one of the corrugated boxes as they watched and pulled out a gaily colored can. He opened the can and dumped the contents into a pan of water while they looked on. He stirred the paste into the bottom of the pan for a moment and then let out a cry of triumph. Aha! See there? What you think of that, by gum? A series of bubbles was rising from the paste, rising and breaking, bringing fragments of the tooth powder with them, giving the water a cloudy and dusty quality as they grew and joined each other faster and faster. Manuel winked. Maybe Manuel isn't as big fool as these hoodlums think, he said proudly. I don't know much, maybe, but by gum I know my business. I know about tooth powders, and I know about providing oxygen for rocket ships. You know what, Captain? Most tooth powders got sodium perborate in them. They put it in because that perborate gives off pure oxygen when you put it in water, and pure oxygen is pretty good antiseptic. Only this time, we're going to use that oxygen to keep us alive instead of killing germs. He leaned over and took a sniff of the life-giving gas. In a day or two, he said happily, the air out in the rest of the rocket is going to be pretty stale. Then they're going to try and get in here. We'll hold them out all right. Then after a while, they come, offering to surrender, begging for a breath of fresh air. Ain't it nice to think that there's only enough for the three of us? If we get soft and let them breathe any of our air, nobody will reach port alive. So we have to be hard and let that mob of cutthroats smother to death. He sat down and leaned back and smiled. Manuel Saruk felt pretty good. He felt satisfied with himself for the first time in a long while. End of Mutiny in the Void by Charles R. Tanner Note for a Time Capsule by Edward Welling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Yes, I know the rating services probably never called you up, but they call me up twenty times a week. Note for a Time Capsule by Edward Welling I take it, you sociologists living in what to me is the future, I take it that there's a future, a future with a place for sociologists, will note the unlikely revolution in tastes now going on. For your information, then, here's why the rating services are reflecting a sudden upping from the pelvis to the cortex. Just in case this will have become a cause for wild surmise. You probably know what the rating services are, were to you, but I don't want to tense this document up. Most people nowadays don't know about the rating services. They know of them. Every so often I hear someone say darkly, I don't know about those polls. I've never had a call from them, and no one I know has ever had a call from them. I keep quiet or mumble something noncommittal. I could say, truthfully, I do know about these polls. They ring me up more than twenty times a week. I could say that, but I don't. Not so much because I don't want to seem a crackpot or a liar, as because I don't want to spoil a good thing. Or at least, what I think is a good thing. And for the time being, what I think is a good thing is what the world thinks is a good thing. Now, in order for you to get the picture, you must understand that the New York metropolitan area fashions the literature and musical fads of the United States, and the United States by example, and by infiltration via writings and movies and recordings, fashions the fads of the world. And the New York metropolitan area goes by the opinions I frame. It probably seems strange to you that I, in any amassing of statistics, merely one digit in the neighborhood of the decimal point, can claim to exert such far-reaching influence. But I've seen much the same sort of thing in my work as a CPA. 
someone possessing relatively few shares in a holding company may exercise an inordinate amount of power over the national economy an analogous set of operations makes it possible for me to be an aesthetic shot of digitalis to the body politic here's why barton's microcosis is at this writing the top tune and why archaeology professor dr loop is the high man on the poles with his tv show dig this and why the world has taken such a turn that you might very likely call this the day of the egghead but you're most likely asking at this point why in the name of statistical probability did this character get so many calls when so many people got none and your next thought is or did he is he paranoic here's my answer to your second question i'm certainly not imagining any of this you're bound to come upon some signs of these times and know what i've said about the revolution in taste is true otherwise there'd be no point in my setting this down or in your reading it the hard part is to convince you that the rest of it about my role is true the trouble is there's nothing about me personally that would help me convince you there's nothing uncommon about me except that my tastes were previously uncommon as i mentioned i'm a cpa i live in a suburb of new york city i have an office in the city i'm really semi-retired and take care of only a few old business friends so my listing in the manhattan phone directory doesn't include the term cpa or ofc i have a communication book and the usual gripes against the n y n h and h as a matter of fact i'm writing this while commuting and you'll have to blame not me but the roadbed and the rolling stock for any of this you may find difficult to decipher for really i have a very neat handwriting although there's no noticeable pressure of work i stay on at my office after the girls quitting time she still chews gum but all day yesterday she was humming barton's microcosmos i balance books until the line at the bottom of the column becomes a boingo board on a decimal point and then i squeeze my eyes and shake my head and go home i live alone i'm a widower i have one daughter thank goodness she's grown and married and living in a place of her own so there's no one to tie up the phone i've given up frequently the haunts of my old cronies although i miss their argumentative companionship i take comfort in the fact that i'm furthering our common interests i don't give a hang that my lawn needs mowing let the wind violin through the grass i'm staying near the phone it's between six and seven in the evening at the office and between eight and midnight at home that i receive the calls that brings me to your first question about why i constantly get so many calls when so many people get none let me make it clear at once that even if the poles were viable or fixable and i'm not suggesting they are i haven't the means to buy or the electronic knowledge to fix supposedly random calls besides i'm fairly ethical then what's the question naturally i've given this phenomenon more than a bit of thought and i've formulated a theory to explain at least to my satisfaction why what's happening's happening i believe the drawing power of my phone number inheres in the nature of the number now don't go hot under the collar if you're still wearing collars before you hear me out i'm not talking about numerology or any such mystical hocus-pocus i'm talking about the psychopathology of everyday life that's what's skewing and skewering the law of probabilities i know this demands explaining so i'll be specific apart from these calls from the rating services i keep receiving calls on my home phone from people who set out to dial a certain undertaker i beg his pardon funeral director we have the same exchange 
In fact, his number differs from mine only in that the first of his last four digits is a zero, while my corresponding one is a nine. Of course, by now you put your finger on it. These people are dialing the under a funeral director because, in a certain colloquialism, someone's number is up. They misdial because they're unconsciously saying nay to the zero of death. I've analyzed both my home phone number and my office phone number in this fashion, figuring out what their components connote singly and as gestalts, and I can see why these fortuitous combinings command attention, why these numbers leap out of the directory pages right at you. Privately, I call such a number a common denominator, with a way of asserting its numerator. I hope you're not laughing at me. After all, when you remember what number is, what's happening follows naturally. Numbers a language we can use to blaze our way through the wood of reality. Without number, we couldn't say what is more or less probable. We couldn't signpost our path. But using number is like trying to detect the emission of a photon without having to receive that photon. The difficulty lies in trying to get number at least one remove from the font of all language, the human mind. Possibly we'll come closest to order, be that one with reality, when we can order number, at the level of statistical probability, to be truly random, at one with chaos. At any rate, there you have it. I'd like to go into greater detail, but I'm afraid to. Before my phone numbers up and added them, I was content merely to turn out the noisome and the fulsome and sigh to myself. That's life. You ask for beer and get water. That is, I thought I was content. It's only now that I'm getting beer with an egg in it that I realized how passionately I hated the way things were and how passionately I'd hate to have them go back to that way. I don't know how long this phenomenon will go on, but while it lasts, I mean to make the most of it. I unashamedly enjoy watching the expressions a bewildered enthusiasm on everyone's face. That expression is there because everyone listens to and looks at what the polls tell him is popular, and because everyone tells himself he likes it because everyone likes it. But in some respects my feelings are more uncertain. I'm glad, and at the same time sorry for the long-haired musicians. It seems more embarrassing than pleasing to them to find themselves suddenly idols of bobby soxers. I try not to think of Stravinsky barricading himself against the adulterating adolescence, souvereigning him and his underwear. As you see, I've had to harden my heart. It's tempting to say I have become a number. And I intend to be even more ruthless. I'm planning, for example, to place on the hit parade Dahl's Concerto in Alpha Wave for a Silograph and Woodwinds. That's why I'm being exceedingly careful to leave nothing to chance. Though this document is sort of a hostage to fortune, I'm taking into account the possibility that I might lose it while commuting, and that it might fall into the hands of some unsympathetic contemporary so I'm not writing down my phone numbers or my name. I want to keep the lines clear for the pollsters. The End of Note for a Time Capsule by Edward Wellen Peacemaker by Alan E. Norse This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Glenn Carruthers. Peacemaker by Alan E. Norse. Flicker's mind fought silently and desperately to maintain its fast receding control, to master his frantic urge to writhe and scream in agony at the burning light. 
The fetid animal stench of the aliens filled his nostrils, gagging him. The heat of the place seared his skin like a thousand white-hot needles and seeped into his throat to blister his lungs. It didn't matter that his arms and legs were bound tightly to the pallet, for he knew he dared not move them. The maddening off and on of the scorching light set his mind afire, twisted his stomach into a hard knot of fear and agony, but his body lay still as death, relaxed and motionless. He knew that the instant he betrayed his tortured alertness by so much as a single tremor, his chance for contact would be gone. The only sensible thing to do is to kill it. It was not a repetition but a constant powerful force crashing into his mind, hateful, cold. He heard no sound but the muffled throb of spaceship engines far back in the ship. But the thought was there, adamant and uncompromising. It burst from the garbled thought patterns of the others and struck his mind like an electric shock. One of the aliens wanted to kill him. Thought contact. It was a paralyzing concept to flicker. The aliens couldn't possibly realize it themselves. They were using sound communication with one another on a sonic level beyond the sensitivity of flicker's ears. He could hear no sound but the thought patterns that guided the sound talking of the aliens came through to sledgehammer his brain, coherent, crystal clear. But why kill it? We have it sedated almost to death level now. It's completely unconscious, it's securely bound, and we can keep it that way until we reach home. Then it's no longer our worry. The first thought broke out again with new overtones of anger and fear. I say we've got to kill it. We had no right picking it up in the first place. What is it? How did it get there? Where was the ship that brought it? The alien's mind was venomous. Kill it, while we can. Flicker tried desperately to tear his mind from the agonizing rhythm of the light, to catch and hold the alien thoughts. Confusion rose in his mind, and for the first time he felt a chill of fear. His people knew that these aliens were avaricious and venal, a dozen drained and pillaged star systems which they had overrun bore witness to that. But he had never even considered, before he started on this mission, that they might kill him without even attempting communication. Why must they kill him? All he wanted was a chance, one brief moment to convey his message to them. Five years of planning, and his own life had been risked just to get this message to them to gain their confidence and make them understand. But all he found in these alien minds was fear and suspicion and hate, which had become a single, ever-developing crescendo. Kill it now, while we can. There were only three of them with him now, but he knew, from some corner of the alien minds, that five others were sleeping in a forward chamber of the ship. He saw himself clearly, alone, on an unknown spacecraft, with eight alien creatures, gliding through interstellar space at unthinkable speed, bound for that nebulous and threatening somewhere they called home, their home. He caught a brief mind picture from one of them of an enormous city, teeming with these alien creatures, watching him, picking at him, trying to question him, deciding how to kill him. And through everything else came the intermittent burning glare of that terrible white light. Then suddenly the three aliens were leaving the cabin. Flicker sensed their indecision, felt them balancing the question in their minds. Soundlessly he lifted one eyelid a trifle. The searing light burst in on his retina, blinding him for a moment. Then he caught a distorted glimpse of them opening the hatch and withdrawing in their jerking, uneven gait. And still the alien thought came through with a parting jab to his tortured mind. The only thing we can do is to kill it. The risk of tampering with it is too great, and we don't dare take it back home alive. The light was gone now. Flicker took a deep breath of the heavy air allowing his tense muscles to relax as the sweet coolness and comfort crept through his body. 
First he stretched his legs as far as they would go in their restrainers, then his arms, and coughed a time or two to clear his throat. Almost fearfully he opened his eyes to the cool, soothing darkness. His mind still ached with the afterglow of the furious lights, but gradually the details of the cabin appeared. Far in the background the throbbing drive of the great ship altered subtly, then increased slightly in volume. Bound where? Flicker sighed, trying to turn his mind away from the undermining awareness of failure, of something gone very wrong. Carefully he reviewed his rescue, his actions, the aliens' reactions. They had cut their drive almost immediately when they had spotted him and sent out a lifeboat for him without previous reconnaissance. Surely he had been helpless enough when they dragged him from the crippled gig, half frozen to allay any suspicion of his immediate dangerousness. A crippled man is no menace, nor an exhausted man. The whole thing had been carefully planned and skillfully executed. The aliens couldn't have detected his own ship which had dropped him off hours before in the proper place to intercept their ship, and yet they were suspicious and fearful, as well as curious, and their first thought was to kill him first and examine him after he was dead. Flicker's face twisted in a sour grin at the irony, to think that he had come so quietly and naively to these aliens as a peacemaker. If he were killed, the loss would be theirs far more than his, because contact, living contact, and a mutual meeting of minds was desperately necessary. They had to be warned. For three decades they had been observed without contact, in their slow, consuming march across the galaxy, conquering, enslaving, pillaging. The curiosity of their nature had started them on their way, Greed and lust for power had carried them on until now. At last, they were coming too close. They could not be allowed to come closer. They had to be warned away. Flicker had been present at the meeting where that decision had been reached. There had been voices raised in favour of attacking the encroaching aliens without warning, to deal them a crippling blow and send them reeling back home. But most of the leaders had opposed this and Flicker could see their point. He knew that his people's struggle for peace and security and economic balance had been exhausting, the final settlement dearly won. Part of the utter distaste of his people for outside contact lay deep within Flicker's own mind. They asked no homage from anyone, they desired no power, they felt no need for expansion. The years of war had left them exhausted and peace-hungry. When they demanded but one thing from any culture approaching them, they wanted to be left alone. Cultural and economic contacts they would eagerly seek with this alien race, but they would tolerate no upset diplomatic relations, no attempts to infiltrate and conquer, no lies and forgeries and socio-economic upheavals. They were tired of all these. They had found their way as a people, and with characteristic independence they wanted to follow it without interference or advice. And then the aliens had come, closer and closer, to the very fringes of their confederation. Like a cancer, the aliens came stealthily, nibbling at the fringes, never quite contacting them, never really annoying them, but preparing little by little for the first small bite. And Flicker knew that they could not be allowed to take that bite, for his people would fight, if necessary, to total extinction for the right to be left alone. Flicker shifted his weight and sighed helplessly. The plan of his leaders had been simple, a few individual contacts to warn the aliens, a few well-planned demonstrations of the horrors they could expect if they would not desist. There were other parts of the galaxy for these aliens to explore, other stars for them to ravage. If they could be made to realise the carnage they were inevitably approaching, the frightful battle they were precipitating, they might gladly settle for cultural and commercial contacts. But first they must be stopped and warned. They must not go any further. Flicker's mind raced through the plan, the words carefully imprinted in his mind, the evidence he could present to them, if only he could have a chance. He felt the dull pain in his stomach, 
He hadn't been fed since he was brought aboard, and the drug they gave him had drained and exhausted him. At least he would have no more of that for another three hours. He sighed quietly, aching for sleep. From the moment of the impact of the first dose of the drug hit him, he had realized the terrible depths of strength his deception would require. He had been nearly unconscious from exposure in outer space when they had dragged him from his lifeboat into the blazing light of the ship, but the drug had stimulated him to the point of convulsions. An overwhelming dosage for their metabolism, no doubt, but it had fallen far short of his sedation threshold, driving his heart into a frenzy of activation as he tried to control his jerking muscles. Still, there would be no more for three hours or so, so he could lie in reasonable comfort, trying to find a solution to the question at hand. One of them wanted to kill him immediately. That was the one who had poked and probed that first day, tapping his nerves and bones with a little hammer, taking samples of his blood and exhaled breath, opening his eyelid and using that horrid torch that seared his brain like raw fire. The throbbing, intermittent light had begun to bother him as early as that. Either their visual pickup was of extremely low sensitivity, or his own neurovisual pickup had been stepped up to such a degree that what appeared as a steady light to them registered on his mind as a rapid and maddening oscillation. But the brilliance and the heat. His strength was returning slowly after the ordeal. His muscles ached from inactivity, and he began twisting back and forth, testing the limits of his restraints. Each leg could move about four inches back and forth. His right arm seemed tightly secured, but his left... He twisted his wrist back and forth slowly, and suddenly it was free. Unbelieving flicker groped for the restrainer. It hung loosely at the side of the pallet, its buckle broken. He moved the arm tentatively testing the other restrainer, wiping perspiration from his forehead. Finally, he lay back, his heart pounding. With one arm free, he could free himself completely in a matter of moments. But the aliens mustn't know it, for anything that would startle them or make them suspicious might turn the tide of their indecision instantly and bring sudden, violent, purposeless death. The arm could be used to keep himself alive if he had to. The thought of one alien crept through his mind, the cold, unyielding hate and the fear. The others were merely curious, and curiosity could be his weapon, to help him establish the link that was so necessary. Somehow, contact must be established, without frightening them or threatening them in any way. Although their thoughts came to him so clearly, he had tried in vain to establish mental rapport with them. They showed no sign of awareness of anything but their own thoughts, and communicated only by sound, for their thinking processes were as sluggish as their motions. Sluggish thinking, but on a high level. They thought logically, using data in most cases to form logical, sound conclusions. They understood friendliness and affection and companionship among themselves, but towards him, they seemed unable to conceive of him except in terms of alien to be feared, investigated, attacked. He sighed again and settled back, trying to ease his aching back and shoulders. His mind was almost giddy from lack of sleep, running off into the wild, dreamlike ramblings. But he struggled for control, fighting to keep the fingers of sleep from his mind. He knew that to sleep now would be to place himself at a terrible, possibly fatal, disadvantage. He couldn't afford to sleep now not until contact had been established. The light flashed on again directly above him. Flicker cringed, his muscles twitching, tightening before the tortuous heat. Anger and frustration crept through his consciousness. Why so soon? No more drug was due for a long while yet. He heard footsteps in the passageway outside, and the hatch squeaked open to admit one of the aliens, alone. And with him came a single paralyzing thought wave, which tore into Flicker's brain, driving out the pain and frustration, leaving nothing but cold fear. If the others find it dead, they can't do much about it. This, then, was the one that had wanted him dead. They called him Clock, and he was the biggest alien on the crew. This one especially was afraid of him, wanted him dead immediately. 
and had come to see that he was dead, alone, on his own initiative, against the will of the others, and in a cold wave of fear, Flicker knew that he would do it. There was no curiosity in the assassin's mind, only fear and hate. Through one not quite closed eye, Flicker watched the alien approach. It held a syringe-like instrument in its claws, and the oily skin was oozing a foul-smelling fluid that stood in droplets all over its face. The fear in the alien's mind intensified, impinging on Flicker's brain with the drive and force of a trip hammer, clear and cold. If the others find it dead, there's nothing they can do. The alien was beside him, his head near Flicker's face, and he caught the bright glint of glass and steel too near. Like lightning, Flicker swung his free arm, a sudden crushing blow. The alien emitted one small, audible squeak and dropped to the floor, its thin skull squashed like an eggshell right down to its neck. Frantic with the maddening light and heat, Flicker ripped away the restraints on his other arm and legs. Ripping the magna boot from the alien's foot, he heaved it with all his might at the source of the light. There was a loud pop, and the cabin sank into darkness again. Flicker wiped the moisture from his forehead and stood numb and panting at the side of the table as the afterglow faded and the wonderful coolness crept through him again. And then he saw, almost with a start, the body on the metal floor before him. Gagging from the stench of the thing, he knelt beside it and examined it with trembling fingers. With the light gone, the alien had changed colour, its leathery skin now a pasty white, its shaggy mane brown. White stuff oozed from its macerated head, mingled with a red fluid which resembled blood. Flicker dabbed his finger in it, sniffed it. A red body fluid should mean an oxygen metabolism like his own. But he had concluded from the heavy atmosphere that the aliens were nitrogen metabolistic. That would account, in part, for their sluggishness, their slow thinking. Realisation of the situation began to crowd into his brain. This creature was dead. He had killed it. He sat back on the floor, panting, trying to channel his wheeling thoughts into a coherent pattern. He'd killed one of the aliens. That meant that his last hope for peaceful contact was gone. The mission was lost, and his danger critical. Even if he could succeed in concealing himself, it was unthinkable to go with them to their home planet. Escape, equally unthinkable. They were vengeful creatures, as well as curious. Their vengeance might be murderous. Briefly, his wife and family flashed through his mind, waiting for him. So proud that he had been chosen for the mission, so eager for his success, and his leaders watching, waiting, daily for his return. There could be no success to report now, nothing but failure. But he had to survive, he had to get back. There could be other missions, but somehow he had to get back. The situation fell sharply into his mind, crystal clear. There was no alternative now, he would have to destroy every creature on the ship. One against seven. He considered the odds swiftly the sudden urgency of the situation slamming home. They had weapons. The ship was known to them. They could signal for help. There must be something to turn to his advantage. He kicked the alien's foot, thoughtfully. The lights. Flicker jumped to his feet, his heart pounding audibly in his throat. Why such brilliant light? Why such a slow cycle current that he could see the intermittent off and on? Obviously, what he saw as an oscillation was a steady light to them. With such low light sensitivity, the aliens had to have such brilliant lights. They couldn't see without them. The agonising brilliance that sent Flicker into convulsions was merely the light necessary for them to see at all. And comfortable seeing light, for him, was to them total darkness. Far forward in the ship, a metal door clanged. Flicker was instantly alert, nerves alive, every muscle tense. Clock was dead. He would be missed by the others. He took a quick glance around him and removed the weapons from Clock's side 
an ordinary, clumsily designed heaped pistol, almost unrecognisable, but similar enough to the type of weapon Flicker knew to be serviceable. He strapped it to his side and moved silently towards the hatchway. The lights had to go first. Flicker's body ached, his mind was reeling with fatigue, sliding momentarily into hazy attenuation, snapping back with a start. Unless he slept soon, he knew his reactions would become dangerously slow, and hunger was now tormenting him also. Food and sleep would have to take priority over the lights, no matter how dangerous. A thought flashed through his mind, and he glanced back at the alien body on the floor. Some of the blood had oozed out onto the aluminium floor, forming a dark pool. The thought slid into focus, and the hunger re-intensified into a gnawing knot in his stomach. Then he turned away in disgust. He just wasn't that hungry. Not yet. Quickly he stepped out into the passageway, moving in the direction of the engine sounds. The ship was as silent as a tomb except for the distant throbbing of the motors. Far below him he heard the clang of metal on metal, as if a hatch had been slammed. Then dead silence again. No sign that clock had been missed. Not yet. Flicker breathed the cool darkness of the corridor for a moment, and then moved quickly to the ladder at the end of the passageway. His muscles ached and his neck was cramped, but he felt some degree of his normal agility returning as he peered into the dark hold below and eased himself down the ladder. The grainy odour he had smelled above was stronger down here. Halfway to the ceiling, the coarsely woven bags were stacked, filling almost every available inch of the hold except for the walkways. A grain freighter. No wonder it had such a small crew for its size. Not many hands were needed to ferry staple food grains to the aliens on distant planets. Flicker blinked and searched the walkways, finally finding what he wanted, a cubbyhole. Behind the stacks and up against the outer bulkhead, he slid into the narrow space with a sigh and curled himself up as comfortably as he could, clearing his mind of every thought but alertness to sound. He sank into untroubled sleep. He heard the steps on the deck above him, and sat up in the darkness, instantly alert. There were muffled sounds above, then steps on the metal ladder. Abruptly, the hold was thrown into a brilliant light. Flicker whimpered and twisted with pain as the light exploded into his eyes, and felt a flash of panic as he saw two of the aliens at the bottom of the ladder. The waves of thought force struck Flicker, heavy with anger and fear. It couldn't have come far forward in the ship. If Clock was right that first day, it has a high order intelligence. It would seek a good hiding place and then venture out to explore a little at a time. It could be anywhere. The one called Shah Lee looked back up the ladder anxiously. The other's mind was a turmoil of jagged peaks and curves. Then his thought cleared abruptly. But how could it happen? The creature was sedated, almost dead, as far as we could see. It had a shot just an hour before Clock went up there. How could it have awakened? And why did Clock go up there in the first place? I thought you left strict orders. The two cautiously moved down the walkway. Whatever happened, it's loose. And there won't be any sedating when we find it again. Trembling with pain, Flicker forced his burning eyes to the source of the light in the overhead. He aimed the heat pistol he had taken from Clock, sending a burst of searing energy at the fixture. The hold fell dark as the light exploded into metallic steam. He's in here! There was a long pause in dead silence. Flicker strained to catch the flow of thoughts that streamed from the alien minds. I can't see a thing. Neither can I. I got the lights. They were so near Flicker could almost feel their warmth. Swift and silent as lightning, he sprang up on the grain bags, leaned out just above them. A small bit of wood was near his foot. He grabbed it and threw it with all his might against the far bulkhead. A surge of fear swept from the alien minds at the crash, and they swung and fired wildly. Like a flash, Flicker sprang to the deck behind them, pausing the barest instant for breath and balance, then springing quickly forward and striking one of them a crushing blow across the neck. The alien dropped with a small squeak. The other fired wildly, but Flicker was too quick, zigzagging back to a retreat behind the bags. After a moment, he peered over the top of the pile. Charlie was standing poised, peering into the blackness towards the other alien who lay quite motionless on the floor, his head twisted at an unnatural angle from its body. Something in Flicker's mind screamed, Get the other now, while you can. 
but he took a deep breath of the sticky air and then turned and ran silently to the hatch at the back of the hold and out into the large corridor. He had to get the lights first. With the lights gone, the others could be taken care of in good time, but he knew that he couldn't stand the torture of the lights much longer. Already his eyes felt like sandpaper, and the paralysis which took him for several seconds when the lights first went on could give the aliens a fatal advantage. He came to a darkened hatchway, half open at the end of the corridor, took a brief inventory, and hurried through. Far below he could hear the generators buzzing, growing stronger and mingling with the sobbing of the motors as he descended ladder after ladder. He hurried down a dimly lit corridor and tried a hatchway where the noise seemed most intense. The light from within stabbed at his eyes, blinding him, but he forced himself through the hatch. To the right was a glittering control panel for the atomic pile. To the left were the gauges for the gas storage control. An alien was standing before the main control panel, a larger creature than his brothers, his mind swiftly pulsating, carrying overtones of great physical strength. Flicker slid silently behind one of the generators and studied it and the room, his mind growing progressively more frantic. His eyes burned furiously, and finally, with a groan, he unstrapped the heat gun and sent a burst towards the ceiling. The light blew with a loud pop, and the alien whirled. Who's there? Flicker sat tight. The generator he was using for concealment was not functioning, probably a standby. Three of them were running in a series over to one side, with a fuse box above them. Flicker's heart pounded. It would have to be quick and sure. The alien moved swiftly over to the side of the room, and a thin blade of light stabbed out at Flicker. A battle lamp. The suddenness of its appearance startled him, stalled his movement just an instant too long. He saw the burst of red from the alien's weapon, and he screamed out as the scorching energy caught him in the side and doubled him over. In agony, he jumped aside and sprang suddenly up onto a catwalk. The alien swung the lamp around below, searching for him, tense, gun poised. In a burst of speed, Flicker moved along the catwalk towards the alien and crouched on the edge directly over him, panting, gagging at the smell of the creature mingled with the odour of his own burned flesh. He felt cold rage creep into his mind, recklessness, the age-old instinct of his people to claw and scratch and kill. Suddenly he sprang down past the alien, striking him a light tap on the shoulder as he went by, spinning the creature around like a dervish. The battle lamp went crashing to the deck. The heat gun flew off to one side, struck a bulkhead, and spluttered twice as it shorted out. Flicker spun on the alien, catching him a crippling blow across the chest. Fear broke strong from the alien's mind as he toppled to the floor. Flicker was upon him in an instant, like an animal, ripping, tearing, crushing. The exhilaration roared through his mind like a narcotic, and he lifted the twitching body by the neck, half dragging it over to the generators. Carefully, he placed one of the alien's paws on one of the generator leads, the other on the other. The terrific voltage sputtered and the alien gave two jerks and crackled into a steaming, reeking cinder while the generator turned cherry red, melted, and fused. Flicker blasted the fuse box with his pistol, fusing it into a glob of molten metal and plastic, then turned the pistol on the auxiliary generators. The smell of ozone rose strongly in the air, and the generators were beyond hope of repair. Flicker rose and stretched easily, his heart pounding, his side throbbed painfully, but he felt an incruent flush of satisfaction and well-being. Now there would be no more lights, no more painful, burning agony in his eyes. Now he could take his time, even enjoy himself. He sprang up onto the catwalk again, located a concealed corner, and sank down to sleep. The five of them were gathered in the control room of the ship. Open panelling of plaster glass at the end of the room looked out at the infinity of black, starlit space. Far below, the engines throbbed, thrusting the ship onward and onward. The aliens moved restlessly, fear and desperation clinging about them like a cloak. In the darkness of the rear of the control room, high above them on an acceleration cot, crouched Flicker, hunger gnawing at his stomach. He peered down at the flimsy little creatures, studying their features closely for the first time. 
Charlie stood with his back to the instrument panel, facing the others, who sat or lounged on the short table-like seats before him. A pair of battle lamps sat on the instrument panel, trained on the two hatchways leading into the control room, and each of the aliens carried a heat pistol in his paw. They looked so weak, so frightened, so utterly helpless, standing there, that it seemed almost impossible for Flicker to believe that these were the creatures who were threatening his people, who were responsible for the draining and pillaging of planets that Flicker had seen. These were the ones, deadly for all their apparent helplessness. Flicker blinked, leaning closer and closing his eyes, soaking in and separating each thought pattern that reached him from the group. So what are we going to do about it? Charlie's thought came through sharply. We might be able to manage without the lights. But he got the generators. So that took our radio out too. We got only one message home, and that was brief. Not even enough for them to get a fix on us. They know approximately where we are, but they'd never find us in a million years. We can't hope for help from them. We're stuck. Another one shifted uneasily. He's out to get us all and without light we can't find him. We don't even dare go looking for him. It looks as if he can see in the dark. Let's consider what we're really up against, said Charlie. As you say, he can see in the dark, and we've got darkness here. That's point number one. Number two, he's quiet as a mouse, and fast as the wind. When he got Tomei in the grain storage vault, he came and went so fast I didn't even know what had happened before he was gone. Number three, He's acquainted with spaceships, and with the lights gone, he's more at home on this ship than we are. Wherever he came from, he's no primitive. He's got a mind that doesn't miss a trick. But what does he want? Jock toyed with his heat pistol nervously. What was he doing when we found him out there? He was nearly frozen to death. Or seemed to be. Motive? It might be anything, or nothing at all. Maybe he's just hateful. The point is, there's one thing he can't do, unless he's really got some technology and that may be our way out. Which is, I doubt if he can be in two places at one time, or three. There are five of us here, and some of us have to get home to tell about this. This could be death to our exploratories. Certainly we don't dare to take him home with us alive, but we'd have to find him to kill him, and he'd get us first. Now here's a plan we might be able to put across. Two of us should stay with the ship, myself and one other. The other three take lifeboats and get out now. We approach within lifeboat range of Cagli in about an hour. The Caglians won't be happy to see you, but they won't hurt you. And you can bluff your way to a radio. Maybe the two of us here can keep him off until you get help. At any rate, I hope you can. Flicker lost track of their thoughts as the information integrated in his mind. A chill went through him, driving out even the gnawing hunger for a moment. If they got off in lightboats, they'd get help, and the mission would really be lost. Irreparable damage done. He had to prevent them from making any contact with their home. This ship was a freighter. Freighters were slow. Any culture as advanced as theirs would have ships, fast ships, to overtake slow, old freighters. Quickly and silently, Flicker slipped over towards the hatch. The lamp shone on it full, but the aliens weren't watching. Like a shadow, he flashed through the hatch and down the corridor. There he paused for a fraction of a second and listened. No thoughts, no alarm. Flicker felt a wave of contempt. They hadn't even seen him. At the top of the ladder, Flicker crouched and waited. The meeting below was breaking up. He heard a hatchway clang, followed by the muffled pounding of their heavy feet as two of the aliens started down the corridor below. The battle lamp swung back and forth before them, its flash pattern swinging weirdly on the bulkheads and deck. Flicker waited. The aliens started up the ladder before him, their thoughts a muddle, fear oozing from them, but carrying with it a curious overtone of incaution. We can check the lifeboat for supplies now, came a thought, and be ready to blast in an hour. At the top of the ladder, they passed so close to Flicker that he nearly gagged, yet in his desperate hunger there was something almost tasty about that smell. They moved on towards the light boat locks, and Flicker followed, trying eagerly to separate their thoughts into a coherent pattern. He's behind us! It came suddenly, like a knife through the air. Don't turn around! The first alien gripped his companion's sleeve. Pretend you don't know it. 
they moved along with no outward sign of their sudden terrible awareness. Their minds were racing, fearful, but they kept on. Flicker crouched along the bulkhead and followed. The aliens came to the hatch. Flicker tensed, ready for them. He heard them undog the hatch, heard its squeak as it opened, and he tensed, his muscles quivering eagerly. Three beams of light stabbed down the passageway at him, brilliant, staggering him back against the bulkhead. He grasped frantically at the closing hatch, but it clanged shut, the heavy dogs scraping into place on the opposite side and at the other end of the corridor. He was trapped. Of course, they had been incautious, nonchalant. Of course they had led him on. And now, there he is. Get him! A heat gun whined, its searing energy ricocheting in the closed end of the corridor, with a snarl flicker sprung up high on the bulkhead, dragging himself on a shelf carrying an emergency spacesuits. Blast after blast came from the alien guns, rebounding like furies, all missing. I can't kill it, a thought pounded through. It's moving too fast. Frantically, Flicker trained his own pistol on the hatchway, blasting a steady stream until the metal melted through. With an exultant snarl, he dived through the opening, and without pausing, sprang up onto the lifeboat locks. He paused, breathing heavily, his burned side throbbing painfully. The two aliens inside were swinging their battle lamp and wild arcs. One spotted him and blasted, but he was gone before the alien triggered. With their careful aim, he blasted the battle lamp, resting easy for a moment in the ensuing darkness. Then he was across the lock, tearing, ripping, scratching, snarling into the two aliens, roaring in savage glee. One of them fell with a crushed skull, its body horribly mutilated. The other slipped from his grasp and started running through the blackness for the hatch. Flicker was there before it. He picked up the alien body and threw him across the lock. In an instant he was upon him, ripping off an arm at the socket. The alien screamed in pain and tried to wriggle away. Flicker let him wriggle about three feet, then gave him a cuff that sent him sprawling and ripped off the other arm. The alien twisted and turned like a worm on a stick, but Flicker didn't kill him. Instead, he broke a leg and twisted off an ear. The three aliens in the corridor threw open the hatch and flooded the dark lock with the beams of the battle lamps. They saw blood on the deck and nothing more. We know you're in here. Come out now or we'll come get you. Flicker caught the thought clearly and snickered comfortably. He was much more comfortable now that he wasn't so hungry. He picked up a long white bone and threw it against the opposite bulkhead. It clanged and the three lamps swung instantly in the direction of the sound. There he is. Blast him. Three heat guns spoke sharply, and dead stillness echoed the despairing thought. That wasn't it. They moved across the room and dragged the charred, mutilated body of their companion away from the bulkhead. Let's get out of here. We can't fight this thing. Charlie started for the hatch, followed by the other two. Only two of the three reached the control room. Flicker played with the third for quite a long while before he killed him. We aren't going to get out of this alive, said Charlie. You know that as well as I do, I guess. Jock nodded. I've been sure of it since he got clock in the first place. He moves too fast. He thinks too fast. He can see too well. And savage. He has a heat gun. Do you realise that? But not one of us was killed with a heat gun. It's butchery. I tell you. No, we won't get out of here alive. And this thing that's stalking us. What will it do? Take the ship back home? Run loose there the way he's run loose here? Killing and maiming? We've got to stop it, Jock. We can't let it get home. Jock stared at the instrument panel. I know one way we can stop him, he said slowly. It's suicide, but it would keep him from going home. And it would mean the end of him too. Finally, Charlie looked up, tired lines on his face. The fear was gone to resignation now, replaced by another, more terrible fear. The fear that they would be killed and leave this thing running loose on the ship. What is it, Jock? Jacques picked up a space chart and slowly ripped it in two. This, he said, we can cripple the ship, foul up the controls, the gas storage, the charts, cripple it beyond repair. Then he can't do anything. Wreck the engines, destroy the food, smash this ship so no one could ever do anything with it. Completely wreck his chances to get home. They moved with sudden, desperate swiftness. The heat gun sent up the space charts in wreaths of flame, fused the chart file into a molten heap of aluminium. 
the engines stopped throbbing, giving way to deathly silence, broken only by the heat blasts and the heavy breathing of the two men. The instrument panel melted and exploded. The gas control was smashed. The men worked in a frenzy of fearful destruction, their own last escape going up in searing heat blasts. Destruction that no man could even hope to repair, ever. And back in the corner, behind the acceleration cots, Flicker purred and purred. Easy, satisfied contentment filled him for the first time in days. He snickered as the alien creatures went on their path of self-destruction. Everything would be all right now, and his leaders would be pleased at how it turned out. He could bring back first-hand information about these creatures, vital, invaluable information. The contact could be made another time. And then he could go back to his family. They'd really enjoy hearing him tell about that alien squirming and screeching with both arms ripped off and have a long, comfortable rest. The helpless, simple fools. They could kill him so easily. If they only knew just a breath of hydrogen to combine with his high oxygen metabolism to explode him like a bomb. But they were destroying everything they could in a mad, frenzied attempt to stall the spaceship to keep him out here in space to perish with them. Such a complete job they were doing, and it was so completely and utterly useless. True, no human being could ever repair those controls to regulate the atomic engines of the ship. No human being could survive the weakening atmosphere long enough to repair the gas units. And even with these repaired and functioning, a human being would be forever stranded in the vast, cold, friendless reaches of space without a perfect, detailed visual memory of the space charts easily at his command. For no human being could ever direct a ship blind to a destination without the charts of space through which he flew. No human being would ever find his way out of the dead emptiness of such uncharted space. Flicker curled up and placed his nose gently on his tail, disinterested, unconcerned. A human being would be hopelessly, irreparably doomed out here. Flicker purred contentedly to himself as he considered the weakness of the human race which he had observed. From their view, he was completely stranded. But a cat can always find its way home. End of Peacemaker by Alan E. Norse Recording by Glenn Carruthers, Ghana Country. Prologue to an Analog by Lee Richmond. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prologue to an Analog by Lee Richmond Finagle's Law shows that many times we don't get the effect we planned on. But there's an inverse to that famous law, too. The IWC program was a newscast by Bill Howard, and the news was particularly vicious that night. Bill, his big homely face leaning across a desk toward the viewer, talked in horrified tones of the pest sub that had reputedly got stuck in the Suez and spread epidemic across Cairo. It was easy to assume, Bill told his audience, that the nations most interested in creating a crisis in the world right now had put the sub there to make an excuse to accuse us of the terror. It was undoubtedly really there and was undoubtedly really of American make, and the epidemic was undoubtedly very real indeed, he said. The United Nations investigating team, due to go in the canal zone the next day and make their report to the world, would find that the epidemic was caused by laboratory-developed bacteria carried in by an American-made sub. It would be at least as bad, if not worse, than reported. The question before the world, Bill said, was not whether bacteriological warfare had started, but who had started it. And the fact that the sub carried United States markings and was of United States make did not at all answer the question. Bacteriological warfare had broken out, and where it would strike next 
was anybody's guess. But let there be no mistake, Bill said. This is war. It was on that note that the station break came, and the 13 witches, trademark of the International Witch Corporation, came on. Harvey Randolph, manufacturer of the witch line of products, leaned toward the screen intently. He had just transferred his account to Burton, Dester, Dustin, and Oswald, and they had dreamed up a new type commercial for the products. The 13 witches were long-legged, slender dancing gals in tall black witch caps and long black capes, crimson-lined, and very little else. Each had long hair that swirled as she danced. Randolph chewed his lip, watching them thoughtfully. They came on with what was almost a Valkyrie cry. Witches of the world unite to make it clean, 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 witch clean now. Hmm, thought Randolph. The cry struck rather sourly at the end of that this is war sentence from the newscast, he thought. But then that dramatic newscast ending was rather unusual. The witches were singing a jingling chorus as they danced. No need is too big, no task is too small, they sang. Which witch do you need? You should have them all. Each witch, of course, displayed her particular product from the witch line. Detergent, soap, shampoo, cleanser, cleaning fluid. Which soap or detergent? Which cleanser upsurgent? Which witch do you need? You should have them all. This was fairly average as commercials go, thought Randolph. The big B, D, D, and O radical innovation would be next. It was. On the screen behind the witches appeared a map of the Suez Canal and then a papier-mâché model of the nose of a sub and a dockside shanty, a gray pall hanging over them. As the witches turned and began dancing toward it, the deep voice of the announcer spoke over the muted jingle. Witches of the world, unite! If Nasser had enough witches, he could solve the crisis which has us all in stitches. And the witches, in a united dance step, Approach the sub and shanty singing, Make it clean, 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 witch clean now. Each sprayed it with a witch product. And as they sprayed, the pall lifted, the sub and shanty showing shining, bright, new painted. Clean, 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 chanted the chorus. Witch, 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 clean, 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 defy dirt, defy disease. Keep witch clean. Well, thought Randolph, and then again, well. He wasn't quite sure, he told himself. The commercial came darn near being in poor taste, what with the crisis so near, and yet it wasn't something to make you forget the product. By Jeffrey, no. You think of which products quite a bit after watching that one. He reminded himself to check the viewer reaction that would be available fairly early next day as he switched off the TV. It was almost noon next day before Randolph reminded himself of the call he planned to make to BDD&O. He got Oswald on the wire almost immediately. Randolph here, he said. I called you about that new commercial. It seems a little drastic. Are you planning on using it again tonight? Use it? We're taking full credit, in a witchery sort of way, Oswald laughed. Never saw anything like your luck, Randolph. I've got the entire staff tied up doing the follow-up for tonight. You needn't worry about liable either. We've got the whole legal staff turned out, going over every detail. It seemed pretty near the line to me, said Randolph, chewing his lip. He found himself a little puzzled over Oswald's tone but not too much so. Any public relations man was over-enthusiastic by nature in Randolph's estimation. Maybe it took that to make a good PR man. People might resent our making hay out of sickness, even if you are preaching that cleanliness will prevent it. Sickness, you might have a point. I admit I'd argue it, but you might. But wellness, now, it's different. I do know that if the United Nations team reports there's no epidemic, 
and that the pest sub is one of the cleanest, healthiest crude submarines in the business, it's safe for us to assume that it's so, and to imply that which products are used to keep it clean. Mr. Oswald, Randolph's voice took on a note of imperious prissiness, would you mind explaining just what exactly you're talking about? Haven't you heard the news? There's no bacteriological war. I admit that puts Bill Howard way out on a limb, but there are a lot of very fine people with him. There's no epidemic in Cairo. There's not even a bad cold that the United Nations team could find. And they give that so-called pest sub the most complete bill of health in the business. Now, the deal we plan for tonight. At the same moment, a number of very important people were closeted with the president. Their reactions to the United Nations report were quite otherwise than those Oswald was experiencing. It's the exact timing and the detail of execution that scares me, Mr. President, the Under Secretary of State was saying. The Secretary himself was coming in by jet and would join them immediately on arrival. It implies a technology that we can't touch even in our wildest dreams. I've talked to the CIA chief himself, and the reports from our operatives are beyond question. The epidemic was not only real, it was widespread. The pest sub was as real as this chair I'm sitting on, and its crew near death to the man, and no question about it. If they can find a bacterial war and produce an overnight cure at the same time, we're at their mercy. There's no bomb ever developed, or that can be developed, to touch the power of what they've just demonstrated. The president ran his fingers through his hair. His face looked more drawn than any man had yet seen it. Yet he smiled. We're not suing for peace terms yet, he said, and turned to the nation's foremost biologist sitting quietly in a nearby chair. What's your reaction? he asked. We've always known... The answer came despondently. That bacteriological warfare is far deadlier than any bomb. If there were any protection from its effects for the victor, we had a strain of bacteria once for which we had an immunization course, and we developed it far enough along the line to realize that even though you immunized every man, woman, and child in this country in advance of releasing it in another part of the world, mutant strains would eventually wipe out this nation as well as those we fought. How about mutant strains of the Suez bacteria? The president asked, then answered himself. No, they produced an antidote. An antidote, if our reports are correct, that works overnight. He shook his head slowly. The ultimatum should come very soon now, the president said. It is the timing. I do not understand the timing. The big man in the Kremlin was allowing himself an appearance of indecision that he did not often indulge before underlings. Of course, there was but the one underling, and any audience that proved to have a later embarrassing potential could be silenced with ease. Still, it was unusual, and the lieutenant who served as combination secretary and backstop for oratory quaked as he listened. The timing is all wrong, but the fact is a fact. It must be a fact, or every operative we have should be Siberianized. We must, of course, act. The action must be immediate. We are zeroed in. No! Vlada heard himself speak, and his whole body was outraged at the action. He stood white, trembling. But he had spoken, and try as he would, the word could not be pulled back. No! My little dove, and what would you suggest then, if we are not to defend ourselves from this capitalistic aggression? That we shall sit with our hands folded and allow them to dictate the terms of our surrender? Speak. Send them a pest sub and see if they can handle the bacteria we have developed. Vlada's throat was dry, and his voice was not his own. No power on earth could have made him open his mouth, but he had opened it and he fully expected the lightning to strike him at that moment. Send them, ah, of course. They can cure their own, and they have taken a so dramatic method of saying that they can cure their own. But can they cure the products of our laboratories? 
Now that we shall see. But we shall be as subtle, more subtle even, than were our capitalistic friends. We shall not send our sub to them. We shall send to a small island, and we shall see whether they wish to taste the death, the strangulation and crippling and suffering, the destruction of sanity that shall be the lot of those islanders. In Peiping, the distress was no less acute, but the reaction was somewhat different. The scientist being grilled had no hope left. He could answer honestly, for there was nothing that could save him from that which was in store. The strain was virulent. There was no known antidote. Nothing could have saved that port, nor most of Africa and most of India. And there was no way for the world to know from whence came the death-dealing submarine, except that it be the mighty America. The bombs should have come in retaliation, spreading their death and adding to the impetus of the epidemic, so that enough of the world was wiped out to give the great people of the dragon room in which to expand. We calculated that a third of our own would be wiped out in the Holocaust, which would have relieved us of many problems. The tan peoples of India and the darker peoples of Africa should have sued us to lead them in a unity of the yellow peoples against the insanities of the pale people of the West. There is no antidote, yet the epidemic is destroyed. I cannot yet believe what is told me. I would go to my ancestors happily if I could go to them with the answer to this riddle. That night, Bill Howard came on the screen, his big, homely face wreathed in smiles, his tweed suit and shaggy blonde hair looking even more informal than usual. It's a great day for the people of the world, he said. There's undoubtedly tremendous political significance in what happened at Suez. And every statesman and every politician will have statements to make and conclusions to draw. Suez's obvious healthiness has been variously attributed to American technology, garnered from the experts we have sent them over the years, to Russian technology, garnered from their experts loaned to the nation involved, to Muhammad, and to the God of the Christians. The peoples of the world, he said softly, are concerned with these things in the abstract. But mostly, we the people are willing to leave this to the theorists while we rejoice. For we the people, who thought we faced that most degrading, that most unanswerable, that most horrible fate of all, bacteriological war, find ourselves at bacteriological peace. At the break, the thirteen witches danced on, crying their chant, and behind them as a background was the bright, clean, sub-enchanty scene. Witches of the world unite to make it clean, clean, clean. Witch clean now, they chanted. Pestilence or peril, disease or disaster, stay clean, clean, clean. Witch clean. Ah, said the deep voice of the announcer as the jingle muted. Which witch do you really wish? Which is the modern method of cleanliness using the best of modern technology? And the witch witch is witching through the world. Randolph watched the program skeptically. The best lawyers and the best PR agents to be had, he reminded himself. Still, there was a nagging worry that this thing was going too far. It's okay to claim the moon, he thought, chewing his lip. But isn't it a little risky to claim peace on Earth for the witch products? He made a mental note to call B, D, D, and O the next morning. The audience reaction would make itself felt by then, and he could decide. It was almost noon next day before Randolph reminded himself of the call he planned to make to B, D, D, and O. He got Oswald on the wire almost immediately. Randolph here, he said. I called about that new commercial. It seems a little drastic to claim peace on Earth for the witch products. What are you planning for tonight? More of the same. Oswald's voice was jubilant. The switchboard has been swamped, and we're on almost every program, on every channel. They're taking us apart, of course. Witchcraft raises its head, and Salem is here with a new twist in a singing commercial. And... Anybody got a pestilence? 
that sort of thing. But they're crediting witch products from dawn to dawn. I sure didn't make a mistake when I tied our contract to your sales. We ought to break the bank. Randolph chewed the thought in silence. Oswald, he said. It's an old habit of the American people to make a joke out of what they can't understand. Sort of Paul Bunyan all over again. But don't overdo it. That Witches of the World Unite deal? Remember the IWW? Wasn't that sort of communistic? Every time someone talks about getting the world peacefully together, about unity, someone starts shouting commie. Since when has communism and unity got anything to do with anything? You are an international corporation, aren't you? It's in your title, IWC, isn't it? You don't just sell witch things in the United States. You have markets in Europe and Africa and India and all over the place. Or I read the sales charts wrong. What's worrying you about using it? The overseas tapes are going like a Cannonball Express. Our ratings have skyrocketed everywhere, Oswald said in satisfaction. What do you mean, don't overdo it? You get the world in a hat basket, and then you want to throw it away? Incidentally, he added in a calmer tone, I got one crank call that's got me thinking. The guy got all the way through to me before he'd talk, and that takes some getting, what with the salaries I pay people to keep the cranks off my neck. He said that now we have the witches of the world united, why didn't we do some real cleanup work, like slums and insane asylums? Got me thinking, you know. A good cause never did a program any harm. Randolph chewed his lip a while in silence, and Oswald, knowing his client, waited patiently. I like that a lot better than claiming peace on earth for the witch products, Randolph said at last. Why don't you pick a slum we can clean up for not too much, and let's see what you can work out. This cleanup theme isn't bad. It's just peace on earth that doesn't really belong to us, you know. I'll tell you what. We'll go to $50,000 or so on a cleanup job, and you use that. Leave the world to the politicians and the eggheads. After he hung up, Randolph stood by the telephone, still chewing his lip. Could you clean up something like a slum for, say, $50,000? Oswald would double the figure in his own mind, of course. Always did. But he'd get the sales out of it. His contract was tied to sales. Yes, he thought. It was best to call him off the track he was on now. Lawyers or no lawyers, that sort of thing was dangerous. It took a week, and it took every member of the staff that could be pulled off other programs as well as the ones assigned to which. The slum had been located. Three buildings in a short block just up from the battery, surrounded by new buildings. It was a one privy to a floor, cold water only setup with a family living in every room. It existed on high-value land only because the land and buildings were tied up in an estate and couldn't be sold. But they could be remodeled and thrown into one, and contracts were signed, permissions granted. The paperwork alone filled nearly a complete file cabinet. It would take double the $50,000, of course, maybe more. But Randolph had authorized it, hadn't he? He always named half the figure, or less, than he meant to be used. Anyhow, international ratings and sales would more than make up the purse, because this thing would hit Sacco. Worry about the cash was the last thing that was bothering Oswald. He had a bear by the tail, and his contract price was tied to the gross. The show was ballyhooed the whole week while the work went on. Clean, clean, witch clean. What's the witch's next big cleanup? Witches of the world unite. Let's clean up this old world and make it livable. The night the new cleanup job was to show, Randolph tuned in his TV as ignorant of the details as the next viewer. It worried him a little that Oswald insisted on keeping him in the dark on everything except the fact that it would be a slum cleanup. But he had the best PR men and the best lawyers in the country working on it, he told himself. And certainly, the sales charts for the past two weeks had been spectacular. We can count on the biggest TV audience of the year tonight, Oswald told him gleefully at noon. The build-up's been a natural. 
and those Salem with a new twist and a singing commercial plugs have been continued on this network. The cost of that was comparatively small. And I've even gotten them onto a few of the really big shows to boot. Bill Howard came on the screen, his big, homely face leaning across the desk toward the TV audience. The biggest news in the country right now, Bill said in a solemn tone, is the biggest single cleanup job in the country today. There's a slum, Bill said, right here in New York that the witches of the world will unite to clean up tonight. Then he put on the full power of the personality that made him the most listened-to newscaster on the air, TV and radio. The manner that made the news sound human, like it really happened to real people. He put it on full power and went to work. First, he showed a big map of New York and talked about how people thought of it as a big, impersonal place, but it wasn't. He made it everybody's hometown. Then he traced the map right down to the exact spot where the buildings were. Then he turned on a movie, and he showed the back door, garbage-strewn, and a room where a family slept, seven of them, and the privy they shared with five other families. Then Bill turned off the movie, and he brought that family to the mic, each of them dirty and in clothes that never had amounted to much and had seen a long life since, even the baby. One kid's shoes had a sole flapping off. Another had the toes cut out so he could wear them, even though he had long outgrown them. We haven't added to what we found, Bill said. This is the way the... I've introduced them as the Jones family. Let's leave it at that. This is how the Joneses have had to dress. This is how they've had to live. This is a very real part of America, he said, and his voice was choking a little. And Randolph thought, if he's putting that on, he's the best actor I've seen yet. Randolph found himself glad he was alone and didn't have to speak himself. His own throat felt choked. And now, said Bill to his audience, it's time for the witches. The camera shifted, and there was a papier-mâché model of the buildings, built so you could look in the curtainless windows and see the squalor, lighted with a single bulb on a string. There was a gray pall over the whole thing, and newspapers and trash blowing against the front of the building. The gray pall, Randolph had figured from the subscene two weeks ago, was an effect of lights on a net curtain, but the effect was really good. The thirteen witches, slender witches, danced in waving their products and crying their chant, their crimson lined capes swirling out to glimpse the audience their long, slender legs. They cried their chant as they pranced toward the dilapidated building. Witches of the world, unite to make it clean, clean, clean. Witch clean, now. And each threw a spray of her product toward the building. Which soap or detergent? Which cleanser upsurgent? Which witch do you need? You should have them all. Then, riding over the muted jingle, the deep voice of the announcer saying, Tonight, the witches of the world clean a slum of the world. A particular slum. This slum. Witches unite and clean, clean, clean. Witch clean. The dancing witches now threw each her ingredient on the building itself, and the gray pall began to lighten. A bright new painted front shone forth. Inside, the single bulbs blacked out for an instant, and then a soft light showed through curtained windows, a bright new scene dimly apparent through the curtains. This is not just an illusion, the deep voice of the announcer continued. This is really happening, down near the battery in New York City. It is happening to the Joneses and the Smiths who live there. The chorus rose to cover the announcer's voice. Clean, 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 witch clean! The commercial and the witches faded and Bill Howard's big, homely face came back on the screen. Let me introduce you again to the Jones family, Bill said. I'll introduce you to the Joneses, but they're just one of the families who will now have a decent place to live. And the same miracle has happened to each of these families. 
Now the Joneses came again on camera. Clean, in new clothes, hair brushed, a miracle indeed of a costume changer's speedy art. Randolph assumed that teams of BDDNO members had been at work during the commercial, creating the miracle. From the baby up and down they shone, and their faces shone with an inner light. When Randolph shut off the TV that night, he was chewing his lip violently. Must have been more than double that $50,000, he thought. He reminded himself to phone BDDNO first thing in the morning. It was still an hour before noon when Randolph's phone rang. Randolph here, he said in the formality he adopted on an English visit and carefully kept. Good morning, Oswald's voice was formal. Good morning. There was a silence while Randolph waited for the other to continue. Finally, Randolph said, Good show, that. Must have cost a lot more than my price, he added. It was good, though, he said again thoughtfully. Randolph? Oswald's voice sounded wild. I don't know what the thing cost. I don't know. Now, sir, just what do you mean you don't know the cost? I told you to spend $50,000, and from what I saw last night, it'll cost four times that. I'll go as high as $125,000, but not one cent over. And you'd better make it worth the money, for that's a pretty penny, he said. Look, Randolph, the cleanup job down there was supposed to start this morning. Contracts let, big crews ready to do the job fast so people could go look at the finished product. Every family was signed up to act as guides, like in Williamsburg. We moved them all to the country yesterday so they'd look healthy when they came back and the job could start at the crack of dawn today. Well? Well, the job's already done. That's pretty fast. You said you started it this morning. Yeah! And when my man phoned me from down there, I told him to get black coffee and sober up. But I went down myself. And the job's done. Exactly the job we specified, too. Done by our plans. Furnished, painted, paint dry, curtains hung, the works. New bathrooms and kitchen and plumbing and electricity. The works. It's finished. My best man was down there moving the families out yesterday. He swears the building hadn't been touched then. The contractor says he's going to sue because he arrived with his crews to start the job and somebody else had done it. You come on. You've got to meet me here and tell me the answers. Just what did you put in that soap of yours, anyhow? By afternoon, it was banners in every paper, wire serviced across the nation and the world. Most of the stories were written tongue-in-cheek about the miracle part. It was assumed that witch products had done the inside job in advance and thrown in the outside cleanup during the night. The tenants were interviewed. Oswald had the sense to move them right back into their new apartments, and not one of them could be made to break down and admit those buildings hadn't been slums yesterday. Well, you couldn't blame them for sticking by witch, Look what witch had done for them was the word that went around bleaks. Of course, the thing was a curiosity natural, and the police had so many men assigned there by nightfall, it looked like a concentration camp. TV portables and news photographers' flashbulbs didn't lessen the confusion any, and the crowds were being let in and through only when there was room for more. Bill Howard was there when Randolph went through, in earnest conversation with a group of youngsters in one room. Oswald arranged that the witch manufacturer should have a strong police escort, and the crowds moved back to make way for him in each apartment. The tenants answered his questions, but they did so with a sullenness that surprised Randolph. Yes, it had been a mess the day before. Yes, it had been rebuilt, obviously, during the night while they were gone. Yes, just the one night. They should be saying thank you, Randolph noted to Oswald. They're acting as though I were a suspicious character. It's our escort, Oswald explained suavely. These people don't think of cops as their friends. Besides, this is pretty new to them. Randolph chewed his lip and decided that Oswald was probably right. But the attitude was general, and it irritated him. 
He left after the briefest go-through. That night, Bill Howard was conservative in recounting the big news story of the slum clearance. He wasn't giving it the real Howard try, Randolph thought, sitting in front of his TV. There was the quote in the story he told, too, from the father of the Jones family that had been on the program the night before. I reckon it's pretty wonderful, Mr. Howard, Jones had told him, but I don't rightly know that I like it. Must admit, I'm scared of this stuff, he had said, and waved his hand at the newness. It was just a single sour note in the story, but it stuck out. The rest was a description without any mention of the miracle part. At the break, the witches played the credit line to the hilt, though. Witches of the world, unite to make it clean, clean, clean. Witch clean, now, they chanted their cry and reenacted the scene of the night before while the announcer's voice rode over the muted jingle to explain that witch products had been used to make the slum clean, clean, witch clean, even though it took carpenters and builders and contractors to remodel a slum building itself. That's better, thought Randolph, watching. No more of this miracle nonsense. It was barely 10 a.m. the next morning when Randolph's phone rang. Randolph here, he said and heard Oswald's voice without preliminary. They've gone. Who's gone? The tenants of the building. Just picked up their duds and left. I put dicks on the case, and one family has moved in with relatives in the Bronx. The other scattered, but we'll trace them. Here's one of the policemen that was on duty when they left. He'll tell you. A new voice came on the phone as Randolph chewed his lip. Mr. Randolph, this is what happened, near as I can figure. We roped off the area at dark last night, figured we'd give the family some rest and keep out the night thrill guys. Everyone in the apartments must have gotten together after we cleared out the crowds. It was pretty quiet, but the lights stayed on till about 2 a.m. Then they all started parading out, some even wearing their old clothes. They were carrying a few things, but nothing that looked like they hadn't had it before the change, so we figured what they were taking was theirs probably. Didn't say a word just paraded past us. Some of the kids was crying, but otherwise they were quiet. Then one man comes running back to me, and he said, Get out of here. It's the devil's work. Get away from this place if you're a God-fearing man. Then he turned and ran toward the subway with the rest. I couldn't figure we had any orders to stop him, so we didn't try. We just watched. Oswald came back on the phone. Can you keep it out of the papers? Randolph asked. It's already on every newscast, and the papers will have it by noon. It's on the wires, Oswald said. Randolph coughed nervously, but Oswald didn't wait for him to speak. I'm working on something to counteract this, he said. We're being witch-hunted, Oswald said. I'll get the whole firm to work on it and call you back. In Washington, meantime, another conference was going on, far more intent far more critical. It's more than just a pest plane that crashed in Formosa, Mr. President, the CIA chief was saying. It carried bacterial bombs and they exploded. There's been no attempt to hide its source. It's, of course, of enemy make. No identification on the bodies aboard. They're in civilian clothes. But again, the make is Moscow. It shouldn't be long before we know the worst. Will they clean this one up as they did the last one, or will they demand surrender terms on this one? The president asked. The Secretary of State and the Secretary of War started to answer together, but it was State that got the first word in. I think they'll clean this one up, he said. It would be a direct threat on which they'll demand surrender terms. That's just a guess, of course. The best teams of doctors are being organized and jetted over, the best bacteriologist the nation has at its command. Every antibiotic available is being sent. Will that make a dent? No. How long can we keep it under wraps? A week, ten days perhaps, with top security. Give it everything you've got. But keep it quiet till we know what the next move is. 24-hour alert, of course, immediately. Even if the alert itself endangers the security wraps? Yes. 
A week to ten days of security isn't enough to pay for taking a chance the other way. By 4 p.m., Oswald was on the phone to Randolph. We've got the antidote, he said jubilantly. Randolph was quiet for a minute, chewing his lip. Then, I'm being vilified in the press as the creator of a hoax that even those who stood to benefit by it couldn't take, he said. The few who have decided that a real miracle occurred have also decided that I'm in league with the devil and that witches are for burning. Mostly witch is the butt of every joke that can be dreamed up by every cub reporter in the nation. Saxton has started laying the groundwork for making witch a political issue. There's talk of an FCC investigation. I trust, he said formally, that your antidote is an efficient one. Oswald's voice sounded smug and not at all disgruntled. Try this on for size, he said. First, which is known far and wide as nothing less could have made it known. Yes, and if the churches ban the use of witch, we'll wish we weren't. Okay, okay. Tonight, we explain carefully that the miracle was a miracle of cleanliness and that carpenters and contractors and all that did the miracle. You know, American technology and mass production and operation, something to be proud of. Tie witch right into the whole picture of the United States as the leader of mechanical, stress mechanical, miracles. Then, what's the most appealing thing in the world? He didn't wait for an answer. A child, a small crippled child for whom witch can provide the funds to make her walk. Oswald hurried on, knowing that Randolph had to go through a bit of lip chewing before he could interrupt, and taking advantage of the fact to ride over objections. We've got a kid that an expensive operation will save from being a cripple. I've consulted two top surgeons already, and they say it's nearly positive. We don't do any hocus pocus. We just say that witch is going to pay for the operation. She leaves the broadcast and goes straight to the hospital. We get a movie of the operation, and we do movies on her convalescence, and we play it for weeks until she walks on stage, cured. Weeks later. Now Oswald waited. It was a long wait, an unusually long wait, even for Randolph. Finally, he said, All right, but if anything unusual occurs, you will answer for it in court. Nothing unusual could occur. I admit, I still don't know what happened last time, but we'll find out. Meanwhile, we'll take a week to build this one up, Oswald continued. The buildup will stress that this is a cure being bought by money. No miracle except the miracle of American medical know-how. No miracles meantime. Just keep witch clean and stay well, and witch buys the operation the kid needs. She's pretty, too, he added as an afterthought. Ten years old. That night, Bill Howard leaned across the desk toward the TV audience, and tiny droplets of sweat stood on his forehead. His voice was calm, though. A big map of New York City hung on the wall behind him. The big news that night was a dope raid. He described the dope traffic in the nation, the efforts of the FBI and every law enforcement body in the country to track it down, clean it out. He described what it did to the young who got caught and were slaves for life, unless they could be cured. And he spoke of the meagerness of the cures that were known. Then he described the raid. He took a pointer from his desk and he outlined how the raid had been staged and he pointed out the location of the building where it had occurred. Then he followed with his pointer the route to the precinct jail where the victims were being held. Cannot our best researchers find a cure for this addiction? He asked in his husky voice. Cannot our best law enforcement agencies find the real perpetrators of these crimes? The perpetrators are the fiends who import dope and create addicts to peddle it for them. These who are confined are the victims. If no way can be found to cure them, they must be confined again and again and again. For that addiction will force them to ever-increasing crime to satisfy it. If no way can be found to cure them, these are potential slaves for life. As he ended, the station break came and the camera shifted to the witches, dancing on stage, crying their chant. 
witches of the world, unite to make it clean, clean, clean. Which clean now? Which soap or detergent? Which cleanser upsurgent? The announcer's voice, when it came in over the muted jingle, explained the miracle of the slum clearance again, a miracle of American technology. Then he outlined the next miracle the witch corporation would promote. This, he said, would be a miracle of American medical know-how. Which would pay for the expensive operation needed to make a little girl walk again after a crippling disease several years before. Bone would be grafted. New muscles would be grafted. American medical know-how in its full extent would be put at her service. Keep healthy by keeping clean with which, the announcer suggested. Which would pay for the expensive operation to undo the effects of one disease. Meanwhile, Witch's customers could use the preventive medicine of cleanliness to help them in their fight against disease, while the researchers of American medicine seek to find you real protection. It was 10.30 the next morning when the doorbell rang. A big man was standing outside in a topcoat, hat in hand. Randolph stood in the door, waiting. The man silently held out a badge, and Randolph moved aside, gesturing him in. I didn't look at your badge close enough, Randolph said as he closed the door behind his visitor. Who are you? Narcotic squad, the man said briefly. I was on the raid last night. Oh, the one Bill Howard was talking about in his newscast. Yeah, that one. I don't figure there's any connection, and my boss just laughed when I suggested there was a connection. Connection? You see, I took a break from questioning those boys we pulled in, trying to get a lead to the higher-ups. They were dope to the ears, and sometimes you can get info from them right quick. I took a break for a cup of coffee across the street, and there was a TV in the place, and I watched your Bill Howard. I left just when your witches came on, shouting that thing about making it clean now. I went right back and started on the questioning again, but the guy they brought in for me to question next was... Not dopey. He was. Well, there's a difference between boys with a monkey on their back and when there's no monkey. There was no monkey. But the kid began giving me everything he knew would take us to the higher-ups. He was being taped, of course. And I asked him when he had his last shot. Not 20 minutes before the raid, he said. Calm as you please. I had the guys brought back that I talked to before, and they were different. Only way I can describe it is no monkey. The monkey had been there before. I don't know. They each gave us all they had in leads. They had been stubborn before, but they sang like canaries. I checked, and nobody done anything to him to bring him off their jazz. If there's anything can be done to pull a guy out of a jazz, anyhow, I never heard of it, and I've been in the narcotic squad since the year one. I couldn't figure it. I've been hearing stories about witch products and that miracle at the battery, sort of as a joke, and I thought, just maybe, just possibly, you know. Anyhow, I took the tapes to my boss and spoke my bit, but he just laughed. Maybe you'll just laugh too, but I thought I'd ask. At the same time in Washington, the cabinet was in full session. Reports coming in from Formosa were worse than even the most pessimistic had dreamed. The bacteria hit at the nerves and the brain and the victims. Excruciating was a word being used. It's hit everywhere on the island at once. I assume it is contagious as well as having been broadcast from whatever bombs or broadcast methods were used, the CIA chief reported. Any word from their embassy? State answered that one. No word at all. Phone calls to the ambassador only elicit reports that he is not available. I can't reach anybody higher than a fourth assistant undersecretary. At least it's not been on the air or in the press. I don't know how long we can hold him in leash. Most of your leading papers know there's a 24-hour alert on. That was bound to leak, but I've kept him quiet. We'll have to give them something soon, though. They won't take a muzzle too long without at least knowing why. Could you give them the story and trust them when it's this important and the consequences of leakage this apparent? I thought of that. You can convince some newsmen, 
but there's always a Joe somewhere who figures the American people have a right to know their destiny before it's decided, no matter what the effect, and no matter if their most highly elected officials feel it would not be good for them. Keep it top security for as long as possible. Let me know before it breaks. If I can, I'm not a witch. I might not know when it was breaking. The CIA chief grinned sourly at his own illusion. The next night, the big news was the countdown in process at Canaveral to put a functioning dome on the moon. If the dome could be landed successfully, complete with live animals, a man would follow shortly. That was foregone. The question was landing the dome, just a small spaceship body, but completely equipped to keep a man alive for two years in case anything went wrong with plans to bring him back pronto. Bill Howard's voice was excited, and he ran his fingers through his hair, pushing it back as he leaned across the desk, the map of Florida behind him. To the statesman, this is a question of who is first and who is second, and perhaps who will control the spaceways, he said after describing the countdown in process. But to the peoples of the world, this is mankind reaching for the stars. It is not known, he said solemnly, whether the failure of many of our shots has been human error or sabotage. Human error is a frailty of the race. Sabotage is a frailty of statesmanship, that the world is still divided as it reaches for the stars. Yet each is possible. Is there a mechanical error built in by human frailty in tonight's shot? Is there a saboteur at work? Or, as the countdown reaches zero one hour from now, Will the dome tear through the atmosphere of Earth and man's first real step to the stars successfully? Is our bird perfect this time? He asked as the break came. The witches danced on, crying their chant. Witches of the world, unite to make it clean, clean, clean. Witch clean, now! Randolph was chewing his lips still as he went to bed that night. The man from the narcotic squad had left peaceably. There were answers to all the questions, and it wasn't his worry anyway. He'd be glad when the little girl had her operation. Grafting bones and muscles might be miraculous, but they were explicable and everyone understood them. Talk of the FCC investigation had died a morning, but talk like that was enough to upset anybody. Everything had been upsetting recently, even though the upcurve on which products was holding steady. The American Dome landed on the moon the morning of the day that the crippled child was scheduled to come on the witch program. For the American people, it was a day of celebration comparable to the 4th of July. In the White House, gloom hung like a palpable shroud. They'll have to move fast now, the Secretary of War was reporting to his chief. They can't afford to let us get our man up there, even if we could shoot him off successfully. We can't shoot a man up there until we've proved in at least two more successful shots that we can get him there, security declared forcefully. The threat from our enemies is as nothing to the threat from the vote-welding public if we tried and failed when a human life is at stake. Formosa's leaking, admitted the CIA chief. We can't hold it much more than three days now at the outside. The president rested a hand on his desk. Two more shots mean at least six months before a man is up there armed. Three days means Formosa is in the news this week. When the news breaks, credit our doctors and bacteriologists with being on the way to a cure. Fix it so that if they clean up their epidemic the way they did Suez, we get the credit. That's the best we can do right now, besides looking for a miracle. But miracles are popular these days he added ruefully. It was Bill Howard who stood outside when Randolph answered his doorbell next morning. He let the big homely, almost shambling figure in without a word. I came to ask you a question I don't think you can answer, Howard said morosely, not moving farther than the foyer. I came to ask what is it about the witches? Randolph chewed his lip standing there beside his much larger guest, conscious of his own prim, 
almost prissy neatness as it contrasted to the other shaggy look. Shaggy dog, thought Randolph. Big, unkempt, shaggy St. Bernard. What about the witches? he asked finally. Well, there have been some funny things. That slum, of course. I was there, of course. I saw it. And I talked to the small fry. It was a tenement the day before. I'd stake a lot on it. There was a silence before Randolph answered. Well? Well, then just a few little things. A narcotics man came to see me. Just personal. Just curious. They've been pulling in the higher-ups in the dope traffic, by the way. On info from the guys caught in that raid. Then that Canaveral deal. Were you listening that night? I always tune you in. It seems to me that today is one of celebration. The dome landed. Yeah, yeah, celebration. I'm a newsman, and I get stories that don't go out. There's one that just an hour before zero, a man suddenly died of heart attack. The technician who took his place, you don't stop a countdown like that for a heart attack, checked his work and found an error that would have misfired the thing. There was also one circuit that had been changed, but they left that because it was changed to be more accurate. They figured the dead guy had done it. So? So, well, nothing. I just wanted to ask you. The witches don't touch anything real these days, of course, so even if they were, well, magic somehow, they couldn't have been involved. There wasn't even a pause for lip-chewing this time. Are you trying to insinuate that witch products? The question was left hanging, but Bill Howard stood there looking his sponsor in the eye. Mr. Randolph, I'm not trying to insinuate one damn thing. I'm not even saying anything to anybody, and if I did say anything, I'd be laughed off the air. Not by you, but by whoever I said it to. I'm just telling you what twos and twos have been setting themselves in front of my everlasting consciousness and asking if you know anything to add to them. The lip-chewing started again, and the two stood there. Then Randolph said quietly, Mr. Howard, I have been manufacturing witch products for 25 years. They have been improved steadily since I first started with a very good formula. They are the best cleaning products available in the world today, I most sincerely believe. They are that exactly, and nothing more than that exactly. So you will have to find another explanation for your twos and twos, which I admit are a rather spectacular run of coincidence, though not beyond the bounds of credibility. Myself? I suspect B, D, and O with perpetrating some sort of a hoax in the first instance. If any more hoaxes are perpetrated, I plan to switch agencies, switch programs, and call for an FCC investigation of BDDNO to clear the witch name, which never has and never would condone any hoax of any sort, much less one of the magnitude of whatever occurred, which I profess I do not understand, but which I expect the FCC can trace to its source. Good day to you, sir. Randolph ended the unprecedentedly long speech, turned on his heel, and left Bill Howard to find his own way out. That night, as Bill Howard ended his newscast, the camera did not switch to the witches. Instead, it switched to the announcer. Tonight, witch products would like you to meet a little girl, the announcer said in a soft voice that contrasted well with Howard's just-ended powerful one. As he spoke, the camera backed away to broaden its scope and include in its picture beside the announcer a small blonde child in a wheelchair. Her hair was shoulder-length and carefully combed. Her eyes were downcast shyly. Her hands gripped the arms of the wheelchair as though for security. Her legs were covered with a shawl. This is Mary, said the announcer, and then leaned toward her. Will you speak to the audience, Mary? She lifted deep blue eyes briefly to the camera, then dropped them quickly. Hello, she said in a voice barely audible. Mary is not used to many people or to audiences, the announcer said. 
Mary has been sitting in this wheelchair for almost three years since a crippling disease twisted her limbs. We hope that Mary can be made to walk. The finest surgeons in the country have been consulted, and they believe an operation can give her back her legs that were twisted when the disease struck. International Witch Corporation has arranged for that operation. Tomorrow, Mary will go to the hospital. She will have the operation soon. In a few weeks, perhaps Mary will walk. Will you like that, Mary? Will you like walking? He added, leaning toward the child. Again, the eyes lifted for the briefest instant. Again, they dropped shyly. Yes, Mary said in that barely audible voice. Then you shall have it if it can be done, the announcer said. And the camera moved even farther back to include a stage onto which the witches danced. The witches came onto the stage, not toward Mary, but stage center, chanting their cry. Witches of the world, unite to make it clean, clean, clean. Witch clean, now. At the corner of the screen, the child body in the wheelchair shuddered suddenly. Mary took a deep breath, went white, then red. With a forceful gesture, she threw off the shawl and looked at her legs. Her hand reached down to touch them. On the stage itself, one witch stopped dancing to watch. The others noticed, stopped. The jingle died half through. And Mary stood up, looking at her legs. She took a step toward the camera, and another. Her blue eyes lifted to the camera, widening. In the absolute quiet, as everyone on stage stood frozen, Mary walked toward the camera, her eyes like saucers looking into it. Her voice, barely above a whisper, spoke. I'm, I'm walking, said Mary. The papers called it the cruelest hoax of all. They carried the story side by side with the withdrawal of the witch program from the network, both by network and by international witch corporation order. They carried the statement of FCC officials that an investigation would be made. They carried the statement by Randolph that he would sue B, D, D, and O. They carried the statement by Oswald that he would sue witch products. But mostly, they carried the story of a little girl who had been whisked from sight and couldn't be located, who had probably been given an operation to make it possible for her to walk, but had been forced to pay for the operation by taking part in a cruel hoax of unbelievable magnitude. Bill Howard stayed with the network on the same time, sponsorless. He had been cleared of any implication in the hoax by all parties concerned, and his reputation had always been good. He was asked to stay in town and be available to appear as a witness, but the network gambled that he was clear and kept him on. He was one of the biggest draws in newscasting. His personality that made the news seem to belong to the people, to be a continuing story of their lives was unique. The network decided that the gamble of keeping him on was warranted. By the next night, the Formosa crisis had broken into the news, and it was the news. The details were horrible, and they were uncovered aplenty. Finally, ungagged, those who had been holding off gave the story the works. The effects of the pest plane of the pest bombs were the most vicious that could be developed in the laboratories of bacterial war, and they put to shame the naturally occurring epidemics that have scourged mankind throughout his history. And the effects were spreading with the speed of a prairie fire before a high wind. The entire area was quarantined, and daily the quarantine was extended. No plane could land and take off again. No ship could enter and leave. An airlift of supplies dropped by parachute was being organized. Bacteriologists and doctors jetted to the area were dying with the rest, caught in disease for which there was no answer. 
The propaganda attempts to make it seem as though cures were near were flatly not believed. Suez was remembered, but was remembered as a hoax, and the country had had its complete fill of hoaxes. Randolph had a number of which he referred to and reported as crank calls asking which to try its might. He arranged for every call that reached him to be traced immediately. He remained in seclusion. Oswald had a few of the crank calls and reported them as such. Bill Howard had a number of calls and didn't report them. Bill Howard worried and added two and two and sweated and reported the details of Formosa each night. The details giantized in gruesomeness until their very content was too much for the airways, and he had to censor them as he gave them out. Bill Howard sweated in the cold January weather, and each day he ferreted further, seeking out the realities behind the censorship that lay heavy, now even over the wires. By phone, by gossip, by hearsay, and by know-how, he got the stories behind the story, the real horrors that he couldn't broadcast. Sometimes he rebelled at the censors and himself as one of them, but he knew better than to rebel. It's facing us all, he thought. We each have the right to know. This is the way the world ends, he thought, with a whimper that comes after the agony when agony is too great. And he remembered a little girl walking toward a camera with big eyes. If I were a physicist, he told himself, if I were a physicist instead of a news hawk, I could get a computer to tell me the probability ratio of whether I hold an answer. That probability ratio is probable 10 billion to 1, he told himself. That probability ratio is zero. Witches are for burning, he told himself. He told himself a lot of things, and he sweated through the cold January weather. It had been two weeks since the world heard the first details of Formosa, and the details were so grim now that you couldn't use them at all. Just a blanket story. That night, the map of the world behind his desk, Bill Howard leaned toward his audience. He told them the human side of the story of Formosa. He spoke of the people there, the pawns in a game of international suicide, real people, not just statistics. He described a family, and he made them the family next door, mother, father, children, watching one another die, not prettily, but with all the torture that the laboratories of the world could dream and put together a family that watched each other go insane, knowing what was happening, a family that watched each other die, writhing in unknowing in insanity. He took his pointer, and he showed the growing perimeter of the quarantine. He traced the location of the center of the disaster. Then he leaned again toward his audience. Listen now, he said for the world cannot sustain this torture. He took a deep breath, and he put the full force of his being into his words. Witches of the world unite, he said, to make it clean, clean, clean. Which clean, now? The final word was out before the network sensor reached the cutoff switch. The president and his cabinet put the country on a double alert. Russia had cleaned up Formosa, they knew, and would hit the United States with disease and ultimatums next. The people of the world took the story with an unexpected calm. Like Hiroshima, it was too unexpected, too big, too unimaginable. There was a hooker somewhere, and they went about their business annoyed, angry, worried, but quiet. The papers editorialized on the question of who cleaned up Formosa, who had the answers and left the subject of what the possession of such a cleanup force could mean to the world, to the statesmen? They turned as quickly as possible to other matters, for nobody was sure what to think, and nobody told them what to think. Bill Howard was off the air, of course. It didn't bother him. 
he had a real problem now. We've bought a little time, he thought, a little time to grow in. We've bought a little time from the fanatics and their statesmen, from the eggheads and their politicians, from the military and the industrial, and the just generally foolhardy. We, the people of the world, have a little time now that we didn't have yesterday. How much? He didn't know. On this one, there had been time to get together. On this one, there had been weeks while the crisis built and the world faced a horrible death. This crisis had been a lengthy one. There had been time for a man to make up his mind and try a solution. The next one might be different. There might be a satellite up there waiting with a button to be pushed. There were an awful lot of buttons waiting to be pushed, he told himself. Buttons all over the world, controlling missiles already zeroed in on, well, the people of the world. The next one might occur in hours or even minutes. The next one, the bombs might be in the air before the people even knew the buttons were for pushing. Bill Howard got out his typewriter. You've got a problem. You talk to a typewriter, if that's the only thing that will listen. What's the problem, he asked himself, and he wrote it down. He started at the beginning, and he told the story on the typewriter. He told it the way it had been happening. Now, he thought, you've got to end the story. If you leave it just to be continued, it'll be continued all right. Somebody will push a button one day, and that will write 30 at the end for you. Conclusion. The problem was, in essence, quite simply stated in terms of miracles. The way things were stewing, it'd be a miracle if the world held together long enough for unity to set in. It'd take a miracle to bring about the necessary self-restraint, which was the only possible substitute for the imposed restraint of war. The witch power was quite clearly a power of the people, of the people who needed that protection, needed those miracles, and it was the power that had worked miracles. We'll never know who does the job, he told himself. It's better that way, like table tipping. You can say, I didn't do it. You can even be sure you didn't do it if you want to. But the table tips if you get enough people around the table. Ouija writes, if at least two people have their fingers on it, so that they each can say, I didn't do it. Who are the witches? Why, they're the people, and they're not for burning. The fanatics and their statesmen, the eggheads and their politicians, the brains and the brain trusts and the world weary, they're for burning, but not the witches. Which witch is a witch? Doesn't matter. An hour later, Bill Howard sat down to the typewriter again. He stated the general problem, but now he had a specific problem. And for a man in his line of business, it was a fairly straightforward problem. He need only plot out the necessary moves so that he could call on that witch power just one more time, just once, just long enough to clean out the violent, rooted resistance to the idea that people had powers and could work miracles. The End End to Prologue to an Analog by Lee Richmond Read by Paul Hampton